Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. What a day. <laughs> <laughs> what a day, folks. Holy moly. You know, when we were coming into this week, um, we were just excited about what was going to happen next week. Never mind all of the stuff that has started to happen this week with GC Strategies coming back not once, but twice. And uh, from what we've heard, and we've tried to close our ears and close our eyes, um, there were some interesting things that have happened. We saw a whole bunch of posts from all of the MPs that were in OGO committee today. And so that's a sign that there was a lot of things that were clippable, uh, which usually means that there was a lot of interesting things that were said or not said during committee. So, um, so there we have it. Um, Barnaby and Jester are in the house, everybody. So um, just want to uh, let everybody know that they're here. Um, I also want to, again, publicly thank our, uh, our mods, Commander Shepard and Pandemonium, um, in our Discord server. Uh, they're doing a great job, and uh, they're learning as they go, and we're learning as we go as well. So, um, But we just ask everybody to just acclimatize yourself to to the rules we're trying to make this as accessible as possible and you know we've been told that there are you know kids now that are that are being brought to this so we're trying to keep it as clean as we can so that um you know parents can can have their teenagers you know learn about canadian politics and i think that's a very good thing um especially as they're heading into university which is where the indoctrination process for politics you know, usually starts. So it's very important to, to handle that. So, um, but last, uh, uh, I'll say before I hand it over to Fox, is we did have some live stream trouble on Sunday. We did hear after that that there seemed to be some issues that were larger than just Northern Perspective, that there were some issues going on with YouTube. So hopefully that doesn't happen today. Um, we, we have, you know, made sure we've updated every part of our software to, to ensure that we're up to date and ready to go. But if the stream does happen to freeze or or kick out, um, we will be watching chat for that, and we will be immediately restarting uh, the stream. So if, and it will be on a new link. So if for some reason um, it happens again where the stream just cuts out and, and dies, um, we will be starting a new stream. So you can check our channel for that. Hopefully, fingers crossed, it won't happen. But it's great to see you all uh, just filing in. Thank you very much. Keep those likes going because, um, like, there was literally thousands of people watching the uh, the streams on all of the different platforms today. Um, and you know, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there were some nor northern perspective folks in each of those streams, and you were definitely representing well. And we, Fox and I can't thank you enough for that. So. Uh, so let's make sure we get that like count up as high as we can so that YouTube lets everybody know that the uh, the breakdown of committee is happening now. So I'll throw it over to Fox. So I'm just going to go over the chat rules real quick. Number one, please... Res oh, I can't talk. <laughs> please respect each other and the platform. Number two, no selling, soliciting, or spamming. And three, please use parliamentary language only. No cussing. And then as tonight is a weeknight live stream committee, and we're expecting this one to last between four to four and a half hours because the committee itself was over three, uh, we will not be able to address general chats, um, but we will be addressing super chats. Barnaby and Jester are both with us tonight, so they're here in the live chat if you would like to discuss with them or if you have any uh, questions that you want to bounce off them, you can tag at Barnaby or at Jester and their names will pop right up. Okay, before we get going, um, we did want to read out the two super chats that were on the last live stream. Uh, you paid for them, so we want to make sure that we get to them. Uh, so the first one was from Kathy Sharp, which was for $5, and she said, I emailed my MP, Adam Chambers, and he responded with a very respectful message. That's excellent. And then Alice Avonlea for uh, $2. I imagine this might have been when the stream was crashing. She said, what is it that you're doing? <laughs> so, um, And then we had a $50 opening super chat of this stream from uh, Midian. So, so thank you very, very much for that. Um, it is very, very much appreciated. Um, and then we had uh, a member comment from Joey Higgins, ready for the fun and hit the like, please. Yes, please. 
Uh, Mary Kay Styles with a 1399 super chat. I watched part of this today. I have to admit, I can't wait to hear more of Cypher's size. I love your, <laughs> I love your podcast and your objectivity. Kudos to the PC team for getting to the truth. Amen to that. Katie Cap, uh, member for four months. Congratulations on your notoriety today. Very well deserved, Cypher and Fox. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. Goko Downey with a $20 super chat. Bon Bombardier Challenger, Wednesday, March 13th, uh, 2024. Jet with Prista. Uh, L at 1.67 liters wholesale, not including airport fees. Their sale price 167 at 8,004 liters equals 13,366.68 with HST uh, at 1,737 uh, and 66 cents. Total BF any surcharges equals $15,104.34. Uh, and uh, then we have Dandman966 with a $5 super chat. Uh, Cypher, you're going to have a field day on what Garnet finds uh, from our Mr. Firth. Oh, no spoilers, uh, guys. Um, it'll be interesting, I'm sure. Um, Cast Awakening, welcome to NP uh, membership. 5W and uh, Barn Digital, welcome to NP support as well. So what is, as well as Betty Lou Fa. Thank you very, very much. And just me, Nicole, back with $5. Good evening. Been waiting all day, staying away from YouTube for this. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mr. Excuse is back with a $5 super chat. Jester, have a girlfriend. Can I nominate the annoying Jennifer O'Connell? Oh, no. Why would you do that? That's awful. <laughs> Maybe he wants them to suffer. I don't know. Uh, John O'Landon with a $7 super chat. Hello from Toronto. Watch this live today. Can't wait to hear your reactions. Thank you very much. And Cass Awakening with a $2 super chat. Sending all love. You add great value to us all. Thank you very much. And Elizabeth Hart and Yvette Dejeuner with um, member purchases. Thank you very much. And I believe Goko Donnie added five uh, Gifted Northern Perspective memberships as well so i think that brings us up to date everybody so without further ado this is going to be a while um the one thing i did do is i did find that there were breaks in here i cut those out um so uh i'll uh increase my volume a little bit because people want me to be louder um and uh uh, so the stream is going to, or the, the actual video is about three hours and six minutes instead of the full three hours, 27 with all the breaks. So let's get to this. Welcome to meeting number 108 of the House of Commons Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates, fondly known as the Mighty Ogo. Thank you to Northern Perspectives for that shout out as well for the mighty Ogo. Pursuant to standing order 1083C and the motion adopted by the committee on Monday, October 17th, 2022, the committee is meeting to consider matters related to the RiveCan application. As always, a reminder not to put earpieces next to the microphones as it causes feedback and potential injury to our very vital translation uh, department. So if you didn't hear, that was where the actual shout out was. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because this is about <laughs> this is about Canadians and the corruption. It's in the about government. taking down Christian Firth. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, that was uh, that was crazy to actually hear that. And yes. Thank you to all of you who um, who let us know on YouTube and also on Twitter because we had we had no idea. <laughs> Yeah, it was crazy, um, and we're just we're, we're we're so honored and we're privileged because now that is literally etched into parliamentary record. So you know we're going to be able to look that up in five days when uh, the government website has been updated, and we'll see our name up there. So, um, but thank you to all of you as well because we know a lot of you have been um, letting the MPs know and talking to them, emailing them, and it is we are just so fortunate to have such a magnificent community. So that's all we're going to spend on that. Um, Daniel with a 279 Super Chat, great birthday today. Now for my final present. Well, happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday. And um, we have uh, Mixture Excuses with five uh, Gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very, very much. Shadow Walker with a 1399 Super Chat, you make me proud again to be Canadian. Looking forward to the upcoming interviews. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. That means a lot. Uh, Pandemonium with a $5 super chat. <laughs> um, once you picture it, you're not going to be able to unsee it. Larry Brock in a Puritan costume with the name tag Witchfinder Attorney General. <laughs> <laughs> and you're doing that at the beginning of the stream. Come on, Pandemonium. <laughs> All right, let's get to it. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back, Mr. Firth, to Ogo. Just uh, quickly, colleagues. 
Um, just to explain to Mr. First Lawyer, Mr. Brent Timmons will be uh, with us throughout uh, the meeting with his client. He is not, Mr. Timmons though is not a witness and thus he may not address the committee. The council may be on Zoom call with the witness and they may speak directly to their clients but not to the committee or committee members. I note for committee members that they should only question the witness and not speak or ask questions of the lawyer who is not appearing as a witness. Um, Mr. Firth may from time to time refer to uh, and talk to Mr. Um, Timmons, which case he will turn off his mic. If it is during one of your interventions, we will pause the clock for that uh, moment. We will suspend for 10 minutes after the first two rounds to give uh, Mr. Firth and Mr. Timmons as well as members a break. And then after that, it'll be every two rounds we will break for or we'll suspend for five minutes. Uh, my intent, colleagues, is to have uh, the clerk swear in Mr. Firth, if that is fine with everyone. Wow. Wow. Okay, so a couple things right off the bat, everybody. Um, so everyone obviously heard that Mr. Firth has his lawyer with him. Very wise. He didn't have his lawyer with him last time, even though he had secured a, war, uh, a lawyer. Very unwise, as we saw. And if you recall, in the previous testimony that uh, Christian Firth gave, he was asked by Larry Brock, um, have you secured a lawyer? Yes. Has your lawyer expressed to you the importance of telling the truth? Yes. And then he went on to not tell the truth many times. Well, and this time they're going to swear him in, which is hopefully going to make sure he tells the truth. Now, you may remember us saying this in the past, but in parliamentary committee and whenever a witness is brought before parliament um, by any other means, they are expected to tell the truth. If they don't, it can be a breach of parliamentary privilege, which can then lead to contempt of parliament. However, when they're swearing them in, there are legal ramifications for if they lie. Right, and my expectation is that they informed Christian Firth that you will be sworn in, and um, that probably had something to do with him bringing his counsel as well. So, um, so this is this is interesting. It's not unexpected, but but it's still significant. Yeah, it's 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 only the first time. Like, so him and and Mindone are, are I think the first two that have been sworn in in the last like that ten we've years. Seen. Or something. Yeah, it's been quite a while, anyways. So, but it's like a step above and beyond what is normally expected at committee. Right. So he could he could be dealing with a lot more problems should he be proven to be lying. Coco Donnie with a five dollar super chat. It's official now. You made it. So much. Congrats. Thank oh, you thank so much. You. And Kay Bradley with a five. Kay Bradley Mason with a five dollar super chat. Had to take a nap this afternoon so I could stay awake for this tonight. <laughs> Huge respect from New, uh, New Brunswick. Thank you. Oh, it's late there too. Oh yes, oh. yeah. It's like ten o'clock. Yeah, yeah, quarter after ten. Thank you very much for joining us, Kaylee Valley, a member for two months. Congratulations on the perspective. Thank you for standing uh, for true Canadian values. You are so welcome for that. And Rob Blaine with a ten dollar super chat not northern perspective more like proper perspective you two are rock stars so glad i found your channel and community oh, thank, thank you so much thank you and shout out to the mighty ogo as well um you know K kelly in my opinion he's one of the best chairs out there not just because he mentioned northern perspective but no we've been saying that all along he's awesome he's, he's very he's, fair yeah he seems very polite but if if you are going on and on and on and just causing a ruckus for no reason he will pull the I'm the chair card. Yeah, he will put you in your place yeah, very quick. Yeah, 100%. Michael Kovacs with five gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very much. And Floody Boy making an appearance again with a $5 Super Chat. Thank you very much. Are you Michael Jackson fans? If you could name one Michael Jackson song that matches Canadian politics. Uh, Pierre, uh, a jab at JT, etc. What would it be and why? Um, smooth Criminal. <laughs> <laughs> But he's not so smooth. <laughs> so there you go. Smooth brain criminal, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, anyhow, let's uh, let's get into this. This is already intriguing. I see that. Mr. Clerk, we'll go ahead. And then we'll have Mr. Firth for an opening five minutes. It's Mr. Firth. I just sent you an email. Uh, you have the choice of uh, either a religious oath or a solemn affirmation. I'll perhaps give yourself, uh, Mr. Timmons, a second to, to see that email, but uh, I can also walk you through that. So uh, please do let me know if you prefer the oath or the solemn affirmation. Uh, 
So just waiting on Firth to read his email because I gave him two options, a religious and non-religious option for swearing in. The oath, please. Oh, God-fearing man. Okay, in the case of the oath, I will read the, uh, the following passage and you can respond. Do you swear that the evidence you shall give on this examination shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Firth. We'll turn the floor over to you for an opening statement. Uh, please go ahead, sir. Thank you. This is my third time before the committee. I have been compelled to be here. The last month, virtually, everything reported about my company in the media and stated about me and my company has been false. I have submitted to the committee a complete list of all contracts we have been awarded from the government in our history. I have included the nominal value of the contract, and more importantly, the full amounts we have invoiced the government under those contracts. We have also included the total amount we have paid our subcontractors under those contracts. And as you can see, the amounts paid to GC Strategies are not the astronomical amount being claimed by some committee members. Since my last appearance before you, this committee has summoned many departments and their representatives with whom we have had dealings. The committee informed each of these representatives that we were criminals, forgers, and fraudulent. The committee said that if they did not terminate all our contracts and spend, suspend our ability to obtain contracts, that they were negligent and complicit in misusing taxpayer money. The committee also strongly encouraged each department to refer these matters to the RCMP. As a result, and not surprisingly, each department complied, terminating our agreements and our ability to continue government work. In addition, they have confirmed the matters that have been requested and referred to the RCMP for investigation. As a result, although I welcome an independent investigation, for it will exonerate me, and the committee has not chosen to wait for the results of that investigation, I will not be able to answer questions about the matters referred to the RCMP. I trust you'll understand. GC Strategies has appeared before this committee twice, giving hours of testimony. We have also cooperated throughout the entire study and provided all documentation requested of us. We have been portrayed as reluctant witnesses by some committee members and media. However, the truth is we've always been accessible, willing to answer committee members' questions in writing. The committee has not once reached out for a response to question. Instead, the committee exercised the most extreme measures and we had the full weight of the government come down on us. Compelling us to be here by subpoena, knowing full well this is against medical advice as outlined in our doctor's notes we have provided as part of the evidence package. I'm certain any medical professional would attest that the threat of arrest and detainment would cause undue stress. Since our first publicized appearance, myself and my business partner have received hundreds of threatening and abusive emails, all of which have been documented and they have been shared. I would read these aloud, but to be frank, they are vile and not suitable for any audience. The nature of these communications, threatening our lives and the lives of our family and children, and have given rise to our reasonable ask for future appearances to not be televised. The chair unanimously and without justification denied our request, intent on isolating Mr. Anthony and myself for one another and broadcasting to the, res to the result of the widest possible audience. Over the past few months, we've had images of our homes and the addresses of our personal dwellings published across media titles, journalists turning up to our private property, confronting family members and our young children across, and their privacy violated with strangers taking photographs of them whilst in the hockey changing rooms. Surely the members of this committee can agree this isn't acceptable output from this process. We offered to appear in public, but requested not to be televised over these concerns. We were rejected, we've been separated, and we're being televised. We can only conclude that this televised nature of today's meeting aids in political goal scoring while simultaneously using us as media fodder at the expense of our health and the safety of our families. This is either fair nor reasonable. I've shown up and will answer questions to the best of my ability, but may require frequent breaks. I will answer questions for as long as I am able, but cannot guarantee I will be able to make it all the way through. Thank you. All right. So let's get to some of this stuff number one it's interesting in how christian firth has chosen to appear if you recall on his previous testimony he um he was wearing a suit he was well groomed and he didn't really have the best webcam i find it interesting that he has chosen to go unshaven for about probably six or seven days and um 
he, all of a sudden he has a high definition webcam so we can see every line on his face. And he has chosen not to wear a suit. He is wearing a hoodie or, or a uh, turtleneck uh, zip up sweater. So that's interesting. And it looks like he's in his lawyer's office if, uh, if I were to guess where he is. Now, a couple of things. We try and be as objective as possible in Northern Perspective, everybody knows that. I think we can all agree that any vitriol that is directed to the family or the children, that's out of bounds, that's not cool. Yeah, that's extremely inappropriate. You know, the, the son is not responsible for the sins of the father, as the saying goes. Right. So, um, so wanna, wanna get, uh, wanna get that out of the way. Um, number two, you know, a journalist showing up at his house. Well, here's the thing, Mr. Firth. I don't sympathize with people showing up at your house. Why? You have ch you had chosen to make your home office your place of work, and your place of work is where the journalists are looking to show up. So, you know, you kind of take that on yourself if you if you make your home office the, your your only address for your business. So, you know, you, you can't really blame the journalists about that. Um, and the, the other issue is that, um, you know, regarding the, <laughs> regarding his statement about, well, you know, we, we've, we've asked for these not to be televised. Yeah, I'm sure you have, but guess what? It's this, parliamentary record. This is what transparency is, folks. Well, and it's parliamentary record. It belongs to Canadians like us. And there's nothing sensitive in this testimony that could pose a security risk to the country. So, of course, it's going to be televised. Right. Sorry. Um, now, in terms of his, his other point about, well, you know, um, they, they, they chose to use the full, full uh, weight of the government to, to, to come at us, you know, and, and they didn't try and ask us questions. Well, they, asked, they actually asked you to come back to committee and you refused. Multiple times, if I'm not mistaken. And you're, you're trying to say, oh, well, my doctor is saying that I shouldn't come back. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, it's probably stressful when you're about to be arrested and go to jail. But... I didn't put you in that position. Canadians didn't put you in that position. The government didn't put you in that position. Nobody put you in the position to actually lie to committee the first time. So yeah, when you were exposed to be a outright liar, guess what? People aren't going to trust you. <laughs> Your credibility is going to be shot. And now you're complaining about it. I don't have sympathy for you there. The only thing that I have sympathy for Christian Firth and Darren Anthony are is if people are going after their families and their kids. That's where I have the sympathy for. And I don't even have sympathy for Christian. I have sympathy for the families. Well, exactly. They never asked for that. So, but, you know, what it seems like here is he is trying to look mentally stressed. He is trying to look in, in and present himself in a manner that is going to garner sympathy. And for the all of the people out there that, you know, are actually, you know, struggle with mental illness, I don't think he's doing them any any justice by claiming that he is you know mentally stressed like yeah i imagine you are how about this don't be a criminal that how, ship has sailed don't forge resumes like you admitted to doing you, you 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 tried to pass it off as well you know it's just something we do well something you do that's illegal is still illegal that's called forgery when you admit to that so what like what do you want firth you're not going to get any sympathy when you actually ag admit to criminal acts in parliamentary committee. Um, the other thing that he said is um, it's obvious he's talking to the RCMP now because he has said that there are certain things that he won't be able to answer because it's part of the RCMP investigation. That's just going to be a fact here, folks. He's, he's going to... Um, there's going to be certain things he's not allowed to talk about or and that his lawyer will say, do not talk to, to these people, but do not give them answers about one of the things that we talked about before that we expected Firth may or may not be doing is cutting a deal. So, although, and, and I can't remember if we actually spoke about this on a live stream or if Fox and I were talking about this with some people, uh, uh, like with our, with our friends off, off stream, but um, I expected one of two things to happen today. Number one, um, he was going to spill the beans on everything which would not be advisable from a legal perspective, or he wasn't going to spill the beans on everything, but 
save that to make a deal with the RCMP. Now, in my opinion, that's what he should do. Go get the big fish, but I'm not going to give it to you in, in parliamentary committee because I need some bargaining chips. If I just let it all loose in, in, in parliamentary committee, I have nothing keeping me out of jail. So that's what I'm kind of expecting based on what, uh, what his initial opening statement was. And uh, we'll see what happens. Um, so we have Peter G gifting five Northern Perspective memberships and saying, I made it to my, my one month supporter membership. Here are five more members for others. Thank you very much, Peter. And then we have Mr. Roscoe Pico with a $10 super chat. It says, you guys are awesome. Tomorrow will be also, I think there might be a setup line for tomorrow, I think. And then Diane Sylvain with a $5 super chat. Thank you very much. It says, is Champlain first lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> LOL. Congratulations on being part of parliamentary record. We are indeed living in historical times. Thank you. Uh, we have Mike St. John with uh, a member for two months comment. It says, thank you, Northern Perspective, for everything you do. And I hope you keep this crusade against the liberals going and keeping Pierre accountable. We absolutely will. Um, thank you to Mrs. J. McDowell, member for one month. It says, I think Firth may be crossing his fingers during his oath. Oh, I hope not. I think that's like really bad, especially if you're religious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jono Landon says uh, that that shout out deserves a super chat. Thank you very much, Jono. And Mr. Excuses with a $5 super chat says anybody who trusts what Firth says must still believe in those tiny house hippos exist. Yes. Do you remember those commercials? No. What? Are I, you serious? I haven't watched TV in a long time. No, but like they, they weren't for a long time. It was like when we were kids. Well, I'm like, older than you. <laughs> yeah, you are older than me. <laughs> Just me, Nicole, with a $5 super chat says uh, in doubt he is in Canada. My guess is he is far, far from here where they can't get him back or found guilty of wrongdoing, in my opinion. Well, he must be in Canada, otherwise he wouldn't have shown up to committee. Yeah, he could have quite easily ignored the summons. It's not like... Um, they, they can't summon you if you're outside of the country. Yeah, and it's not like a, a warrant where they can go to that country and say, oh, well, can you help us extradite him back? Yeah, so, um, so he's definitely in Canada if he's appearing. Uh, and thank you to Endergate gifting five Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very much. And thank you to Milady Loves Cats gifting 10 Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And then welcome to MP supporter Bruce McDonald. And we have Gokudani with a $5 super chat. It says, prison orange is not flattering and you don't want gen pop. Only friendly advice he'll get from me. <laughs> and thank you Red Barbs with a six ninety nine super chat. It says, thank you for your insightful and support for truth and freedom. We must continue to speak out loud, folks. Absolutely. And, and... The more you speak, like the people around you will hear and and they'll start to understand and then they'll start to speak out against the same thing as well. So it really is kind of like a game of telephone, isn't it? And Bane with a $10 super chat. Money for the new glasses you're going to need. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I just got these new glasses. And Gokudani with a $2 super chat says, born in 69. We remember that. <laughs> yep. And... Uh... Uh, we are 700 likes behind, folks. Oh my so goodness! You guys can do better. Hit that like button, let's, please. Uh, let's get that up there so we can get uh, get as many Canadians notified of this stream as possible. All right. Uh, and we have Christine Noseworthy, member for four months. I look every morning to see if you put something up. Thank you for all you do. Thank you very much for that, Thank uh, you. Christine. And we have Kaylee Valley with five gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very, very much for that. Okay, let's get to it. Thanks, Mr. Firth. And we just ask if you do require a different break that you just uh, advise us and let us know. We'll start with Mr. Barrett for six minutes, please. Mr. Firth, it's correct that you uh, you have legal counsel with you this morning? That's correct. So this is the, uh, the first time of your appearances where um, you have a lawyer present, but didn't in, in previous uh, appearances. Uh, have you ever lied to a parliamentary committee before? <laughs> That's an opening question. I think in previous testimony, you, you see the answer with that one about the chalet and the cottage. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. <laughs> wow. Good one, Barrett. Um, and he actually got a straight answer. Well, kind of a straight answer. He what? got an admission. <laughs> uh, he could have oh, just said goodness. yes. Um, but I imagine he doesn't want it on parliamentary record that he said yes. Well, 
also this way it's very specific like he's admitting that yes i lied but he was also specifying that it was about this is it about other things who knows but on record it's about this particular thing yeah so if anyone comes back to me and said well you know you, you lied about this i i didn't i didn't say that i said uh i said i lied about a shallow in a cottage that's what i said right so it's a clever way and yep. so far i think this is a this is a, a legal counsel talking uh, point because uh, he probably knew he was going to be asked about this uh jarsha with a five dollar super chat we need to buy cypher a box of proper throwing glasses so he doesn't <laughs> ruin his prescription thank you so much <laughs> uh five dollars should do it thank you <laughs> So is that a yes? Oh. I advise you to go and watch my previous testimony. Well, I, I was there and I, I asked the question and of course um, you uh, you did lie about uh, about Mr. McDonald's um, secondary residence uh, quite famously on uh, it not being a cottage but in fact it being a chalet. Um, uh, further, you lied about meeting government officials um, outside of government offices. And further, you lied about providing hospitality to uh, government officials. Um, there was a great deal of information that was requested of you that was uh, not furnished committee, uh, promising to tell the committee who in government contacted you about uh, ArriveCan. Um, that information hasn't been provided to us. You didn't disclose uh, meetings with government officials and you failed to provide documentation that the committee has asked you for. Last week, Government officials announced that files concerning GC strategies, role and involvement in a RIVE scam have been sent uh, to the RCMP. Uh, did the government make you aware of that? Yes or no, please. No, they have not. Has the RCMP contacted you about uh, a RIVE can? No, they have not. So the RCMP has uh, further, they have not interviewed you. That is correct. Have you been contacted by the RCMP about any work relating to any companies or ventures that you're involved in and their work with the government of Canada or government officials? No, I have not. That's interesting. And I'm trying to think to myself, why would that be? And is it possible, because there's an investigation going on in this, we know that, in terms of an RCMP investigation, there is evidence that's been provided by the government, we know that. And McDonald is trying, is, has said that they haven't talked to the RCMP Firth is saying that the, he hasn't talked to the RCMP. So it's interesting, and this is this is a large assumption, folks. The only reason I can think of the fact that they haven't talked to the RCMP is because the RCMP doesn't need to talk to them, or doesn't want to talk to them to like blow their cover. Yeah, like because. Maybe. Or, or maybe the RCMP have talked to him and he just didn't know they were RCMP. Hey, okay? they were undercover. Possible, it's possible. That and that's what I mean. Like they, they haven't needed to disclose that, um, which means, which means, folks, if, if that is the case, I'm not saying it is, but if that is the case, then the RCMP is looking much higher than McDonald, Utano, and Firth as well. That's what that could mean. Just food for thought. Anyway, I'm sure we're going to learn some more as we go. So um, take that speculation with a grain of salt, please. And we'll see where this goes. Pandemonium Month 5 get to Northern Perspective Memberships. Thank you very much. And Goko Donnie with a $5 Super Chat. Thanks to you too. I have hope for my kids who are your age now. You don't know how old we are, Goko Donnie. <laughs> I'm a millennial. <laughs> Yeah, Fox, uh, Fox is a millennial. Nobody knows how old Cypher is. I old. could be an old fart. You are an old fart. Oh, nothing wrong with being an old <laughs> fart. Uh, elderly flatulence, I prefer there to say. 
Uh, okay, let's get going. And we still need about 600 likes to match up, so please make sure you hit that like button when we get to 1,500 likes. I'm going to drop some memberships. Do you know if your partner, Darren Anthony, has been uh, contacted by, by the RCMP uh, to the same effect? Ask him. I do know, and he has not. Oh. If requested by the RCMP, will GC Strategies files, computers, emails, cell phones, and uh, any area where uh, data is stored um, or devices that have been used to communicate with the Government of Canada as part of their investigation into the ARRIVE scam, will you, um, will you voluntarily uh, submit that information to the RCMP? We will deal directly with the RCMP once they contact us. Sir, how much did you state in your previous appearance before this committee uh, were you paid to work on ArriveCan? For the ArriveCan application build, which is what we gave our numbers to the committee for last year, we said it was approximately $11 million was the application build. Okay. Uh, the Auditor General, um, though you've said that all of the reporting about your company since your last appearance has been false, there's been heavy media reporting about the work of Canada's Auditor General. Um, she detailed a different number. Um, is the uh, is the information that the Auditor General has submitted uh, incorrect? Yes, it is. We actually were asked by the Auditor General to give comment uh, prior to the report being published, whether we could support the numbers that they were putting in there. And actually, we, well, if you remember from my last previous testimony when I was ridiculed and being called disingenuous for not having the true cost of a right can, um, we discussed the fact that there were three COVID-19 pandemic contracts. There was not one that was solely set aside for a rive can. So I can understand why it was hard for the Auditor General with her also indicating that some of the task authorizations for a rive can could have had resources doing no work. Since my testimony and how I got the numbers there, I painstakingly went through every single invoice, spoke to every consultant and got an understanding of what their level of effort was for the arrive can application build. And my numbers were in line with what Mr. Utano testified last time. Okay. The, uh, that's information that you um, ought to have had at your last appearance, but um, I'll, I'll take the Auditor General's word that, uh, that the number was in excess of $19 million, which of course is not the number that you submitted to this uh, committee. Um, at your second appearance before this committee, you testified that you did not meet with government officials outside of government offices, and we now know that you did that on multiple occasions. Why did you lie to this committee? That's a good question, because that's a question that Canadians want to know the answer to. Is it, is it, a, is it an answer that's going to further the investigation? Probably not, but it's, a, it's an answer that Canadians deserve to know. Because if you come to committee and if you're asked to tell the truth and you don't, um, I think we deserve a, a, an answer. Why? We pay for this. The proceeding that he, he, he was a part of today, we paid for just about everyone to be there. So, you know, we want to know why. And he was paid taxpayer money to sit in his basement and find people to work on a, or arrive camp. We need that answer as well. Casper H. with 10 gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very much, Casper. Nice to see you. And um, as uh, as Barnaby said, one, and Fox said, once we get to 1,500 likes, we will be gifting some memberships of our own. So we are at 1,384. We're 114 away. Let's get it up there, folks. Uh, Arctic Gamer uh, 59 with a $2 super chat. Everyone like the stream. Take my toonie. <laughs> there you go. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that. And All for Truth and Freedom with a 279 super chat. Thank you very much for that. Very much appreciated. And we're almost over 2,000 viewers, everybody. And each like helps get more viewers in. Let's go. It was not a lie. I just was unaware. I hadn't checked all of my outlook, but I can tell the committee today that I have met with officials outside of work. Of course, we know that, sir. Uh, and uh, we understand that you're telling us that now, having been caught in the lie. The question is, why did you believe it was necessary to attempt that uh, that deception before this parliamentary committee? It wasn't a deception. I just wasn't informed of all the meetings that I had or had not have had. I wasn't have access to my outlook. What? I'm sorry. 
I, I don't I don't buy that. I don't buy that at all. And and nobody in that room buys that. Nobody watching buys that. Um, you don't need access to Outlook to know that you had <laughs> you had functions with people during the most significant time in Canadian and world history in the last twenty years, and where you got lots of contracts in a very short period of time. I don't buy it. Well, you may not know exactly how many, but you can be like, oh, yeah, I had several. Right. right? But he said, I didn't have any. Yeah. Come on. What are the names of all of the government officials that you have met with outside of government offices? I'm more than happy to provide that information in writing, but I'm not prepared to do that right now televised. Are, are you able to name a single? Well, sir, it's not it's not your discretion which answers that you're able to provide in writing. I'm asking you a question. Are you refusing to answer the question? No, I gave you my answer. I'm not refusing to answer the question. I will give you the names. I'm Thanks. so no so, for, so so. What are the names, sir? What okay. what are the names, sir? That is yeah. I have to interrupt. That I, is that is our time. Perhaps we can get back to it in the next round. Mr. Sousa, please. Isn't that interesting? And I bet the reason why he wants to provide it in writing is so the officials that are named don't know who actually provide the names. And it's more of a protecting yourself type of a uh, type of an action here. Well, yeah, if they all have dirt on each other and Firth spills the beans like right now, there could be retaliation. Right. So... Anyway, we will see. Uh, we're 20 likes away from free memberships, folks, but we did break 2,000 viewers, so great job, everyone. Uh, so as uh, Humble Tracker says, ring the doorbell on your way in. Okay, uh, let's let's go. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Firth, uh, before we begin, have you ever been approached separately by any individual members of this committee or oh, any other committee? Besides the chair, no, have people try to reach out to you? Nope. Nobody from the committee has. Okay, and you've already indicated how much you've received for work you've done relative to the contracts with the Rive Can. How much was that? I gave over on October approximately eleven million dollars worth of invoices. And how much commission was that? How much did you receive for your for your services? We. I mean, received... I know you had you have costs there, right? Yeah, this is the gross number. Would be two point approximately two point five million dollars was gross. Uh, I mean net to you, net to me. Great. Less um, expenses. That's exactly gross. Less expenses. Less tax. You don't even know what gross versus net means. What, what kind of business guy is he? What is wrong with you? And he's trying to correct Sousa. Like, Sousa's right in this case. And Sousa should be right in this case because Sousa's background is financials and banking. What? <laughs> okay. Um, oh, jeez. Okay, maybe he's not lying. Or maybe he is lying. And he's also just dumb. Holy moly. How have you been in, in the business sector? for what more than 15 years now and you don't know the difference between gross and net all right so for those that don't know and i'm sure everybody here knows but if you don't if you're uh if you just have never needed to know so when you're talking about expenses versus revenue so what they're talking about is the 11 million dollars that christian firth is claiming that they've received that is the gross revenue that he's saying that uh, that GC Strategies has received, meaning total, non-deductive, non-expensive. That's the total amount of revenue that they've received. Now, net is after expenses. So what he's saying is we received $11 million and we paid a whole bunch of money. Uh, what's that? $8.5 million to all of the contractors and any other expenses that they may have. So his operational expenses, because they probably don't have any capital expenses, are around $8.5 million, leaving them with a net, meaning take home, that they put in their bank accounts of $2.5 million. That's what net means. So and, it's still nothing to sneeze at. Like that's it, a lot of that's money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of taxpayer money. Yeah, a lot of money to make in one year. Come on. <laughs> well, in, in just a couple months, even. So, 
And he's trying to say, well, yeah, gross. No, that's net. You don't know the difference between gross and it's... <laughs> All right. Um, so chalk that one up to uh, a, another chalet. So Rafi Sadies with a $5 super chat. I'm sorry I got hit in the head repetitively and don't remember. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the lady loves cats with a $5 super chat. Is that a chalet, a cottage, or a cabin in that painting by Firth? Uh, it looks like, like a church. Ocean? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or maybe it's just a barn, but uh, it looks in the shape of a church. And Humble Tracker coming in with 20 gifted and earned for second memberships. Thank you very much for that, Humble Tracker. Very much appreciated. And we're at 1584 likes, everybody, uh, which is why Fox gifted five Northern Perspective memberships to everybody. Thank you very much. Let's please get those likes up and see if we can match our attendees. And we continue on with Mr. Snooza. I understand. Um, in terms of politicians um has any elected officials ever approached you to negotiate a contract no we have no has any politicians or members of parliament in the past no, approached you to do a contract no sir <clears throat> so um your involvement let's understand cordell system for a sec Explain to me that relationship and your involvement with that company. So we had no relationship at all with Cordell. We purchased them in 2015 in April and subsequently took three to four months to do a name change for CRA and PSBC to absorb those corporate requirements. And Cordell had been a government contractor in the past? I believe so, yes. We've, we've never worked with Cordell ever especially not prior to April 2015. That's funny. That's funny. Because you know what that does, everybody? What's that? <laughs> that, completely, that completely amputates all of these talking points that the Liberals have had, that um, Christian Firth and, and Darren Anthony were basically just GC strategies during the Harper government. Because what they've been saying this whole time is, oh, well, you know, these, these guys used to be Corridor Systems before, and they, they, they were doing uh, business with the Harper government. And what Christian Firth is just saying is, no, we bought them in 2015. <laughs> 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 so he's saying, yeah, that wasn't us. That's funny. Interesting. That is so funny, everybody. So that, yeah, that completely amputates and squashes that narrative that the uh, that the liberals are, are have been trying to use that the conservatives are probably giggling on the other side. And I see. Mm. Well, I think we're learning this for the first time as well, aren't we? Yeah, like we we found the actual business registry with their name on on the company, um, which is strange. But um, they're saying that they purchased them in in 2015. So that's that's interesting. Uh, Mr. Excuses with a $5 super chat. They call it gross because you get sick when you see net <laughs> and how much you lost to taxes. It's true. Facts. We Canadians pay way too much in taxes compared to what government services we receive. Yeah, which is, you know, liberal services or don't receive rather. Yeah. Uh, John O'Landon with a $7 super chat. He is definitely not smart enough to lie without getting caught. He is definitely not smart enough to lie without getting caught. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not sure if you meant to say that twice, but uh, I think saying it twice definitely had a, a larger impact twice the effect may might i say and nick richard uh, welcome to northern perspective supporter uh thank you very much for purchasing membership and dime bag coins uh, member for two months british columbia strong amen to that all of our friends out in british columbia thank you very much and we're at 1645 likes 2100 viewers everybody ring the doorbell on your way in and let's match those viewers with likes so the youtube pushes this out to a wider audience is there uh, involvement by you or GC Strategies prior uh, to 2015? Have Look you at been him. Doing how, much, how long have you been doing work for the government? I guess what I'm trying to get. How long have you been contracted? Okay. You besides GC but Strategies. Since 2007 was when I first started being uh, in the IT section. So oh, the narrative's alive for Snooza. <laughs> <laughs> watch. Oh, so you, you, you were doing business during the Harper Gum. Well, watch. Watch this. Services to the government. And how much do you recall how much you've received overall with with the government of canada including those years how many contracts sorry how much sorry, yeah how much you how many contracts how much money you've made over that period of time probably close to 100 contracts in totality from 2007 to 2023 
And that process was a similar way you're doing it now. You've you've arranged a contract and then you subcontract to service providers and skill sets. Is that how it works? Yeah, I've been I've been working in the IT staffing industry since 2007, like the other 636 other firms that are out there. So that's normal practice uh, in industry and in other governments as well. Do you know? Yes, I can't speak to other industries, but in the federal government where I've been working since 2007, I can say that's normal practice. And um, in in your uh, del deliberations in coming here today, I mean, it's seen as been very tough on your family and yourself. Um, do you, what is, what is it that people are perceived that you're trying to hide something? What is it that is concerning you here? This is a dangerous line that uh, Sousa is taking. And I mean, dangerous for the party. Don't be trying to paint Christian Firth as a victim here. It's not going to go well for you, Sousa, at all. He's admitted to breaking the law. Like, case closed. He's admitted to breaking the law in committee. So, <sighs> at your peril, be my guest. Um, okay, so we have uh, a couple super chats to get to. Yeah, we have Emily A. with a $5 super chat. Thank you very much. Uh, it says he's British. Eleven point five gross, less taxes, less other reductions, as in minus. So on this point, he's correct, I believe. Also, thanks. So if uh, if what we're reading from what you're saying, Emily, uh, then British economics doesn't use the term net. Uh, and if that's the case, that's interesting. Uh, and thank you for providing some education for us today. And four twenty hitter with a two dollar super chat it says every like is a middle finger to Trudeau. Uh, to uh, I can't talk. <laughs> To Trudeau, to hit Trudeau, it. thank you. <laughs> so smash those likes and give Trudeau a bunch of middle fingers. That's what 420 is trying to say. So thank you very much. So it, it's actually just how this whole thing is being conducted. It's nothing about information and how it's being shared or even asking the questions. I mean, anybody in our industry or anybody in the 5,000 IT staffing firms employing $81,000 contributing $10 billion to the economy knows exactly what our staff and what our business model is. It's people that are misinformed and misled are the ones who are up, up in arms understanding this. This is there's a cost of doing business, and 636 other firms have the same business processes as we do. So, when ArriveCan came to be, and we were the, the government was looking at trying to uh, put this together, did you approach them, or did someone approach you? First time I knew that this there was going to be a, a pandemic response contract, I was reached out to by PSPC. They were the ones informed me that there was going to be a contract issued to us. It was a pre-contract uh, email saying, just, you know, GC Strategies is being selected to uh, for a contract award of $2.35 million. And who signed that email? Who did that come from? That came from Angela Durgan of PSPC. Prior to that, you had been dealing with Botler AI and two founders of that company. And right. they, they're the ones that... Uh, Sort of came to PSBC and came and complained about the processes of their contract, which there was no contract. Is that correct? Correct. And they issued concerns that uh, there was uh, privileged information, or I, I don't understand. Explain to me what is Butler AI's issue in regards to your engagement. Now, Mr. Souza, this isn't about a rive can. Of course not. I'm just just saying this, what you're talking about isn't about a rive can. Just so everybody understands. Uh, Richard Hepner with one gifted Northern Perspective membership. Thank you very much. Uh, and for those that uh, may be new, um, one of Suze's main talking points is he loves to remind everybody when they're talking about Bottler that it's not about a Rive Can. Uh, Jerry Savoy with a $2 super chat. Just wait, uh, Jenny's turn, you see. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, okay. Yeah, he doesn't really hold back, does he? Not after he was yeah. calling uh, the ministers. Well, he was saying they were equivalent to house plants, and that the house plants might do a better job. <laughs> Leo Orchard with a two dollars super chat. I'm British. We do use net. Firth is filth. Okay, <laughs> clarifies that. All right. Thank you very much for the added context. Um, but this is strange. Um, it's very strange that this doesn't make any sense. That that Christian Firth is saying. Um, PSPC notified them that they won the contract. How do you even know? How, how is that possible? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. 
Because in the Auditor General's report, she said there was two bids. One, one was Deloitte, and the other was GC Strategies. So how could you have been notified by PSPC, public, um, so uh, uh, public service procurement services? It's procurement division. I don't know why these government acronyms. Um, they're the ones that issue the contracts. How can you be notified by PSPC that you've won a contract that you didn't even bid on? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. There are things in the government which are called standing offers. Now, what that is, is it's a, it's a pre-negotiated rate that the government makes with the companies. And they sign that. Uh, and that's good for a certain amount of time. So, for example, if you're going to go and buy a bunch of chairs, then you, there's probably a standing offer, meaning you, you will get these chairs at a discounted rate of, say, $400 a chair. Then you can just say, I need 10 chairs. And you just utilize that standing offer, and then a purchase order goes out, and off you go. This is different. This is, you're, you're looking to build something from scratch. You can't have a standing offer to just build something from scratch. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So that's really fishy to me. Um, anyway, I'm sure we'll learn more as we go. Uh, Nilik with a $5 super chat. Thank you very much. Rings doorbell. Just got caught up. Hope softball snooze and knows this is about a red can. Firth is looking rough. Haha. <laughs> Bet the lawyer is looking panicked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, lawyer probably doesn't want him to say uh, who he actually is, but uh, I think they did say it at the beginning. And, and thank you to Leo Orchard with a $2 super chat. It says, I'm British. We do use net. Firth is filth. And Humble Tracker with a $10 super chat. Uh, Quote time, the day you stop fearing death is the day you start to live. Life is not merely to survive, but thrive, and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. Great quote, Humble Tracker. Thank Very you. Very good one. And the Colonel making an appearance, a member for one month. Oh my God, let's go, PP for PM. I guess Firth finally found the fortitude and gonads to show to committee. <laughs> Sadly, can't watch uh, much, but we'll watch later. No problem, it'll be available, Colonel. And Rob Vucetis with a $2 Super Chat. Easy, they, they communicated by Magic Owl. Amazing, amazing. Okay. Well, that's actually a good question. We we're still unclear of what the misconduct and allegations are towards our company. Um, my understanding is it's been referred to the RCMP. We have not been contacted. So unfortunately, I cannot give comment on what those allegations are because we're just not aware what they are. So you didn't have a contract and Botler did not have a contract, but you were trying to promote Botler in accessing opportunities with the uh, government uh, uh, situations. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. We actually even at one time, well, we were starting to try and get them get their own vehicle so the government could miss the middleman out and go direct to Butler. How many people? How many people did Butler employ at that point? They were a two-person company out of a penthouse, and so they were trying to gain contracts with government through your support, through your relationships, through your experience. Is that how it worked? Yeah, we were offering free business development and sales and leads to help them get contracts within the federal government. Yeah, that's our time, Mr. And... Uh Mrs. You. Vignola, please, for six. Go ahead, please. Vignola. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. One th one thing I, I do want to uh, say there, I, I think it's interesting that Christian Firth tried to use the same kind of talking point that they were labeled as, two-person company out of a penthouse. Here's the difference, Firth. They actually do IT work. You don't. Well, not only that, but Butler was already working with uh, the Department Justice of Justice. Yeah, at that point. Yeah, what they had a direct con uh, contract with the government. And this is why they were so confused as to this other process that was going on. And you're telling me, Firth, you haven't watched every single committee? Come on. And here's the other thing. Remember in the initially he said, oh, I've been so, under so much mental stress that I couldn't appear before committee. Well, you obviously weren't under such mental stress that you went through, and I quote him, the painstaking process of going and going and talking to every single contractor that I employed in order to get the dollar number that... Uh, that was asked for at the last committee, end quote. So you you were able to talk to a whole bunch of people, but you're not able to talk to uh, to, to committee when when invited. But, you know, the problem is, is he, he wants people to just send him questions in writing and then he can respond. Well, 
This is the price for working for the government. Sometimes you're called the committee. You don't like that? Don't work for the government. Just go with it with a $5 super chat. Barrett called Firth out as well. It was great to watch everyone hit the like button. Absolutely. We are still about 300 likes behind. Let's see if we can uh, get over 2,200 concurrent viewers. And that's going to depend on the likes because YouTube pushes this out and suggests it to everybody. So thank you very much for that. And make sure that uh, we're all up here. And I think we're good. Continuing on with Miss Vignola. Mr. Firth, thank you very much for being here with us today. I know how difficult this might be. I'll start with questions that are quite straightforward that have to do with testimony that you've made in the past. In October 2022, at your first appearance before the committee, you stated that the government spoke to you to put in place a team that would work under its management and direction for a certain time as part of an equipment undertaking, which you agreed to. Thereafter, you said that you were very proud of the team that you provided to the Government of Canada, which managed and directed that team throughout the entire project. If I understood correctly, your role was solely to recruit. You didn't engage in any project management, any support. You didn't monitor the work that was being done by the people you recruited. Did I understand correctly? That's correct. We also had no hand in budget, operational budget management either. Okay. <laughs> well, I like that. Uh, so Vignola's opening salvo is to try to pin down exactly what Canadians received quote unquote value for money for. And they basically provided no additional value that, you know, a talent management person could have, uh, could have actually attained if they worked directly for the government of Canada themselves and saved 30% on the dollar on every single dollar that was spent. Humble Tracker with 10 gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very, very much for that. Thank you, Humble Tracker. And uh, George with $5 Super Chat. What disciplinary actions might be taken against Firth? Forgery, perjury, contempt of parliament, fraud uh, will be held accountable. So um, forgery, he's admitted to. Um, and so that's, that's number one. So that's a criminal offense. And that also ties in with the fraud, the way he altered the resumes, right? Right. Because, um, well, the, 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 yeah, it's, it's kind of both because when it comes to finding quote unquote talent for these contracts, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to provide a certain level of talent and then you know, commit to providing that level of talent. Now, the problem is, is they did not, did not provide that same level of talent based on their proposal that they put forth. And therefore, they collected the money for that level of talent, even though they didn't provide it. That's called fraud. That's fraud on the government. So, um, but there's also potential bribery in here as well with all of these different functions that, you know, he said he never went to and never arranged, but yet he did. So um, there's that. And if he is actually lying in, and proven to be lying in this committee hearing, he could be charged with perjury as well. Um, contempt of parliament isn't really a charge, but yeah, it's not a criminal charge, but yeah. yeah, you can still kind of like get in trouble for it. And then it also depends ultimately on what the crown prosecutor would lay in terms of charges, if any at all. Um, I know they're not supposed to overcharge, so usually they don't throw the book at somebody. Um, usually they pick up like the big charges and go after those ones. Yeah, um, and uh, no, we don't see the dislikes from our end, uh, JD. Um, but um, the the other thing to, uh, to consider here is like, with somebody like Firth, they're probably going to charge him with every single thing that they can. Um, not that they would be able to I would say go to trial uh, or, or prosecute on every single charge, but just every single charge that they they could, you know, link to them in order to say, now let's have a conversation, right? Um, that's what I would expect to happen in this case. Uh, next super chat comes from Kurt and Denise. Nice to see you both. Uh, $2 super chat. <laughs> Mr. Firth. What is it that you do 
There you go. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't crash the stream this time. Uh, knock on wood. Knock on wood. And Humble Tracker with 10 Gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you very, very much for that. Daphne Devine with a $10 super chat. Throwing a few bucks to start a kitty for Cypher's new rubber frame glasses. <laughs> uh, he's going to be needing them sooner than later. Yeah. Oh, right. boy. There we go. And we're at 1867 likes, 2121 concurrent viewers. Ring the doorbell, folks. If you haven't already, pretty please. Let's get back to it. Merci. Dans le fond, vous understood. So essentially, you were a middleman, an intermediary between the government and human resources when it came to payment. And you skimmed or you received 15 to uh, 30% of the total amount owed. So, yeah, that is correct. We actually, it's in my evidence package I've given forth to you. Uh, over the whole duration of GC Strategies' history with all federal contracts, we've actually approximately 21% is our gross margin for all 60, 65 contracts we've had with the federal government. Becca, um... I see. You also stated in October 2022, in response to a question, uh, where you were asked, as Mr. Souza, Souza recently asked you a moment ago, whether it was elected representatives or officials that res contacted you, and you said that it was uh, officials who reached out to you, public servants. Was that also the case when it comes to the harassment application and Arrive Can? And was it also the case for the COVID Alert app, please? Could you tell me that? So for COVID alert, that was a somebody from Canadian Digital Services reached out to me, understanding the work we've been doing previously on ArriveCan, and that was how the communication started. They were understanding what capacity we had for teams, what our teams were actually doing uh, at ArriveCan, the types of categories and skill sets they had, and that's what that was primarily for like for COVID alert. Could could you please repeat the other two? Uh, en fait, les deux autres... Well, the two others were to introduce uh, certain measures during COVID. So you were also contacted by officials regarding the Butler AI harassment application and also ArriveCan app. Is that correct? So, for, yes, for the ArriveCan app, that was PSPC. That was a government official that reached out to us. But for the Butler, Nobody actually reached out to us. That was just understanding that there was harassment charges that were heavily publicized in the public sector, I'm sorry, public safety portfolio. And so that was when I reached out to Butler, understanding that there were several clients that could be in need of their services. I see. And concerning Butler AI, what occurred is that you were put under a contract that was previously awarded to Dalian and Corridix, if I've understood correctly. Correct. We were advised by CBSA to work with Dalian and Corridix. Okay. And that contract was set aside and awarded to an Indigenous company. At that point, did you get the sense that Dalian was using that as a cover, if you will, in a sense, when it came to statistics regarding uh, contracts awarded to Indigenous persons. You're not Indigenous, uh, from what I can understand, and Butler is not an Indigenous company or individual either, is it? I'm sorry, I'm not the expert to answer that question. I'm, I'm not familiar with the Indigenous procurement process. Um, I, I couldn't give comment on that, I'm sorry. Okay, it's smart that he's not, but he knows damn well. Damn well. Give me a break. You, you know Colin Wood. Um, you know the uh, the president or the um, the CEO of of Cordex. You guys work together. Don't tell me. Don't tell me you didn't know what was going on. I, I like. Come on. Give me a break. K. Bradley uh, Mason with a $5 super chat. A few bucks for Cypher's foam bricks. They feel great to throw. Thank you. I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> and uh, not sure if you were double charged, Rabusades, but uh, 
uh, $2 super chat. Uh, this translator is actually pretty good. Yeah, this is the Australian guy. He's excellent. He's, he's our favorite. Yeah. I don't, I don't know his name, but he's awesome. He is so good. He, he, he is so smooth. Um, and he puts like the intonation into it and, and like the mood into the voice. So it's, he's not just reading monotone or, or he, I guess he's not reading. He's not just translating monotone. He's actually trying to match what the person is saying with the intonation of his voice. He's excellent. Yeah. There's, there's only one other translator I've heard. Uh, that does that and uh, it's it's a lady that does it um, she sounds like she's from Quebec by her her accent Merci. thank you now I'd like to come back to COVID alert you stated that it was a Canadian digital services official who reached out to you were who was that? there officials from Health Canada, who also reached out to you, please. Um, during the COVID alert uh, inception of the contract, it was just purely Canadian Digital Services resources. D'accord. Merci beaucoup. I see. Thank you very much. I have about 30 seconds remaining. We received invoices bank transfers uh, from Gal Dalian to GC Strategies. Now, I won't uh, specify the amounts, if that's okay, but what I did observe was a transfer for Hoodsmith CBSA. Now, I tried to locate the company. I found another family by the same name. Could you please uh, tell me what or who... Hood Smith CBSA is, please. In French, uh, it's a different word, obviously, so that wouldn't be make sense to you, perhaps. Brief answer, Mr. Firth. Um, Hood Smith is a, is a person. It's not a company. It's an individual. Thank you very much. Mr. Backrack, please, for mm. six minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Firth, I, I think I'll start with uh, some of your previous testimony before this committee. Uh, in your previous appearance, when you were asked about the ArriveCan situation and what it reveals about the government's contracting process, you said, I don't think it reveals anything. The reality is that it would have been a perfect execution if the four deliverables had been done on time and been of the standard CBSA would have approved and paid. This was not a contracting issue. So since then, we, we have the Auditor General's scathing report we have the Office of the Procurement Ombudsman, uh, another scathing report looking at the, the contracting and procurement process. Do you still stand by that view that this was not a contracting issue, given all the irregularities that have been very well documented? Well, it's, can you qualify exactly in the previous testimony? Because that doesn't seem like something that resonated with what I was said. I don't think I blame the contracting for the arrive can. I think <laughs> Are you serious, Firth? You should listen to your lawyer on this one. <laughs> um, he's literally reading the parliamentary record of what you said in committee. And you're trying to say, oh, that doesn't sound like something I'd say. Except you did. Except you did. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, George with a five dollar super chat. They're called interpreters, not translators. Translators would translate the parliamentary record. Yeah, you're actually um, uh, on point there, George. Uh, translators typically translate the um, uh, the actual written text, like word for word. Whereas interpreters, to your point, um, they they need to really think on the fly and take what is being said, and they may not translate it word for word. They may interpret it hence the word, into equivalent uh, e equivalent language or an, a, an equivalent slang or, or meaning. So uh, if we'd said translators before, then yeah, we were definitely incorrect. They're definitely interpreters. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And uh, you and I should probably endeavor to uh, make the correction in the future. Yeah, so thank you for bringing that up, George. And we have Mr. Excuse with a $2 super chat. First looks like a crypto scammer, <laughs> a, a, a poor crypto scammer at that. I explained the contracting saying there were three sole source national security exemptions. Okay, well, you, you said this was not a contracting issue. Um, I'm not sure what the context, that seems like it's out of context. I, 
if you could kindly give me the information prior to that. I think the, the question was uh, about uh, what the arrive can situation reveals about the government's contracting process. That's what you were asked about. And you said that you didn't think it revealed anything, that you felt like the problem was not a contracting issue, it was a performance issue. And I, I'm, I guess what I'm what the, uh, PSPC did follow all procurement processes in issuing those contracts for COVID pandemic response, or one of which being the arrive can app. Not according to the Auditor General. Okay, so uh, dis uh, despite all of the the uh, findings that have been brought forth by the Ombudsperson and the Auditor General, you still feel like this was a performance issue and not a contracting issue. But uh, I'll move on. I, I think, Mr. Firth, you, you've portrayed the services that your company provides as one of um, IT recruitment, essentially assembling teams of IT professionals for the government. And yet uh, there's evidence that actually what was happening was the opposite that the government was uh, finding IT professionals that could provide services and then directing them uh, to work with you. Is that what has happened in the past, specifically with well, Mr. I, McDonald and, and other firms? Well, I think, you're, I think you're referring to one specific component where the, the firm approached CBSA and shortly thereafter, those names appeared on one of our contracts. Mm -hmm. um, that was... You know, part of the government is, is pro they have a process, they have a problem, they have to find a solution, and they either have to go to an RFP, which sometimes takes three to six months, or they look to use an existing vehicle. I can assume that maybe the opportunity was time sensitive, and using pre like procurement processes, three to six months would have taken too long. They have to ask them to come to myself or any other existing contract to try and get the the, the work done sooner. I, I guess the, the hard thing for, for me to understand is how the public gets value out of this, because essentially the government has identified a contractor that can do the work for it, for them, but instead of simply setting up a contract with that, uh, with that company, they're uh, suggesting that they work through your firm, which takes a commission. And so the actual contract ends up costing the Canadian taxpayer more than it would have if they had dealt with them individually. Is that... A cost. That's a fair, that's a no, fair that's characterization. A fair, that's, a fair, that's, a, that's a fair characterization. And again, until the processes, which have been in place since 2003, change where the government can be a little more nimble and execute on directed contracts quicker, it's going to continue to happen. There's, there's, it's, it's very frequent and commonplace where if an RFP for, if there is a solution that's needed quickly, then it's always the point of least resistance is to use an existing contract versus doing a new RFP. So there's a but, situation set up whereby you have this existing contract that's somewhat nebulous and can, can act as a container for a wide variety of services that the government goes out and identifies and then funnels them through your existing contracting framework. And then you would, take a commission would, off the top of that. And That would not be my contracts because my contracts were very specific to pandemic response. So you couldn't have just used that as a generalized bucket. Those are the large contracts you hear which are called omnibuses which have 30 or 40 different categories on place. And that those ones would be the, the catch-alls for, for the majority of the projects that go on within a department. Ours are very, very specific. Like, you have to always make sure that the requirement you're bringing up is in, in alignment with the original statement of work that came with those contracts. So if it falls outside of those parameters, I think Mr. McDonald kind of gave testimony to this, you know, they're, they're, Managers who often don't get funding or need funding for projects would put an arrive can twist to it, or they'd put a pandemic twist to what they were doing. This is why, again, the Order of General's report is inaccurate because, as she attested to in her report, there's actually you, you can't get a true cost for arrive can because there could be other projects or other resources associated with that cost. All right. So, is anybody confused? <laughs> I'm not, so that's the good thing in this. Um, and uh, I'm going to break it down for you guys. So what he's saying, what, what Backrack is saying is, listen, um, you're saying, Firth, that what you do is you go and find resources and you bring them to the government. And for that, you're taking a 20-30% cutoff of that. Now, he then says, but we've seen that that's not necessarily the case, that the government is actually finding these people and then bringing them to you. 
and then you're taking the cut. Why don't why doesn't the government just deal directly with these people and then you don't get your cut? And then there's not an extra 20-30% on this contract that the Canadian taxpayer is paying. So to to break this down simply, so let's say Fox and I need a graphic artist. And we find Bob, the graphic artist. And Bob is going to charge us $100 for that. We could either sign a contract directly with Bob for $100, or we could be dumb and say, okay, Bob, hold on a second. We're going to go to the staffing agency over here and say, staffing agency, we need a graphic artist, but we've already found one. And he's going to charge $100 but we would like him to go through you. And then staffing agency says, sure, your contract is gonna be $130, please. And then we say, okay. And then we pay the staffing agency $130, Bob gets 100. That's what's going on here. And it's dumb. It is a, it's fiscally irresponsible of the government to do this. Now, what Firth is trying to say is, oh, this goes on all the time where you'll have managers um, and they need something done. But the problem, this is what he's saying, the problem is, is that you have, you know, Fox and I, we want to do business with Bob the graphic artist, but we need to put out a request for a proposal, which takes three to six months. That's what he's saying. And then, you know, but we're saying, well, we want, we want this done tomorrow. So in order to get that done quickly, you would need to have an existing contract already in place with somebody to get money from. So what he's saying happens is people go to other departments or other vendors that the, the agency has already signed a contract with and said, well, we'll use some of that money. Even though it has nothing to do with what we're trying to do. But what we'll do is we will say it kind of has something to do with that. So that's where he's saying, you know, they'll put an arrive can twist on it, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, arrive can. That's that's fraud, folks. Um, and then these people get paid money. But this goes back to um, back to the other general's point of you have people that are not going through these proper processes, not going through proper competition, and are consistently using these sole source. Uh, loops in the process to skirt around all of these rules. And as a result, the Canadian taxpayer gets screwed. And these staffing firms who do nothing, they just exist, they're the ones that get rich. So it's complete crap. And that's just if you believe what Christian Firth is saying. So, you know, if you only believe what Christian Firth is saying, then the government process is completely broken, which is, guess what? That's exactly what the Auditor General is saying in her report. She's saying a lot more than that, but that's what she's saying. Thank you to Wix Farm with a $5 super chat. It says, not a barn, a stable, and compares that to the chalet versus cottage <laughs> scenario. <laughs> and we have Pandemodium with a $2 super chat. It says, glasses thrown is NP speak for shots fired. Yes. <laughs> So when Cypher gets really angry and you just hear like smash as his glasses. The dude with the $2 super chat says, I think Firth's lawyer is as smart as he is with a clown face. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a fair assessment. Maybe his, <laughs> maybe his lawyer, his name is Francois Philippe Champagne. Could be. <laughs> and then we have Ravi Sadies with the $2 super chat. Thank you. It says, uh, that still sounds like fraud. Yeah, that's yeah that is still saying. fraud. Yeah. yeah. Dave Thompson with a six ninety nine super chat. It says, is his lawyer really a lawyer? By his answers, I think he should reconsider his choice of... Lawyers! <laughs> then again, maybe not. And Mary Ross with a $5 super chat says, I work with the customers so the engineers don't have to. Office space quote. Gotta love that. <laughs> Amazing. Hold on. What would you say you do here? <laughs> And Pandemonium with a $5 super chat. It says, wait, the sounds, or sorry, wait, that sounds like the Al Capone version of accounting and tax filing. It sure does. And that's how they caught him. Does that make sense? Isn't that a problem, though? If the government, if the government uh, auditor can't trace the money to establish whether 
the Canadian taxpayer got value for that money. Uh, and there's no transparency on which projects are actually uh, being paid for under different contracts. Isn't that a problem? Like, it seems like that's one of the core problems that the Auditor General has highlighted in, in her report. Yes, that is a problem. Okay. Um, how many projects have you worked directly with Mr. McDonald on over the years? I have had three, three contracts with Mr. the COVID pandemic response contracts. And how long have you known him? I think this was the subject of previous testimony, but just to refresh our memory. I think around 2010 was when we first met. And you've had three contracts since that time? Yep. How many times has Cordex and Dalian been a subcontractor on your contracts, or have you subcontracted to them? They have never subcontracted through my contracts. And I think through Dalian and Cordex, it would be a handful of times. I don't have the, the exact number. So that's interesting. That calls Colin Wood's testimony into question because going way back to when they had Dalian and Cordex in with Colin Wood and Mr. David Yao, who is revealed to be a public servant working for the Department of National Defense, double dipping and has been suspended as such. Um, he'd said that this was the only time that, uh, that they'd worked with GC Strategies, if memory serves. So that's interesting. Thank you to Troy Boy Bojarski with a $2 super chat. Thank you very much. And we have Listless Receptionist with a $5 super chat. Here's some money for, ha sorry, I really can't read tonight, guys. <laughs> Here's some money for Cypher's Hakeem Optimal Optical Fund that he will no doubt need after tonight. Sounds like I need it too. I think I need an upgrade on my prescription. Yeah, if, <laughs> if, if we ever got a sponsor, which we don't plan on getting sponsors, maybe we need some sort of somebody like to pay for my eyeglasses. Or Hakeem <laughs> Optical or something because like I that. cannot read tonight. <laughs> or maybe just Canadian Tire to give us safety glasses to throw around. Fewer than ten, more than five. Fewer than ten. Fewer than ten. More, more than, five. than five. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Backrack. We now have uh, uh, Mrs. Block for five, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to circle back to some of the questions that my colleague was asking in regards to who from the government would have contacted you for, for these contracts. And I know you provided us with a name for a contract, and you stated that it was Angela Durgan from PSPC who had signed off on an email. I think that was in regards to the first contract that you had received. But um, in fact, you received four contracts for Arrive Can, three which were non-competitive and one that was supposed to be competitive. So I'm going to ask if you could provide us with the names of those contacts on those contracts. So and, and again, thank you for the question, but they were never Arrive Can contracts. They were all pandemic response contracts and arrive can was not solely used on just one contract alone it was used across two of them so they're pandemic response ones as opposed to four arrive can contracts okay well i i do understand that the national security um exemption was put in place during the pandemic and so can you provide us with the names of the contacts from the government uh when you were awarded the four contracts so Angela Durgan was three of them. And I don't have the ladies first, the full name for the fourth one, but I'm more than happy to share that with you after this. I would appreciate that because this information was requested from you last October and you um, agreed, promised to undertake to provide those names for us and you didn't. So I'm, so, I'm a little sorry, bit leery provide, about no, that. No, I did provide. I did provide those names as part of our evidence package. I gave all three emails that were the contract awards um, and all three of them showed Angela Durgan. The, the reason why the fourth one wasn't provided because that was only asked for the COVID contracts, not for us, uh, not for the, the fourth one. Oh, that's not going to go over well. <laughs> well, this, you didn't ask for the uh, chalet, you asked for the cottage. Oh, no. Didn't he admit that was a lie at the beginning, like right after he was sworn in? Yeah, but she's saying, you know, you didn't provide all the information on all these contracts. He's like, well, you only asked specifically for these, so that's all, all I have provided. Oh, no, buddy. Jeez. 
Um, <laughs> Trish Pearl with a five dollar super chat. I wonder how much in taxpayer money would be saved if the government would save if they had their own hiring staff for project. Yes, Trish, one hundred percent. Like twenty million dollars on this project well, alone. Well, think about it. Twenty to thirty percent on every single professional services contract. That adds up to a ton of money. Now, I, I believe the government has spent, what, something in the neighborhood, like 30, 40 billion, something like that. I, I, I'm probably going to be wrong there. but So think about that. Around $10 billion would be saved. Well, and the government already has a procurement arm. It's PSPC, right? Right. So why do they not just, if they have to, hire a few extra public servants? Like, maybe you'd need a dozen more. And, and there you go. There's your procurement department. And if the argument is, well, you know, but there's people out there that, you know, they have the content. Okay, so go and poach some people from these agencies and bring them in. Right. If you need, like, somebody who specializes in IT, if you need somebody who's bilingual, if yeah, you it's need not this hard. or that. Yeah. It's not hard. Go get them, you silly, silly people. Okay, so we're, but, we're but going to make it. was provided. So we're going to make a distinction in regards to your contracts as to whether it was the pandemic, COVID, or a Rive can. I got that. So you will national provide... National security exemption. Yes, national security exemption. Absolutely. So... <laughs> Kelly's so sweet. That was, that was her way of saying, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I don't think... Uh, I know Christian Firth was not swift enough to actually pick up on that. She's like, okay, so we're going to make a distinction between, uh, again, chalet versus cottage, but now we're talking about contracts, you stupid person. Uh, Peter G with a $2 super chat. I am awarding him a silver shovel. Uh, yeah, he may need a platinum one by the time we get to the end of this. You have agreed to provide us with the name of the other individual that you were in, contra in contact with. Yes, I will. Thank you very much. The Auditor General, and, and I understand that uh, you've testified here today that uh, in her report her. she didn't provide accurate information, but she found that GC Strategies was involved in the development of a contract from the Government of Canada to your firm valued at $25 million that you received in May of 2022. Who did you communicate with from the Government of Canada while you were helping to um, create that criteria. And this is the question that we all wanted to hear, and I'm sure we're going to hear it multiple times. But this relates to the collusion that was identified in the Auditor General's report when she was saying that it looks like GC Strategies colluded with somebody in the government to create the requirements for the contract that GC Strategies would subsequently bid on and that it was found that it was only GC strategies that would have been able to actually be successful in winning this contract. Yeah, so that would be like me helping a potential employer um, like create a contract that describes me and my skill set absolutely perfectly, and then I'm the only one who can apply. Right, right. That's called collusion. Uh, Richard Weave with a $7 super chat. Justin comes to Alberta to lecture Albertans about the carbon tax and spouts about his dental plan. If you are a senior, you must be 72 to get it. There you go. That's what happens when you vote NDP and Liberal. Um, so, so first of all, like, you know, the committee has subpoenaed me here to speak on behalf of things that I can talk about. Um, also, my understanding is these allegations have been moved to the RCMP. And in fear of interfering with those, uh, those, the RCMP investigation, I don't think I can comment on that right now. So uh, it's my understanding from testimony just a few minutes ago that you have been contacted by the RCMP. Um, you're not under investigation right now, but you know what the RCMP is investigating? <laughs> well played, Miss Block. Well played. So, you know... <laughs> You can't pick and choose here, Mr. Firth, and that's what you're trying to do, right? Oh, that's a hard question. So, uh, yeah, I don't think I can talk about that. Well, here's the thing. The entire... You don't get a choice. <laughs> well, but the entire Auditor General's report has been turned over to the RCMP. And so if that's the case, why were you commenting on what was in the Auditor General's report before? You can't pick and choose about that. Well played, Miss Block. Great, great rebuttal. Um, because well, you're going to get caught. My lady loves cats with a $2 super chat. 
This one's for me. It says, Fox, <laughs> take Cypher's glasses away now. All right, hand them over. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> you better not. I have a, I have empty water bottles here that I can throw. There you go. That? Okay. So thank you for the warning, Milady Loves Cats. It is very appreciated. I, I, I have the same information as everybody else. I have the what I'm watching on testimony. I'm seeing what uh, committee members are putting on Twitter. Um, so I'm assuming all of the... Uh, ESBC's testimony said they, the, all the findings from the Auditor General's report has been sent through there. So again, with that being a broad stroke and with actually not getting disclosure like we asked for, uh, prior to being here, understanding what those documents and that information was, I just it's, it's, I cannot comment right now on, on that information. You're not going to let us know who it was you were meeting with as you were constructing a contract that you knew you would end up getting. Yeah, that's your words, not mine. Um, I'm just saying right now, I, as a result of this being pushed to RCMP, with all efforts of the committee behind it, unfortunately, I cannot comment on an ongoing RCMP investigation. Okay, well, um, I guess what I would ask is, is this um, commonplace? We'll, we'll get away from the actual contract in question, but is this commonplace for... IT firms for consulting firms to sit at the table and help determine the criteria for a contract that they are going to actually be bidding on. Good pivot. Very good pivot, Miss Block. Say, all right, fine, you're not gonna answer that. But uh let's 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 get away from that and just say you've because he's talked about industry practices before. That's kind of what he's saying. Oh, well, you know, that that's just how it, how it works. That's how it works. Okay. Part of how it works. Do you sit there and collude with the people that you're about to, you know, get, be awarded a contract on and actually how to write that contract so only you can win that contract? So that was a really good pivot uh, from Kelly Block. He's probably going to try and weasel his way out of it, but we'll see what happens. Vesper Digital with a $5 super chat. Mindone, 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 Mindone is the delta of all of this. Why is he... Uh, not brought in at the same time with Firth. That would be epic. Uh, Rainbow. <laughs> yeah, I think he's also off on uh, he's uh, off distress, on leave. distress leave. He's off on Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, just like the rest of them. Mm -hmm. It's very stressful when you get caught. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what if I can comment on that. Uh, I can't comment on what everybody... I don't do that, personally. I can't comment on what every other of the 635 other firms do. But you did before. You said it's standard practice for for all the other six hundred and thirty five firms to you know to to author resumes and to you know like. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's possible when it suits him, and it's impossible when it suits him otherwise. Yeah. yeah. This is this is why the glasses warning was uh, was was raised. Thank you very much for that, and thank you for the Ravi Sadies for a five dollars super chat. That sounded a lot like a I plead the fifth, Your Honor. Yeah, it sounded a lot like that. Point of order, Chair. Um, yes, go ahead, sir. Point of order. Um, the witness is refusing to answer questions under the auspices of uh, a hypothetical, according to him. And um, he is required to answer the questions put to him by this committee, uh, unless I'm mistaken. And, and if I am mistaken, I just ask for you to uh, uh, to to correct my understanding, but the witness is, is required to provide this information and his lawyer would be able to tell him that it wouldn't prejudice a police investigation. Oh. It's a fair point. We do require witnesses to answer questions. Um, actually from looking at the item from swearing of witnesses, witnesses refuses, okay. Refusal to answer questions of failure to reply truthfully may give rise to a charge of contempt in the House. Uh, we will get to the next um, intervention, which is Ms. Atwin, and then we will have a chance with Mr. Deltel, but we will be having a break after the next round that perhaps uh, Mr. Firth can uh, confer with uh, his lawyer and we can get back to this issue. <laughs> well played. Well played, Mr. McCauley. That was a very polite way of shooting a warning shot across the bow. So, 
what that was was you know he's reading from the oath okay so yeah so if they refuse to answer or if they you know are not truthful okay yeah you know, so they could be in, held in contempt yeah you may want to chat with your lawyer about that mr firth you may want to chat with him about it because if that is the case if what mr barrett is saying is true then he that is that is grounds for contempt of parliament so, yeah, are, are you a little bit more stressed now, Mr. Firth? Because <laughs> you should be. Um, Pandemonium with a $10 super chat. Bring everyone in as witnesses. Give them those big foam fingers you see at ball games, and let the finger pot make it <laughs> serious entertainment value for tax dollars. True story, though. You can go and witness committee meetings as long as they're open to the public. Um, if there's one you're interested in attending, you can contact your MP, and they'll get you on the guest list. I guess I, I don't know what you'd call it, but they'll get you into Parliament. In the future, if you ever see somebody sitting in there with one of those foam fingers. You know it's me. Um, Vesper Digital with a $10 super chat. I swear the way the government contracts at this point feel like a game of Plinko from the prices, right? It has to go through like 200 steps. And you're not wrong, unfortunately, Vesper. And we have Mighty Mouse with a $2 super chat. <laughs> WTF, both F words in the sentence in terms of uh, funds and, uh, well, and, and the other the one. And the unparliamentary one, yeah. <laughs> WTF. There you go. Pierre said it for you. Okay, um, let's go to the child on the Liberals. Ms. Houghton, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Firth, for being here. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of bounce all over the place, uh, so forgive me. But I, I'd like to start with, um, there was a question around Cordell. Um, and I just need a bit of clarification. So in relation to Cordell, you stated that you bought the company in 2015. And who did you buy it from? Um, Chris Jurowitz, I think, was the gentleman that owned the company. Okay. Um, because of, according to my notes, I had um, that Mr. Anthony and yourself, as well as Mr. White, were all listed as, as on the Corporate Info website. Um, so was this company not registered prior to 2015? It was, so that was, it was doing, I was operating doing other government contracts, but myself, Mr. Anthony, our other business partner, when we were a three-person team, uh, we were the ones that... Uh, purchased it in 2015. And then we subsequently after that, we applied to CRA and you applied to PSBC to do an official name change so we can put our own brand to it. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned that you've been, you know, working within contracting with the federal government since 2007. And would that be under your name in, as an individual or another Veritech. company's name? Or if we were to search that information, what, what would we be searching? Uh, I used to work for a company called Veritech, which has recently been purchased by, well, not recently, but it's been purchased by Experis Manpower. I was okay. solely with those guys since 2007 until okay. 2015. And it was all IT related work with the government? That's exactly what we do right now. Man, I want them to ask, did you ever work with Colin Wood at Veritech? Did you ever work? Uh, and I hope they ask Darren Anthony tomorrow. Conservatives, if you are watching, which you're probably not, but if you are, ask Darren Anthony if he's worked with Colin Wood or anybody else at Cordex Dalian before? That's a great question because the answer is going to be yes. Yes, they did. Darren Anthony worked with them both at um, IT4 Consulting and Veritech. So very, very key in terms of these relationships. Yep. Okay. Um... So I, I did want to address, I mean, in your opening comments, you mentioned um, some of the ways this is impacting you uh, personally, as well as your family and your children. Um, and there's, there's certainly, that should never happen. And I'm, I'm, I apologize um, for what's happening you know, as far as your personal life. Um, and I, I'm not surprised, um, sadly, because of the, the rhetoric that's been used around this issue. We hear a lot of it in, in the House as well. Um, and even as liberal members of this, this committee, it, a lot of it's actually directed at us as well. Oh, my um, goodness. So I, I'd really like to clear up some of the things that we're hearing. Um, things like, you know, liberal insiders got rich. Um, so I'd like to ask you, do you have any personal connections to the, to the prime minister, to our cabinet ministers, to any of us as liberal members of this committee? No, I do not. Okay. Um, the other big thing is the way it's characterized is that you know, GC Strategies was a, a two-man operation in a, in a basement that basically had, um, according to the Auditor General, $19 million. Um, essentially, it seems that it's being portrayed like, you know, cash was dumped on your lap in this, in this amount of money. 
Um, and so really that money flows through your contractors, your subcontractors, and you mentioned the amount that you would have received personally. Um, but I do have a question about the commission piece. So it's, it's cited often as 15 to 30% commission. Can you account for this fluctuation? Is that a common yeah. thing? Yeah, like, so it, it all depends on, it can be, I'll, I'll dumb it down and make it as boring as possible. Um, how it typically works is you get a agreed rate to the client, let's say $1,500 a day for your services. It's then on us once that contract's been awarded to try and find that resource. And at that point you negotiate their rate. So if their rate's a thousand bucks, you've now made 25%. If their rate is $1,200, you've now made X percent. So it all depends on what negotiations are between what the crown, what the rate is to the crown and what the person you found is. That, that delta in between is the margin. Okay, great, that's very helpful. Um, so you, you have addressed a little bit about the Auditor General's report, um, and it was, it was good to know that you had been approached um, for comment around some of the numbers that um, she was sharing. Were you approached by the procurement ombud um, prior to him writing his report? No, I was not. Okay, um, and do you feel that your, your input um, with the Auditor General was reflected? Um, no, we, 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 we commented on two parts and uh, they were not included or really our thoughts were considered. Well, that's because you're a proven liar. Why are you surprised at this? Like, again, if you're willing to lie about the small things, how can you be trusted with the big things? Like, you're not a victim here. And, and, and poor Atwin... <laughs> like oh well politics is hard uh-huh yeah I'm, I'm sure it's hard when you completely break a country and the entire country is pissed at you but i'm getting hate mail yeah well then go and home it, and it's probably just like i don't appreciate you doing this why did you do that why did you vote this way why did you do that well but even if it is stronger than that go home then don't be an mp guess what there's going to be people that are mad at you there's going to be people that are that will love you do a good job and you'll get less hate mail. That's as simple as that. And, you know, and the fact that Atwin is trying to say, well, what, did the ombuds approach you? Well, no, I was not approached. <clears throat> um, there's a reason for that, ladies and gentlemen, because the ombuds didn't look outside of the government. The ombuds job is to look internally. They looked at the internal processes within the government. That's what the procurement ombuds, uh, ombuds office does. They don't talk to external vendors. Like it, it, even if like it doesn't matter what GC strategies did. That you know they could have been you know a, a completely, uh, completely reliable and trustworthy in this whole process, and the ombudsman still wouldn't have talked to them, because his scope is only within the federal government. He can't go beyond that, so therefore there is no talking to anybody else. And he clarified as much when he was questioned at committee. So that that throws that into the trash. But, you know, the, the, the liberals are trying to make this seem like, oh, well, the big bad conservatives, you know, and their, and their words. And their henchmen, they're all sending us hate mail. Right. You know, uh, they're the ones that, 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 well, guess what? When, when you waste ta taxpayer money, this is what happens. Well, and again, we always say don't send the MPs hate mail. Don't send anybody hate mail for that matter. But don't send the MPs hate mail. If you want to tell them something, then tell them, I think you're doing a bad job in regards to whatever policy. I think you voted the wrong way when you voted for whatever bill. Um, the more articulate you are, the more they're actually going to listen. If you have somebody who's screaming at you about something, for example, you're not going to listen the, to them as well as if you have somebody who pulls you aside and is like, you did that incorrectly. This is how I want you to do it next time. Now, look with a $2 super chat, new meme from Jim, uh, new meme idea, uh, Jim Carrey from Liar Liar. Go, oh, come on! <laughs> I know the exact one you're talking yeah, about. That's where he water spills everywhere. his water. Yeah, I remember that. <clears throat> and we have uh, let's see 
the chaps jumping around on me. Diane Sylvain with a $10 super chat. If I was in the room tonight, I would be constantly jumping up and yelling, point of order or objection in a courtroom. I am already wanting to jump through my screen to see if I can ask questions. <laughs> well, screens are can be more expensive than glasses, so be careful, uh, Diane. And JD with a $5 super chat. Message retracted. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to tag Barnaby for that. And Justin Brown with a $7 super chat. If somehow he's interested in politics, forget about municipal, but there's always the Chinese vice chairman <laughs> Gbo. <laughs> uh, there you go. And uh, Brent Chapman with a five dollars super chat. This is all about bureaucrats gone wild. The public employees cheered when JT walked into their offices for the first time as PM in 2015. Get it now. And Rabu says with a five dollars super chat. At when wham, my job requires me to do things. How could they? And that's been the criticism against uh, all ministers as well, right? They don't have to do anything. They just collect money and go home. JD with a $10 super chat. The Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias in which people with limited competence in a particular domain overestimate their abilities. This is the liberals and NDP to a T. LJ with a $2 super chat. Feels like we're being abused with all the stupid... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> can't, can't exactly disagree with you and huge ass member for three months i'm pretty sure all these mps consider all criticism to be hate mail yeah i don't disagree with that and uh canadian come uh, i can't see your full name i'm sorry about that um uh, with a ten dollar super chat as a pm uh one i read uh, uh, as a PM1, I routinely called the TA or PA on an existing contract and asked nicely if I could use some of their options. Consultants fee saved. The stories I could tell of shady things I have seen. I uh, I don't I don't disagree with you that you would definitely definitely um, have uh, uh, have have some shady stories. Um, uh, I think there was a member... No, that was before. Okay. Uh, I think we're caught up other than Mr. Brent Chapman. Harper insisted his ministers run their portfolio. Team JT has said in QP, it's not for them to tell the bureaucrats how to do their job. Yes, that is their job. It 100% is their job. Otherwise, we don't need the minister now, do we? This is why one of the biggest ones was the $19.1 million. Because, you know, you'd understand what the uproar is going to be and how it's going to be used against you when you've been citing, like CBSA officials have been citing that the number's closer to 12 million. And again, like, there's, there's lots of reasons why there could be discrepancies. I mean, we understand the financial systems and the codes aren't the best at CBSA. Uh, furthermore, is the, the, the approximation and the valuation that was provided uh, in the AG report was billing up until May 2023, whereas we previously gave numbers from the application build, which finished, in July of 2022. So there's another year's worth of billing there, which may not even be an arrived can. But again, no one knows if it's arrived or not because how things are tagged internally. Well, you would know. Yeah, you should know. You should know exactly what that went to. But nobody knows. It's a mystery. Uh-huh. I get Scooby-Doo on the case. You know, that's another thing we need is the Bender meme where he's going, nobody knows. Yeah, we'd, we, we, we we would wear it out pretty quick. We sure would. Dave Thompson with a $7 super chat. Mr. Firth, don't not pass go. Do not collect $20 million. Go straight to jail. Yeah, we can hope. And Sean with a twenty-seven ninety-nine super chat. Sorry to everybody. I've had a spotty internet in the last two weeks and have uh, been out of town and away from my computer. I lost the pool and the 100 gifted memberships are coming Sunday to show up. Don't like and like and love MP. Sean, don't feel obligated to pay the, to, to buy the 100 uh, gifted memberships. That's a lot of money. Don't worry about that. <laughs> we're not holding to you. No, we're not. You're not going to hold your feet to so the fire. So please don't worry about it. Only that. if you want to. So thank you. Um, cool man 0893 with a $5 super chat. Chat. Is that a landscape portrait of a chalet in first background? And I, let, let, let me add a second part. Or are you just happy to see me? Um, okay. Um, and to the extent you're aware, can you describe how the government may have tracked your performance on arrived can contracts? What? Um, there's quarterly reviews, quarterly reports we have to send in the PSPC, which shows uh, burn rates, which essentially means um, how much what, how much the resource is burning. Uh, let's say a task authorization starts at two hundred thousand dollars. You know, each month you have to say how much that resource has used up against that. So, not really from a performance. That's more done, like I said, performance is done by an employee. But we track the finances typically with the with PSPC to understand is a task authorization running out, is a contract running out, is there time to do renewals. So that's the extent of 
how we're monitored from the government organization. Everything else, like project management, budget, and everything, is taken care of by them. Thank okay. you very much. Um, that is oh, our time, okay. I'm afraid. Uh, Mrs. Vignola for two and a half, please. Merci. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Mr. Firth, earlier when we were talking about COVID alert, you stated that uh, a government official reached out to you from Shared Services, Digital Services uh, Canada, who had heard about you. Did that government official tell you who referred him or her to you? No, he did not. It was more a case of we understand the work you're doing on a right hand, and that's kind of how the introduction started. Okay. Parce que... I see. Basically, COVID alert was being supervised by PHEC, the Public Health Agency of Canada, someone you know well and someone you had dealings with regarding COVID alert was transferred to that department who won a position in a competition and that is why I asked the question about the referral. Thank you very much. Now, you also stated that the mistakes on the part of the Auditor General may have been due to the codes that CBSA uses that are not always so clear. In your opinion, when it comes to procurement and contracting, do they need to tidy up their house at the CBSA in order to clarify what those codes are, such that the transparent government, quote unquote, is truly transparent, and such that data is much more clear in the eyes of the public and also for poli the politicians uh, sitting around this table. Well, that would be actually a horrendous thing for them to clean that up because then they wouldn't get these miscellaneous contracts and they'd actually have to bid on them. That would be a big problem then, wouldn't it? So before we go any further, we have a couple of super chats to get to. Jarsha with a $2 super chat. Thank you very much. You need to add Picard doing the double face palm, <laughs> or maybe I'll get the audience face palm. We'll see. And uh, Leo Orchard with a $5 super chat. You missed it. He just said in his best interest uh, to forge resumes. I don't think. Uh, Did we both miss that? Maybe. That's interesting. Huh, that slipped right by. Uh, hmm, I don't think he, he would have said forge resumes, though. And Vesper Digital, if upset with your liberal NDP MPs, uh, you should say what Elon uh, told Bob Iger in your communication. <laughs> Go truck yourself. <laughs> I kid, I kid, I kid. In a sec, we really need to do that. Don't... Therefore, you have no particular input on this topic, even though you received and you stated this yourself, well, you would, had to deal with the adverse effects and ramifications of the, due to the fact that the codes are not clear enough, as you stated yourself. Yeah, so I don't have access to the codes. All I have access to is the reporting and the numbers that are completely contradictory to what I have. Again, I have the luxury of speaking to every one of the 100 consultants we put through during the pandemic to get a true understanding of their level of effort for what they were working on and what they were doing. So if you're coming in as, a, as an order general, you would not have access to the detail that I currently have, but you'd have access to you know, calculating task authorizations. And the truth being there as well, that not all task authorizations are fully utilized. So you may see one for $200,000, but only 120 was actually used on that task authorization. So this is again where these inflated numbers can come from, because there's just not the, the financial system in place that can do real time health checks. Thank you very much, Mr. Backrack. Go ahead, please, sir. Interesting. Well, before we get to Mr. Backrack, we have Nancy Ravoy with a thirteen ninety nine super chat. Uh, Learning perspective has honestly brought not only my family but coworkers over to the right side of Canadian history. Thank you. I have felt so alone uh, for far too long. Well, thank you very much for that. Yeah, we're glad that uh, that we could help. 
And uh, remember, we're not bringing everybody to uh, to the right. What we are bringing everybody to is the truth. And if the truth um, leads you towards the conservatives, which right now they seem to be the only party that's talking common sense, then that's a good thing, right? So uh, that's all we can ask, and that's all we try to do. Daniel with a $7 super chat. Sergeant Scholl's name. I see nothing. I know nothing. Sergeant Scholl's meme. There you go. Oh, yeah. meme. I'm not familiar with that one, so I think you might have to find it. Oh, that'll be easy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 2019, and this is pre-COVID, this I believe was in reference to uh, a chatbot product that Botler uh, had developed. And there's some communication between Mr. McDonald and yourself. And, and I'll go back to your previous comments from the last round where you said that the reason that the government might uh, direct contractors to work through your standing contract with the government is because it's faster and more efficient than uh, going through a procurement process, which could take several months. That's a fair characterization. I see you sort of nodding. Is that fair, Mr. Firth? Yeah, not just mine, or any existing right. contract. So th here's a communique uh, from Mr. McDonald, November 18th, 2019. And this is an email to you. And he says, uh, look, Christian, I can't solicit this as a government department. And I know, and I'll, you know, I think there's an opportunity for you, GC Strategies, to partner with these guys, he means Bottler, and knowing what you can do in this town, I think you can turn this into an enterprise product. What did Mr. McDonald mean by, I can't solicit this as a government department? It sounds like it doesn't have to do with efficiency. It sounds like it has to do with working around some kind of rules that are in place to prevent him from going out there and handpicking contractors. Uh, um you know, thank you for the question. And the, the truth is, I, I can't comment on what Mr. McDonald was writing or why he was writing those things. Um, I, I'm sorry, at that point, I'm, I was not writing on behalf of Mr. McDonald, so I can't attest to what he meant by that. This is definitely a lawyer coach to answer. Um, because he, and he's right, he is right. He cannot put himself into the mind of another to comment on why he wrote that. It's it's kind of a trap question to get him to try and implicate Mr. McDonald in, in some way, shape, or form, and also impeach his own testimony, thereby um, complicating his relationship with committee. Let's just say that. Um, so, uh, so that was the appropriate answer he should have legally given to protect himself. I guess what it looks like to someone from on the outside is it looks like Mr. McDonald is doing your bidding and trying to set you up for turning this into an enterprise product. I assume because you would be able to uh, charge a substantial commission if if um, if the product that Butler had developed became an enterprise product. Like, do you agree that this is a, a wholly inappropriate role for someone high up in CBSA to be playing? Then I, I, I can't speculate on what the intentions were with that email. I mean, everybody can interpret it how they want. I just can't speculate, and I don't really know the intent behind that email. I, I find that difficult to believe, Mr. Firth. Like, oh, if I you mean, look... it's it's the it's the truth. Like, I cannot. I I was not in Mr. McDonald's brain when he was writing that. I, I I can't I can't make assumptions on what the intentions were for that email. Thanks. I just I'm assuming. Yeah, that is our time. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Backrack. Mr. Deltel, please go ahead for five minutes. Interesting. Um, he he actually did kind of slip up there when he said, I don't know what Mr. McDonald meant by that email. And that's where Backrack said, I find that difficult to believe. So he actually, he used the wrong words. He was doing fine when he said, I can't comment on what Mr. McDonald may have meant. But when you say, I don't know what he meant, that's a different statement entirely. He might be able to, he might, he might get in trouble for that later on. Uh, if they actually proved via another email that he knew what he meant. Uh, Daniel with a 279 super chat from Hogan's Heroes. I, oh, oh, great movie. Hogan's Heroes. That's a great, great, uh, uh, and Kelly's Heroes is another good one. Um, 
You missed the other half of it. It says, from Hogan's Heroes, I'm dating myself. Oh, I'm, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, Dandaman966 with a $10 super chat. I saw Charles Souza. Uh, I saw Charles Souza in just uh, just want to make sure he's on the right path. We're, we're talking about a Rive Kid, right? Uh, uh, LOL, you guys are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you have me and my girlfriend and now her mom watching your channel. Thank you both. Awesome. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Great. You know, there was one uh, pre-stream... Uh, comment that uh, that actually made me chuckle quite a bit and it was from Tim Hat who's a member and he says how does Northern Perspective how has Northern Perspective gotten me excited about a government committee meeting like it was a major sporting event how <laughs> <laughs> I don't know <laughs> it's just... a social event that's how it is a social event so if we could have a stadium and you know put all this on a jumbotron I think we would but you know who knows a channel can dream and uh, Deltel, I'm actually very interested to see how he does. I have not seen him in committee yet. Uh, for those who don't know, Deltel is a um, is a conservative uh, MP from Quebec, and he's the guy that he's very animated when he's getting upset in question period fox is going to know exactly who he is as soon as he comes on the screen no i already know who he is because we wrote him a letter he's the uh, shadow minister for the environment right he would take over for uh, for jibo so um so i'm i'm interested to see how he does uh it'll all be in french just like vignola so just uh, be prepared and leo orchard with a five dollar super chat the government set price based on mean price of bids you win contract forge resumes keep the balance yeah pretty much Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Now, obviously, we want to get to the bottom of what is the worst uh, financial scandal of the history of the Government of Canada. This is a contract on, that was supposed to start at about $80,000, ended up in an orgy of spending of over $60 million, <laughs> which is over 750 times more expensive than what was expected. This is not right. Canadians need to understand why there was this boondoggle that they're still paying for to date. We know that GC Strategies was threatened uh, by, uh, by, with arrest uh, regarding testifying here, uh, uh, which attests the fact that uh, there was no confidence in the fact that you may have refused to testify before this committee, but I'm afraid you have an obligation to do so. Mr Chairperson, this is not the first time that Mr Firth is testifying. There were two previous testimonies. First, regarding the testimony, your previous testimony, did you lie, yes or no, in your previous evidence? Okay, so Dotel doesn't mess around. No. <laughs> Not at all. And and to the point we've made before, like he was even, he was pulling out the anger in the tone as well uh, of Dotel. So it's like fantastic interpreter. Just. Can you say orgy in a parliamentary committee? He just did. <laughs> there was an orgy of spending. Is that parliamentary language? <laughs> well, there's no point of order raised by the liberals, so. <laughs> I guess as long as you're talking finances, orgies are fine. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? What? I was at some, some feedback on my on my microphone. Avez-vous mat? Did you lie in your two previous appearances before this committee? Yes or no? For two, can I made a mistake with a with a uh, cottage and a chalet last time I was here. Okay. And again, it's not a, it's not a lie. I mean, the actual irony the irony is that uh, it was referred to as a cabin. And puis l'hospitalité avec le whisky, so. And what of the whiskey and the hospitality involved? <laughs> like, Janice is sitting there, just like, I'm gonna roast you. He's like this guy, man. <laughs> like, like, come on, oh come on! Yeah, I definitely need that Jim Carrey one. Yeah, Perry you do. One. Yeah. Glenn Stewart with a $5 super chat. I saw nothing. I hear nothing. I know nothing. I will do nothing. It would be a good model for the liberals. Uh, well, you know, you are what you do. And uh, Panda Money with a $2 super chat. Del Tell causing... <laughs> Emotional damage! <laughs> and we also have a $5 super chat from Leo Orchid. Or Orchard, pardon me. It says the government set price based on mean price of bids. You win contract, forge resumes, keep the balance. Yeah. 
And Captain Canada with a uh, member comment for three months. Cypher and Fox, you two were the absolute best. And Cypher's impression of, of Champagne, a.k.a. Kermit <laughs> the Frog, is just too good. Gets me every time. <laughs> You're welcome! And Trish Pearl with a $2 super chat. No foreplay in his questioning. LOL. That's a good one, Trish. Well played. Yeah, I mean, there's been previous testimony where there was whiskey tasting, and I think it was mentioned that uh, that was put out to government officials, and it was also put out to contractors, and those government officials have since said that they got permission from their superiors and paid their way. Wait a minute. What? Dude, you said you never met with officials outside of government buildings. Um, what are you talking about? There, there was testimony. You're, you're trying to pass this off like, oh, this is fine. Delta's going to eat you alive. Now, the contract as it was awarded, is it, it's the contract that you executed. At what point did you realize that $80,000 was insufficient and that things were starting to cost a lot? At $1 million, $2 million, $3 million? At what point did you clue into the fact that uh, this was going to go through the roof and it was going to become exceedingly expensive? So again, thank you for the question. Like that, that's not my determination. My the first contract award was for two point three five million dollars. That was the one that was the the first COVID contract. Subsequently, there there were amendments that were made. You have to bear in mind. I think testimony mentioned that national security exemptions only were to last for three months. So there had to be a decision made by the government to either put a larger number and keep doing amendments versus keep going back and retendering and redo it, which is in a fast process, we know that, to retender and restructure a contract every three months. My understanding was it did jump, the, the one contract we're uh, talking about, that went from 2.35 and it went to 13.9. But my understanding was every time there was an amendment, it was published on buy and sell, which has 635 other companies can challenge. And it was also put in front of the house and MPs voted in the house every single time there was an amendment so it wasn't it wasn't like i knew but everybody knew that they, they were, the prices were raising who monitored the quality of the work that you were doing overnight you can't just go from eighty thousand dollars to sixty million dollars without some someone sounding the alarm bells and saying something is awry who monitored the quality of your work and it's a good line of questioning by Del Tell because what he's trying to to essentially say is, listen, um, you would have negotiated a contract. You would have set the price and said, this is how much it's going to cost to do what you want. And then the government says, OK, that's fine. But what he what Del Tell is saying is, listen, at some point this ballooned. So. How can you explain that? When did you say, oh, well, you know, this is actually going to cost more than than it was initially estimated? And that's a very, very reasonable question. And Firth is basically trying to say, oh, it's not my fault. It's the MPs in the House. Um, no, it's not. I Like, you can blame a lot on the Liberals. This is not on the Liberals. This piece of this, where all of a sudden, a Rive can is costing a heck of a lot more than the initial contract that was agreed upon, actually talks about so the first point of communication has to come from hmm, uh, the vendor when they're like oh well i guess we're not doing as much as we thought we would so we're going to need more money government that's your decision and then the government makes a decision based on that statement whether to say hmm okay well i guess we're going to make an amendment to the contract or they say screw you guys we're going home and we're going to contract this out to somebody else because you guys don't know how to manage your shit. Your stuff. Parliamentary language. Yeah, parliamentary language, Cypher. Point of order. <laughs> so, you know, this is... Uh, it, it's, it's a good line of questioning from Del Tell. Jerry Savoy with a $2 super chat. Uh, Genesis is going to roast Firth on the barbecue. Uh, hopefully he seasons him first. I don't think it would taste very good. No, he doesn't really have a lot of meat on his bones, does he? We'd have four or five government officials that was monitoring the quality of our work. Where, you know, we we were not. There were other prices associated to just arrive can and the application build that we're not privy to. So we were not part of the 19.1 or the 11 million to the 60. We were from the zero to the 11 or 19.1, depending on what you which which article you want to read. 
comprend là, que quand arrive la COVID, il y a des actes. Now, when COVID struck, of course, there were going to be exceptions. Everyone understands that. But there's a distinction to be made between being very active and uh, inflating the bill to the tune of 700 times larger exponentially. That's what Canadians wanted to get the bottom of. When did you realise that this was a phenomenal cost overrun and yet it was lacking in quality? At what point, please? Um, well, first of all, we, we've submitted over 1,500 invoices monthly. So, again, I want to get the illusion of everybody's thinking right now. We were never given a cheque for $20 million on day one. We've done 1,500 in monthly approved submitted invoices for the last three years to get to whatever amount you want to listen to, 19.1 or 11. Um, we were not responsible for alerting any alarm bells. We were performing. Uh, we hit... What? Um, you absolutely are responsible for alerting the government that, hey, that initial contract that we signed, that's not going to be enough money. Yeah, that's on you, buddy. Yep. That's on any vendor. Because if you don't, then what the government should have said is, oh, well, that's too bad because you promised to deliver this for $2.5 million. Unless all you all you uh, build to the government was, okay, so there's, there's two different types of contracts that you can issue. One is called a deliverable-based contract. Well, there, you know what? I'm, simplifi I'm, I'm simplifying this. Uh, there's many different types, but these are the main two. There's a deliverables-based contract, which is you build a ride can for $2.5 million. It doesn't matter how long it takes them. It doesn't matter how many resources GC Strategies has to bring in. They have to build it, and it's only going to cost a maximum of $2.5 million. The other typical contract that is used is called a time and materials. Now, this... This is a term that is, has, is brought into IT and other kind of virtual types of contracts, despite the fact there, there are no quote unquote materials. But what it basically means is that you are paying on an hourly basis. You're paying for a block of hours for people. So this sounds like what a can actually was. They're paying, they bought $2.5 million of hours of IT profession. Okay. So... Now, what that would mean is I would expect the initial conversation should be with GC Strategies. Hey, this, these are our requirements. How much do you think this is going to cost to build in time and materials? Well, it's probably going to cost $2.5 million. Okay, sign that. Off it goes. When that is approaching $2.5 million, Mr. Firth here should know, hey, that's not going to cut it. And he's the one that's saying, well, we submitted 1,500 invoices. Well, then you should know based on your 1,500 invoices that this was approaching $2.5 million and that wasn't going to cut it. Meaning you should have picked up the phone, called the government and said, hey, this is going to cost more than $2.5 million. So that's the question you were asked. When did you notify them that this was going to cost a lot more? And you keep saying, I wasn't responsible for that. And you're saying that everything in the media is a lie, that you guys were just two guys that use LinkedIn to find some resources and then sat on your asses and did nothing but collect money. Well, you yourself are saying that you had no oversight over the, 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 the people that you were actually providing to the government of Canada. You had no responsibility to, to track the budget. You had no responsibility to track the uh, consumed hours of this contract and you had no responsibility to notify anyone of anything at any time. Go first yourself. Um, Casper H with a fifty dollars super chat. I gotta go. Uh, uh, I gotta. I gotta go. Watch later. Keep up the good work, Cypher and Fox. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you, Casper. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also, Leo Goddess with a six ninety nine super chat. It says, "Didn't the accountant union president say several accountants noticed but were scared to come forward because they feared retaliation?" Uh, that was allegedly in the testimony, yes. So, hmm, you got to wonder. Got to wonder. The 171 releases of the application on time, every time public health agency changed the policy, we'd have to amend the, the, uh, the, the application. And that there in itself, the fact that we were hitting all of our targets meant that we were doing a good job, but we also don't control what the budget is. That's, that's out of our realm. Vous faisiez, ouais, vous that is... Votre propos. I, I, our time. Mr. Shawari, go ahead, please. Oh, no. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Mr. Fertz, uh, I'd like to focus on three areas, and I only have five minutes. Number one. I'm going to skip Jawari because he is 
useless if uh, um, speak now if there's anything of value here but I'm pretty sure that there's not because there never is in any of Jawari's questions there used to be earlier on but he is just he's tapped out yeah yeah into absurdity and I think he's had a talking to by Sousa and like what are you doing to me man so I'm just going to uh And uh, go for it. In the meantime, we'll say thank you to Ruthless Mindset with a $10 super chat. It says, on a serious question, Firth looks up. Lawyer is pacing behind the cam and directing if or which way to answer. Mm -hmm. First time he looked to his right and nodded yes, then answered yes to Sousa 40 minutes ago. And he did that last time, too. It was very obvious when, uh, was it Colin Wood was testifying? Yeah, Colin Wood, David, yeah, they obviously they had They did it the same thing. Like, it was very obvious someone or something was behind their webcam, and they were looking Yeah, looking they were looking over it. it. Yeah. yeah, they were looking over it, you could tell. So 100%. And, you know, that's that's what the lawyer's job is. So, But uh, great observation by Ruthless Mindset. Thank you very much. Six, we will suspend for 10 minutes and start uh, round three at uh, 1216 on the dot. This was my We're first suspended. cut in this. Mr. Genwis for five minutes, please. Okay. Right, sir. Let's uh, do it. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Firth, this is a sad example of corruption and potential criminality, but it also exposes incredible waste uh, within uh, this government, especially in the area of procurement and contracts to well-connected consultants for, in many cases, no discernible work. So I want to try in my round of questions to follow the money that was spent. The Auditor General's report estimates $59.5 million spent on the app and further that your company received directly $19.1 million of that money, even though by your own admission, all that you did was recruitment of other individuals and companies. That's an incredible sum for, quote unquote, recruitment. Uh, but you told the committee that the Auditor General's information is not correct. Uh, you dispute the 19.1 million figure. You say it was only 11 million. Is that correct? The application bill, that's correct. Okay, so so what happened to the missing 8.1 million? What do you think accounts for the discrepancy? Well, so you'll see in my, my evidence package, we've actually invoiced CBSA in three years, close to 22 million dollars approximately i'm not dis i'm not disputing the fact that 19 million dollars was an invoice through my company monthly i'm disputing that that 19.1 million dollars is completely attributed towards the arrive can application build oh shut up no you don't get to do this but he's like he's trying to say okay so it's like well it's technically this so Here's the thing. What he has said before is his company was responsible. And th this is what the Auditor General was saying in her report as well. What he is saying is that, well, um, the application build is all we should be talking about here in terms of the cost of Arrive Can. What he has admitted to is that he's been invoicing up until 2023, which is what his problem is with the Auditor General's report, for additional updates and support for the app. Well, I'm sorry, but that goes into the cost of a Rive can. And that was what the Auditor General was asked to estimate. So you don't get to say, well, you know, it, it, it's, it's not 19 million, it's 11. And like, I dispute what's in the Auditor General's report, but I'm not disputing the fact that it, it you know, that the, the $20 million wasn't paid to my company. I'm just saying that it was, was not related to the, 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 the application build. No one's talking about that. Only you were talking about that. And the reason why only you were talking about that is so you can get the heat off of you. But no, you you have to answer for the build and the support and the updates. So, like, no. Not acceptable. And I imagine Genesis isn't going to accept this as uh, either. Okay, so your testimony is that you've received $22 million from CBSA over the same period. You simply uh, are disputing the categorization of it as being uh, all related to ArriveCan. Uh, 
what, 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 what I would add to this in terms of, of frankly, the absurdity is that uh, the invoices that you've submitted to this committee, some of which are, are very kind of vague and unclear in terms of what they actually refer to, but they add up to 9.6 million. So you've shown this committee invoices for 9.6 million. You've also said uh, you've got 11 million uh, that you, you categorize as, as, as related to arrive cam and 22 million uh, in total. Uh, so how do you explain the discrepancy between what you've shown us invoices for and what you said uh, was uh, you actually received? Oops. First of all, the 22 million is not just solely arrive can. There was multiple projects we were working on during the pandemic. These were not arrive can contracts, right? There were three pandemic- yeah, The Auditor General says contracts. they are, but but I, I was asking specifically about the difference between the 9.6 million and the 11 million. You said you said you got eleven million, but you didn't provide us with eleven million worth of invoices. We we sent hundreds of pages of documents over. I can follow up and make sure that those ones would result to eleven million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Question: uh, We've only received nine point seven million dollars in invoices. You're saying is eleven? What's the description? Well, we've sent hundreds of pages over. <laughs> Right, and those hundreds of pages don't add up to what they're supposed to add like, up to. Like, my goodness. This guy's a terrible businessman, it's... or he's a terrible liar, or perhaps both. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Leo Orchard with a $50 super chat. Uh, one last try. Uh, CF said government set job price on median of three bit. Yeah. Uh, that what you can charge... Uh, then said, oh, Christian Firth, um, that's KF, um, said the government uh, set job price on median of three bids that you can charge. Then he said his percentage was based on what he pays the sub. Yes. He has admitted to for forging resumes. Yes. Uh, to look like they have more experience than they do admitted outright to front. Yeah. And yeah. He, he admitted that last committee, and that's what we were saying. And we so suspect we that's why he didn't want to come back to this committee, because he already admitted to something criminal in the last one. Right. Um, and and what he said before, and this is probably what Leo Orchard, you're, you're talking about, is when he was specifically talking about, you know, well, the government sets a rate at, say, $1,500 an hour. That's what he said. And if I can find a resource... And, and and get them to agree on $1,000 an hour, then I get $500 an hour. Done. And that's and that's your net profit. So, um, so yeah, that's that's what he's saying. And now the, and this is the thing, the, the government expects a resource at that $1,500 level, uh, $1,500 an hour level based on his agreed upon commission. Now, he doesn't get to set his own commission after that contract. He's supposed to take a set commission. Now, for those wondering, he's saying that um, the $2.5 million he received out of that $11 million, he's saying, well, that's that's what we received. That's a 23% margin. And he's saying, well, you know, we, we averaged 21. Okay, well, you know, that one was 23. Congratulations. You bought some more cars for your kids. Um, but... You know, you're not supposed to be able to do that, right? You, and this is why this is why this this whole standing offer thing doesn't make sense to me because a standing offer, if you were to look at that when it relates to a staffing agency, the staffing the staffing, sorry, the standing offer would be a set commission, twenty percent, thirty percent, whatever it is, that's what you would agree to, upon in the contract with the staffing agency. Private companies do this all the time. They sign, a, they sign a one or two year agreement with multiple staffing agencies. And the agreement sets the per percentage that they're allowed to take on the contract. Doesn't matter what the contract is, but it's a set amount. Why? It's so the, um, it's, it's so the company has a predictable form of a contract in terms of how much they can afford to pay for a resource. And then they know how to budget it because they know they're paying the uh, the staffing agency X, and then the balance of that goes to the actual resource himself. They don't go to these staffing agencies, and the staffing agency gets to just say, "Oh, well, you know, um, we're just going to pay this uh, resource, you know, uh, you know, forty percent of the contract, and we're going to take sixty percent." You know, the company doesn't have to know that. 
No, they can't do that. That's that's fraud. So it's it's crazy. It's crazy what is going on here. Um, what's not crazy is the super chat that Pandemonium uh, just put in, which was, as I often say to my wife, I fail to see how this is an either or scenario. Right. Right. Because it isn't. I've done this again. Like, hundreds, hundred, hundred, hundreds of pages doesn't absolve you of the need to provide accurate information, uh, sir. Uh, and just in terms of, of the difference between the 19.1 and, and the 11 million, um, you, you, you started off your, your testimony by saying that every, everybody's uh, lying and saying mean things about you. The media is wrong. The MPs are wrong. Um, but you're also now saying the Auditor General's wrong. Uh, what, what are we as a committee to make of the fact that you uh, want us to believe that everybody is wrong in their figures except you, and yet the invoices you sent to the committee don't add up to the figure you said was spent uh, on or was given to you in relation to arrive can oops yeah i also said as well it's uh in my opening statement that it's this testimony and this committee that have also had death threats against myself and my wife which had photographs of my kids being sir, taken sir i'm i'm i'm, I'm, I'm looking for too. accurate information on the amount of taxpayers money that went to to your company um I've, now we've uh, invoiced, can I, we've invoiced fifteen hundred times, twenty two million dollars. Well, uh, the the invoices do not line up with the figures you've done. given, sir. Sir, I'd like to know uh, for for all um, the money that you earned on this project um, a, a, after expenses, what what was the total amount of money that you and your partner took home for, for from this project? I have the, I haven't got the exact numbers after taxes, after expenses, through dividends, but I've told you it's two point, approximately two point five million dollars. Each, approximately two each. Five. No, no, in total. That's, okay. That's the so twenty percent. So you, 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 and your partner became millionaires through this project, and you want us to believe that all of the rest of it, in addition to the two two point eight million, were expenses even though all you did is recruit. I mean, how expensive is a LinkedIn uh, account these days? <laughs> $2.5 million over two years is 1.25 divided by two people. How many That's hours, how many hours did you spend working on, on, on sending the LinkedIn invitation, sir? <laughs> oh, crap. Get him. Oh, shots fired. Yeah. Wow. And the look on, Genu and on Genesis face is just disgusted. Well, and it should be. Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't you be if you were sitting in that chair listening to Firth go on? But, well, you know, it wasn't 2.5 million. It was 1.5 or 1.25 because it was divided by two people. That's still a 500, fortune. $500,000. It's still a fortune. Like, could you imagine making that in a year? Some CEOs don't even make that. Like, that's a lot of money. A lot of CEOs don't make that, yeah. It's a lot of dough. Like, holy... Wow. Good good going, Janice. Good going. Um, Heart Singer with a 1399 Super Chat. What gets me is the semantics over 11 million or 19 million. Still way too much. Also, thanks for keeping me on track as my mind is wandering uh, to the painting. <laughs> <laughs> is it a cabin, cottage, or chalet? It's so distracting, it's actually. A, it's a barn. It's like just this like quiet painting, but it's kind of distracting. Scott McFarland with a 2799 Super Chat. Uh, in... Get out of my way, context menu. Um, uh, in the in the, in the hood old days, it was hockey night in Canada. Then Rick Mercer report, and then this hour is twenty two minutes. And now Canadian entertainment is Northern perspective. Thanks, Cyber Fox. Truly national treasure. Our pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we'll be on uh, channel or global TV channel twenty seven or something like that. <laughs> uh, Mike Bamlet with a five dollars super chat. When Firth says the AG's report is incorrect, I keep seeing Pierre Polyev looking into the camera and just saying, Google it, look it up. <laughs> Maybe I need to get that as a meme Yes. Too. So many memes, so little time. Geese with teeth, a member for one, one month with a member comment, my wife and I voted for Janice. He and his uh, family stood next to the bridge in Fort Saskatoon, the only candidate I saw out in the cold one month. Woo! Woo Congrats on one month. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, we, we've... I'm trying to correct my pronunciation because I've said genuous for so long. Yeah, we've heard it both ways, so I guess in our brains it's kind of confusing sometimes. But, but it is genus from what we understand. Yeah, we, we understand that it is genus. So, um, 
So try and try and correct that if uh, if you didn't know. That has no bearing on this project, does it? I I, I think it does. How how much how much you earn for what work is the question we're asking, right? And 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 the numbers don't line up. And so and just a quick question and a quick answer, please. Yeah. How how many how many hours did you spend working on this project in exchange for the millions of dollars that you and your partner uh, got for got for the the act of recruiting. And it's a relevant question. Why? Because Canadians are asking value for money. So yes, we want to know the dollar per hour rate that you actually earned for this. Was it $2.5 million an hour? Seems like it. Meaning he only worked for an hour on this? Yeah, how long does it take to find people on LinkedIn? Like, or was it, you know, who knows? Who knows what it was? Mr. Firth, you better know what it is. But, you know, he he, he doesn't track that stuff because he doesn't care. He's just like, ooh, I'm a millionaire. Clyde, do something uh, with a $20 super chat. Sorry for joining late. Just finished up with Marty. Awesome seeing you guys getting a shout out at the standing committee. Thank you very much. You're getting attention for good reason. You do great work. Looking forward to Friday. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, Clyde. Uh, and for those who don't know, we'll be on Clyde's live stream this coming Friday. Absolutely. So. Three and, nights of Northern Perspective on live streams in a row. <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely. So uh, for those of you who uh, uh, who are interested, uh, take a look at Clyde's show on Friday. And uh, I'm sure he'll have some more information up on his community section or Twitter feed shortly. So thank you very much for that, Clyde. And thank you very much for the uh, kind words about getting the shout out. It was definitely something we were tickled. It was a surprise for sure. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Would it be between... 30 to 40 hours every month with the invoicing, with Stop. doing time sheets, with doing accounting, with doing paying, paying our resources. And so, so what makes you so lucky that, that you got this? Time. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Jen, Jen is just trying to steamroll in with another question. He's not going to get it. Kelly's going to shut him down. And thank you to Richard Hepner with a $2 super chat. It says, at least we all know we are getting the truth here. That's the goal. That's the goal. And uh, if we make a mistake, you can better believe we will try and correct it. Diane Sylvain with a $10 super chat. What the strategy is here to get Firth uh, rattled to get him to say, yes, I ordered the code red. He is close to it. Yeah, it seems like it, Diane. Yeah, he I seems think you're kind right. of a pushover. Um, maybe that goes to his mental state. I don't know. But even last time in committee, like, was it Brock and, and Janice that were steamrolling him pretty hard and, and he, like, folded? Yeah, yeah. He's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Opportunity. Uh, Genwis, thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Baines, please go ahead. Oh, I'm certainly not going to listen to Kieran Deep Baines. Do you have a crush on Mr. Baines or no? I don't think anybody has a yeah. crush on Mr. Baines. They, they, yeah, and please be clear that the, the government cannot go direct to these resources. They need vendors like ourselves to, to pass these people through. Why is that, that, that not part of the process? Yeah. Just quick because answer you have to be a qualified, Sorry, just start again. You have to be a qualified vendor. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Mr. Baines. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Vignola, please, are two and a half. May that is not correct. That is not correct. Uh, <laughs> you can hire people on contracts with the government anytime, and you do not need a a staffing agency to do that. You you, you don't. So that is pure, as they say, bollocks. Pure crap. Yes, they absolutely can go direct to these people. 100% they can. Thank you very much. Mr. Firth, I'll just make a number of assertions and I'd like you to confirm them or deny them. Now, if I understood correctly, GC Strategies was never responsible for the financial coding. It's the contract authority, i.e. CBSA, that was responsible for financial coding that was required uh, under the Auditor General's analysis. Is that correct? That's correct. 
that's what the Auditor General's report says. I'm, I'm, I thought it'd be Merci. somebody in the financial department would be in. Thank you. Vous, what's up? Now, your sole responsibility as a company was to affix the contract number on your invoices. Is that correct? Typically, contract numbers, task authorization numbers, okay. confirmation and sign off by the government. La vérificatrice générale. Est... The Auditor General stressed that uh, CBSA was not doing its financial coding adequately, and as a result, a complete verification had to be done manually by comparing each and every document and each invoice. Do you believe that uh, with a manual verification of that sort, that the data can be corrected, whether it has to do with your company or any company whatsoever? Sorry, can you repeat the question again? I want to make sure it could be the right answer. Consider do you consider, do you believe that once a manual verification of the financial coding will be conducted by the Auditor General, will that uh, correct the data that was released a couple of uh, weeks ago, both in your case and for other companies? He's not going to know. I'd, I'd have to ask what the manual verification would entail and that all the information that they're verifying manually is actually all the information. Yes, yeah, so, so one of the big problems that the Auditor General found, um, for those that don't know, is that the invoices didn't even really say what they were working on. So how can you invoice correctly to a specific project if you don't even entail on the invoice what the person actually worked on? And here, And this begs the next question, right? So then why did CBSA accept these? And then not only they accepted them, they coded them and they paid for them. So like this, as we know, this isn't all on Christian Firth and GC strategies. There's some, there's some really shady stuff going on at CBSA as well. As we know, he has buddies in there and Ladies and gentlemen, who admitted to the ones that actually received and coded their invoices? Cameron McDonald. So Firth is sending the invoices, doesn't detail what work was done. Cameron McDonald's receiving them and saying, oh yeah, we'll receive that, sign off on that, send it over to finance, finance codes it and, and enters it into the system. Finance doesn't care. Finance is just looking for, did we receive the services paid? And if they get an invoice and they get the proper authorization uh, for that, they're just going to put it through. So, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's get to uh, the uh, super chats that came in. And we have... Uh, Stephen Hunter with a five dollar super chat. GC strategy stands for government corruption strategies. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Probably, probably. Okay, merci. Saviez-vous que le process? We were aware that the procurement process used currently was implemented by the Minister of Public Works and Government Services at the time, Ms. Ambrose. I'm sorry, I, don't, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer. Okay. On va y aller avec une question. Well, perhaps a more straightforward question. Do you find the procurement process to be straightforward, flexible, resilient, or cumbersome, complicated, complex, and uh, needing to be improved? I find, I find it, after being in the industry for a long time, straightforward. <laughs> However, I, I do think there needs to be a component where it's quicker for the government to go direct to the source. You so, find this straightforward? So that wasn't his glasses hitting the table. It was just a pen, but still. <laughs> you found... you. Government procurement is the most complex process on the planet. You've even described it as... A, you know, it's, it's only straightforward because Cameron McDonald gives you all of the contracts straight straight away you don't have to do any work remember he only has to work for 40 hours a month according to his own admission and i think that's an overestimation that's 10 hours a week that's part time everybody remember part time is 25 hours a week and he's saying 10 hours a week now 
he always wants to split this up between him and his partner because he's saying, oh, well, you know, we both, okay, so you both, so each of you only worked five hours a week and you got paid $2.5 million between the two of you. That's criminal. You know how much that is an hour, everybody? A lot. That's $1,250 an hour, I believe. No. No. 12000 I'm not good at mental math, so don't ask me. <laughs> so, let's see. Well, $50 an hour is 100 grand a year. So, 500 So, that would be... And that's at yeah, full time. That's, that's, full that's, time. that's yeah, twelve. I was right. $1,250 an hour. Insane. That's more than a lot of lawyers I'm, make. I'm usually not not calculating that much per hour, which is why <laughs> why it kind of <laughs> threw me for a loop. Because the rule of thumb is that you take the dollar per hour, um, double it and multiply it by 10, and that's like that, that, that's uh, that's what your 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 annual is. So like $50 an hour is 100 and multiply it by 10. Um, sorry, multiply by a hundred and then, oh, you can, it is so late. It is so late. Okay. So if you make $50 an hour, you double it and you're working full time, you double it and that's a hundred. So that a hundred is a hundred grand a year. Yeah. You, so you multiply it by a hundred. Yeah. No, multiply it by a thousand. So, hey, I was good at the mental math this time. 50 times two <laughs> times. Yes, you're correct. I'm always correct. There you go. The best kind of correct. So. Um, so just making sure two times one. So yes, they, ma they were making $1,250 per hour. Wow. Thank you very much. Mr. Backrack, please go ahead, sir. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Now, I, I think it's pretty clear looking at the relationship between, uh, you, Mr. Firth and, and Mr. McDonald, I, th I think it's pretty clear from your testimony, what's in it for you, which is that you've established yourself as the government's, uh, go-to guy that you have the ability to, uh, run these contracts through your company and, uh, Mr. McDonald therefore funnels a bunch of work, uh, to you and you're able to charge these commissions. That's been well established. What I've had a harder time understanding is what's in it for Mr. McDonald. Uh -huh. And I'm going to go back to some Globe and Mail reporting from January 16th. And this um, involves uh, conversations, communications between you and the two uh, Botler principals. Um, and you urged them to single out Mr. McDonald for praise when meeting with other senior government officials. And the quote here from you, Mr. Firth, is, I just want to make sure that he gets taken care of, right? Um, this was told to uh, Ms. Dutt and, and uh, Mr. Morv. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can clarify what him being taken care of would entail and why it was so important that Mr. McDonald got taken care of in I your view. I don't recall that conversation. So this was, uh, this was no financial benefit at all or any kind of transaction before. I just felt that the opportunity that um, working, Mr. McDonald working with Butler and understanding the importance of the harassment that was happening within the public safety portfolio, that I felt like there had to be some recognition, whether it's a pat on the back or a job well done for identifying the issues with the public safety and being the Pathfinder organization to move forward. So No, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that doesn't fly. You, you wanted... You wanted McDonald to get the credit. Why? Why doesn't Butler get the credit? And why do you care? You shouldn't care as a staffing agency. You're a staffing agency. You just want to get paid. You shouldn't care at all that this guy gets a pat on the back. And to tell to tell a vendor to to talk up the the guy that is their client in front of their superiors. That's very inappropriate. It's sleazy. It's dirty. And you're just trying to say, oh, well, you know, pat on the back. No, that doesn't fly. Bernard McCoy, welcome to NP Supporter. Thank you very much for that. And we have Nilik with a $2.00 <laughs> just spits water. Oh, come on! Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we definitely need that meme in a hurry. Yes, we do. 
The, the benefit for him from this relationship was that praise sent his way would help him advance in the organization. And the benefit for you was that you would be able to charge these commissions and continue to get work. Is that a fair characterization of sort of this reciprocity that you had going on? Nope, not at all. Why not? Well, because there was the intentions was I was not going to rub his back. He rubs my back. This is not I'm going to make you have advancements through your career so you can keep funneling contracts. You have to bear in mind that I, the first contract after knowing Mr. McDonald since 2010, the first contract I was awarded under with while he was in the department was 10 years later. Like That doesn't sound like it's a relationship that's been going back and forth many times. But the quote is literally, I just want to make sure he gets taken care of, right? Um, yeah, that, that, could just, that, could, that could be recognition for a job well done. That doesn't guarantee a promotion. Okay, it, it reads to me like something more than recognition uh, being taken care of. Um, so quick I'd question, like Mr. Backcrack, please. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, cede my time, Mr. Chair, and dive into the next question next round. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mrs. Block, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, you're, you're not, you can't talk your way out of that one. Like, oh, well, you know, just, just a job all done. Then what? Like, you don't care. You, you just said this isn't a he scratches my back, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and I scratch his. Well, then why would you care about having Butler tell, tell the superiors that Cameron is great so he gets taken care of? It's, it's one or the other, my friend. Again, go first yourself on your answers. Uh, Vesper Digital with a five dollars super chat. Uh, that painting in the back is bothering me. It, it looks like a field with a chalet. It's so <laughs> distracting. Hey, if you want, I can I can draw a little picture. <laughs> no, no. I <laughs> uh, no, I I, I want to make sure this is authentic as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Firth, I'm going to circle back to my line of questioning regarding uh, GC Strategies' involvement in developing criterion on the fourth contract that you would have been awarded through the CBSA. Both the Auditor General and the Procurement Ombuds identified the overly restrictive criterion on that fourth contract, which obviously raised concerns for both of them of deeper concern to the Auditor General is that she went further and identified that GC strategies were at the table. And so, look, you would have been meeting with public office holders in order to, to set this criteria. They are accountable to Parliament. And so I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked earlier. I'm trusting that you've had an opportunity to speak with your lawyer. Who did you communicate with from the government of Canada? So this is good that she's asking this question again, because it's been clarified that he kind of has to answer this question. And I well, need the names. Well, thank, thank you. Thank, thank you for the question. So let me address the um, about the requirements being overly restrictive. I think I've heard in testimony and read in reports that uh, the e-portal did a CPSS search, and there were actually 40 qualified vendors that could bid on this RFP. And actually, I think 10 even showed interest. Um, so it seems a little subjective after the fact to call it restrictive, uh, when there were already 40 qualified vendors who could actually respond to that. And secondly, I, um, I've had a chance to speak with my lawyer, and uh, I'm st sticking to what my line of is with regards to this is under investigation by the RCMP, and therefore I cannot interfere with that. Mr. Chair, I'm wondering if you could provide us with any clarity on that. Thanks, Mrs. Block. Mr. Firth, I understand what you're saying, but it's, it's, a, it's a very direct and simple uh, question. And we do have rules, and I'm going to refer back to it. Witnesses must answer all questions which the committee puts to them. You may object to a question asked by an individual committee member. However, the committee agrees that the question uh, to be put to the witness, the witness is obliged to reply. Um, actions a witness refuses, questions may re be reported to the House. And I, 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 don't, I think I can speak for everyone. We don't want to get to that point. But I think it's a fair question. And I don't think it's one directly related to any potential investigation. I, I, if I read it right, it's... The commentary that um, GC helped write the requirements that you in turn 
won the contract for. And I think that's what we're looking for it is, if I correct Mrs. Block, is, you know, who did you discuss oh. this with the, uh, the department with? Yeah, so, I, so again, I've, I've, the first three contracts, the names have already been provided back in October of 2022. And I promised the, um, the committee member that I'll get the fourth person to them after this meeting. Okay. So I want, just for greater clarity, um, I'm looking for the individuals or individual that you would have met with in developing the criteria, not who signed off on the contract in this particular case. I do want that name, but now I'm asking, who did you sit at the table with to develop the criteria for this contract? And again, apologies, but uh, after speaking with my lawyer, my, my stand still stands the same with the RCMP investigation pending. I don't interfere with that. This is a very interesting piece here. Um, so, because it's, he's being instructed something to say by his lawyer, and the government is basically telling them, you're, you're not allowed to say that. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, because every, everybody is a legal expert in this scenario. You're not dealing with a lawyer and a client, and then, you know, Bob, who has no legal expertise. There are so many lawyers in that room. Well, and not just that, but a lot of the MPs have, um, even if they're not lawyers, they have firsthand experience with legislation. Like, they create laws. You know what I mean? So they have some idea of how it works. But I, I find it interesting that, because uh, I assume Larry Brock is in here. Um, maybe he's not, but I, th I thought I saw him. Um, he could be just in the gallery. But, um, and, or, or maybe he's not directly participating. Maybe that's, maybe that's uh, the difference because I would, have, I would have thought to hear a point of order from, from him on this. Um, but um, so maybe, he, maybe because he's, he's not sitting actually at the table with committee, he's not allowed to, uh, to speak. So um, and that's, now that I'm thinking about it, that's most likely the case. So it's going to be very interesting to see how this actually plays out. Uh, Chris Ackert, with, uh, who's a member from one month, uh, I think you meant to put a comment in there, but I don't see it. Um, if you did, you can just tag Barnaby and he'll give us the comment. Yep. Mr. Roscoe Pico with a $5 super chat. Block is awesome, the setup for tomorrow. Yeah, she is. She's really, really good. She's sharp, man. She is really, really sharp. Uh, we are very lucky to have her as an MP, and she's been an MP for over 10 years, I believe. Um, Heart Singer with a $7 super chat. Now I'm thinking he chose the painting as a middle finger to us. <laughs> oh, everyone's getting, <laughs> I guess, distracted by it. I doubt there was that much thought put into um, it. <laughs> Sloppy Slews with a $10 or seven, uh, $2.79 super chat. Fox, get that tape ready for Cypher's glasses. Okay, That's give me those glasses. Here we go. And give me that pen, too. Oh, the pen's fine. Um, and we have Kim Day with a $5 super chat. Uh, I'm so happy I found you guys. Thank you for the, all the hard work and uh, you do keeping me and all Canadians informed. It is uh, seriously our pleasure. our pleasure. It's a labor and it is laborious, but it is a labor of love. Well, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure where we go with that, but I'm sure we'll discuss that uh, in due time. I'm going to then turn some of my questions to... Um, a slide deck for a possible app in March 2020 that you were asked to create. It's my understanding uh, that this deck was presented to Mendone, who is a key government official that was involved in Arrive Can, and that particular app had a Distill Mobile logo. Um, if uh, if that is correct, who asked you to pro to provide the deck? I'm sorry. Can you sorry? Can you please repeat the question? Sure. Oh come on. You know darn well what she said. You're just buying time. You were asked to put together a slide deck for a possible app in March of 2020. Who asked you to provide that deck? I'm more than happy to get that to you. I'm ready. I was not aware of this question coming up. So March 2020, to still a deck. Yep, I can get that to you. Okay. Um, so. You were contacted from the government, and you were told you are receiving a contract for ArriveCan. Is there anyone at the CBSA that would have to declare a conflict of interest on contracts that you are bidding on? No, there's not. 
Okay, so you are not related to anyone at the CBSA? Correct, I'm not. Okay. Are you related to anyone working for a government department or any public office holder? All of my family is in the UK. Okay, thank you. They kicked his ass out, no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> Get the Firth out of here. <laughs> And I bet you he changed his last name to Firth. Uh, Norm Nicholson with a $20 super chat. Thank you, Cypher and Fox, for your diligence to teach us all the truth of these committees. Much appreciated. You are very welcome. You guys are seriously welcome. Thank you very much for being a, an amazing community. That's like, we, we can't thank you enough. Um, we have over 2,000 people on this stream, and everyone is just getting along so well. Uh, this, is, this is Canada in, in a nutshell in this stream. So thank you, everybody very much let's uh turn now to von brennan he is an ottawa-based consultant and it is my understand him you know it is my understanding that you know him professionally is that correct That's correct do you know him in any other capacity no i do not okay mr brennan's wife worked at procurement canada that's the department responsible for oh. government contracts were you aware of this not until now. Okay. <laughs> sure you weren't. Sure you weren't. But that's plausible. That's what we call plausible, plausible deniability. Plausible deniability, yep. You can't prove that he knew. Okay, just, I guess, another convenient coincidence. Who were your contacts with the government at the following departments and agencies? We have Canada Border Services Agency. It's my understanding there are 134 contracts there. Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada, 24 contracts, and Employment and Social Development Canada. So who are your contacts with all of these departments? I'll get them to you in writing. Um, I'd like to provide all of those details after this meeting, please. I would <laughs> not like to speak about it publicly, just how this committee is going. So if you wouldn't mind, I would provide that information so, to you after this meeting. He's agitated. Um, we're out of time anyway, so perhaps we can get back to that in the next round or it can be uh, provided in writing. We have uh, Mr. Kuzmirchuk from sunny tropical Windsor. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, see, here's the thing. What what Firth is doing there, he, you're not allowed to do. Yeah, he doesn't get to choose which questions he answers or whether he answers them on the camera or in writing. Yeah, committee rules state that y you don't get to choose how you respond to committee. What committee can do is solicit additional documentation from you in writing but you know the only way you could do like if Firth was smart he would say um I don't remember can I provide you these after that's what he if he was actually smart that's what he would do because um those are the cases in which committee says okay well we need the answers so yeah if you can provide that to to us in, in writing within a week or within 24 hours that would be great but he's just outright saying, well, I know, but I don't want to tell you. Um, I don't I don't want to tell you in public. You're not allowed to do that. Again, welcome to being a government contractor, Mr. Firth. This is part of the deal. You don't like testifying in front of committee. You don't like being on TV. Guess what? Go contract out to a shopper's drug mart or something. Yeah, pro contract to your private company. And also, don't, don't overcharge the government and... and I don't want to say steal taxpayer How money. How about commit but fraud? Yeah, there you go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, oh, Captain Filibuster. Um, I doubt I'm going to get anything useful. Mr. Barrett, we already know is... Back to Mr. Barrett. We already know he's not happy with this guy. Time, Mr. Kismerchuk. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Barrett. Or, sorry, Mr. Barrett, go ahead, please. That uh, we have a round of uh, questions with you. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of cleanup afterwards. I have to go back to the question Ms. Block asked you. That was who were your contacts with the government at the following departments and agencies? Uh, CBSA, Innovation, Science, Economic Development Canada, Employment and Social Development Canada. Are you telling us you don't know the answers to that question or... Uh, is your answer that you're refusing to provide us uh, with the information that you that you have? Oh, not at all. Actually, I think my answer was I will provide those to you in writing after this meeting. Do you know That's the exactly answer? That's exactly what I said. My, my question is, do I you do know? know. Then provide I us. I do know the answer. 
I will after this meeting with the writing. You know, I, I think that you have a, a, a grave misunderstanding of how this process works and your refusal to answer questions here um, is a contempt of Parliament. And so that is something that we can take up. I know it's great. Uh, you take great umbrage in the fact that um, that a subpoena had to be issued and that had you not appeared today, a warrant would have been issued and you would have been arrested and brought before this committee. So you're here very much um, not because you want to be forthcoming. You're here only under the threat of arrest. So that's what we're dealing with and trying to get answers from you. So you'll have to excuse me if um, I don't believe you, sir, that you're going to bring us the answers after uh, the, the cameras go off and, uh, and the committee is adjourned. Because in your first uh, back and forth uh, that you and I had, um, you, know, you, you admitted to having perjured yourself in a previous appearance at this committee. So I, I have to go back and talk about that again. You admitted to meeting officials in private residences and um, you exposed your own lie. And so I, I need to know what are the names of government officials that you have met with anywhere outside of government offices? Just the names. Now, I imagine what would happen after this, right? So let's say he doesn't provide this because, again, we, we don't know what happens. Let's say he doesn't answer the question and he does end up uh, giving them in writing. What his lawyer will no doubt argue is that while well, he did provide the question, he he did provide the answers to the questions, it can't be contempt of parliament. And what the government will argue is it is contempt of parliament because you refused to answer the question when it was posed to you. So, oh, I didn't even know. My, my glasses came off. Um, <laughs> at least you didn't throw them. Yeah, uh, at least I didn't throw them is absolutely right. Um, so we have a $2 super chat from Master Bater. Get him. Let's go, Barrett. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think he's, I don't, I don't think we have to worry about that. He's, he's going to get him. So let's see how this goes. First of all, I want to address the first thing you said, where well, I, I don't want to be here because I want to be arrested. I don't want to be here because my family and myself and my kids have been threatened. And people come like, that's sir, the real reason sir, I don't the, want to be here. The, the question I, is very straightforward. It's for a list of names. Yeah, which I'm happy to give you. And I'm admitting I will give you those within 24 hours after the testimony. Don't, I don't believe you. <laughs> Did you ever meet with Philip Johnston in a private residence or any place other than a government office? I have met with Philip Johnston Outside of work, yes. Where? At a pub. When? I don't recall. 2021. We're going to circle back to that. I, Have you ever met with Min Doan in a private residence or anywhere other than a government office? No, I have not. Same question. Cameron McDonald. I have met him outside of work. We, we heard the testimony three times. When and where, sir? I'm happy to provide that information in 24 hours. I don't have that in front of me. Same question. Antonio Utano. Yes, I have. When and where? Again, I will get you that information. Kelly Boulanger. I have never met with Kelly Boulanger outside of work. Mark Briard. Yes, I've met with Mark Briard outside of work. When and where? I'll get you that information. Okay. Um... I'm not sure who Philip Johnson is off the top of my head. Kelly Belanger uh, was the interim CIO when Mendon went on like a temporary leave. Um, that was at the CBSA. Mark Brilliard was the temporary chief information officer of the entire government of Canada. That's everything. So all of the IT infrastructure within the government is under the chief information officer's office as well as the chief technology officer's office. So um, given that he was the interim CIO, that would have been a big deal to actually be meeting with him. So this is interesting. And so again, you'll have to excuse my, uh, um, my unwillingness to take at face value that you're gonna provide us information after, because I asked you these questions when you appeared before this committee before, and you said that you hadn't met with uh, officials, government officials outside of government offices. That, sir, and you can check with your lawyer or with a dictionary, is a lie. It's perjury. At your first appearance before this committee, you testified that you did not know 
and were not privy to any hospitality being given to anyone who worked for the government of Canada. Is that true or is that a lie? He's going to say, it was a mistake. <laughs> it's not that I lied. I just, I misremembered. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, if he's not sweating, he's sweating now. Maybe he should have gone, uh, he shouldn't have gone with the high def camera. I've, I'm answering your question. I've actually been, I've just given you the names of all the people. And I've agreed that I've actually taken these people. We've been outside for work. Hospi the question, sir, is on hospitality. You had said previously so every that, you weren't, every that you, weren't privy, you weren't privy to information on whether that had happened. And uh, it seems like that's a lie. No, I'm just telling you I've, I'm privy now to information that happened. And I've just give, I've agreed that those people I've met outside of work. So, well, you're agreeing now. You disagreed before. Sir, both in documents and testimony, we now know that you, sir, in fact, provided hospitality to Government of Canada <laughs> officials on multiple occasions. And you lied I'm, about I'm it. To do that. You lied I'm about allowed, it. I, but, but you lied about it to the committee. If... If you're if you're content that um, that it, everything was well within the bounds, if you've acted above board, my question to you, sir, is why is it every time you come to this committee do you lie to parliamentarians and you lie to Canadians? Ooh, I'm telling the truth. I have met with all of those people outside of work in a, hospita in a hospitality manner. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Mr. Sousa, please. Reply. Chair, just a, a, a point of order. Um, there were a number of instances, obviously, during Mr. Barrett's questions in which the witness point blank refused to answer questions. I, I wonder if you as chair or can on behalf of the committee uh, direct the witness to provide answers to the questions that were asked. Yeah, Mr. Firth, there was, I, I think there was a couple you said that you had but would not provide at this time, but we're going to wait till later to provide oh, for us. That was just the information for the... The, the resources of the people, the Canadian officials that are for those certain departments. I'm providing those the within contacts. 24 hours. The contacts, yes. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying no to any of these questions. I'm just saying I will provide them after. Do you have, but I guess the question is, do you have that information now with you? I, I don't have the information with me right now. That's part of the reason why I'm asking for 24 hours to collect it. Okay. No, no. Chair, chair, yeah, just chair. bear with us. That, 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 is, that, is not what, that is not what the witness said. The witness said, in fact, that... Uh, with the way the meeting is going, he wasn't prepared to provide them in public. Yeah. So, um, Mr. Firth, that was actually yeah, Mr. Firth, that is, I, I heard as chair, I have the information, but I'm not going to provide it right now. I'll provide it later in writing, which is different than I don't have the information now. I think. So remember what I said before, right? Remember what I said before. He 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 played it completely wrong. If he had said, I don't remember. Um give me some time to get it that's different and that's what he should have said if he really wanted to get out of this the problem that he said i do know it but i'm not going to give it to you now that's where he screwed himself and he puts himself in contempt of parliament he is so dumb i don't think he listened to his lawyer or in he interpreted what his lawyer said incorrectly here so he has screwed himself you need to be Sorry, was very, very clear with your answers. I will be very clear. I don't have this saying. information available to me now. I'll provide it later, or I'm not willing to provide it at this time. Thank you, Chair. I'll clarify. I have the information not with me at the present, and I will provide it within 24 hours when I need to collect it. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Firth. I just, and I realize it's difficult, but I just ask you, please. Uh, Take the time to clarify these things uh, carefully. Mr. Sousa, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Firth, are you aware of cases of bid rigging, bid rigging in the past? No, I'm not. In 2009, there was uh, charges of bid rigging uh, between some firms in Ottawa. Was Veritech one of them? I think there was, I think there was one of five firms, I think, with bid rigging associations. I think so. I think there's been two cases. I think there's a previous one with TPG as well, and I think there is another one. I think there's been two in all the cases, in all the time since 2003, I think there's only been two cases of bid rigging. And uh, were you involved in any of those cases? 
No, I was not. So, um, hey. For those interested, I'm going to queue something up so you can see because it, it is pertinent to what Sousa is actually talking about here. Because um, I just looked this up. So remember I said that Christian Firth used to work for a company called Veritac. Let's take a look. June 9th, 2009. Former Ottawa IT firm owner fined $25,000 for bid rigging. Charges were laid on February 15th, or 17th against seven companies and 14 individuals after the Bureau investigated tendering for 10 information technology contracts worth $67 million. Shannon Lambert of Veritac Technology House Incorporated pleaded guilty to one count of bid rigging on February 23rd, 2009. Lambert, who the Bureau said fully cooperated with this investigation, was given an absolute discharge and made a $5,000 donation to charity. Let's see who else was in here. Uh, none of these come to mind as uh, other than Veritac as, as interesting. So isn't it interesting? That the same company, the same company that that Christian Firth actually worked for, was involved in this. So, um, yeah, fascinating. During your time recently, have you you've been approached by the Auditor General in in her review? I was emailed. Well, to give comment on the pieces that involve GC strategies, which you responded to. The ombudsman, did you receive any calls from him? No, I did not. How about Mr. Lafleur and his investigation that's ongoing? He reached out to me and actually took a, a nice stance of understanding while being contributing to this testimony, what it's like, and he's actually sent me the questions in writing that I'm going to respond to. So you have to respond to him still? You're, that hasn't yes. happened? Correct. In regards to your earlier testimony around omnibuses, is this something that's in relation to what the ombudsman talked about when it regards to bait and switch? Can you explain this? No. No, you no, an, dummy. An, an omnibus contract is usually a large one put out by a big agency like a CRA or, or even a CDSA. And this would be for general IT services, not specific to a technology. And it would incorporate 20 to 30 different categories and different levels of, of skill set. Can you explain what, what the bait and switch is? Yeah, a bait and switch is when a, a vendor puts forward a bid, they win the bid, and then they'll switch them out for people that weren't on the bid to do the work. Because typically they'll get more money, or sometimes those people aren't available. Depends how long it takes to evaluate the bid. Has that happened in your case in the past? No, actually, we were. Thank you. For, well, the ombudsman said of the 76% of the resources that did not work on a right then, we can tell you every single person we put forward that was caught up in a task authorization worked. Nobody we had did not work on a right can, or anybody we presented did not work on a right can. When it comes to a right can, some, there's been this $80,000 uh, mention in regards to the establishment, and then it, it ballooned. And in your case, 11 million is what you say you received, the, the Auditor General saying 19 million. But can you explain? What, what's the reference to the 80,000 versus what has happened? I think that was just a, a proof of concept of, of a, a understanding what it would take for paper to go digital. So that was, it was, then it turned into a project. Then all of a sudden it, it ballooned into PHAC having all these agency requests and policy changes and subsequent amendments after that. So could arrive can't ever be produced to the extent that it has been for $80,000? No, not at all. It's okay. Um, you're, you're integrating with you're integrating with backend systems. You're 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 dealing with like mainframes. You're using like just just alone in what AWS charges for cloud services that wouldn't even cover a month. I'm sorry. This isn't the gentleman that should be giving his opinion from a technical perspective on what can and can't be done from an IT and the monetary value behind it, based on his own admission that he is not an IT expert. So. I'm sorry, Mr. Firth, I don't accept your testimony 
as a subject matter expert that this could have been done for whatever price tag. Even if you say, you know, this 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 couldn't have been done for a hundred million, I still wouldn't accept it. Not at all. Because you don't know anything when it comes to IT. All you know is how to click send in terms of a message button inside of LinkedIn. That's it. So I don't want to hear it. If you want my opinion on what this should have cost, this should have cost probably in the neighborhood between 250 and at the top end, $500,000. That's what it probably should have cost. Understood. Um, Mr. McDonald called you to contact Butler. So Mr. McDonald had a relationship with Butler before you. Is that correct? I mean, again, he didn't call me to reach out to Butler. This was, I was made aware of the situation that the, the, the public, safe, uh, public safety portfolio was having. And at that point, I reached out to Butler through a LinkedIn communication. All right. And that contradicts Mr. McDonald's testimony right there. So someone's lying here. The question is, who is it? Because remember, McDonald said that uh, Butler and, and Christian Firth approached him. Well, why would they even do that? How would they even know to do that, uh, Cameron McDonald, if they didn't know that you had a need for a, a solution regarding harassment that was exactly what Butler had? You think it was just magic that he that that they knew? So by by first own admission, he was made aware from the CBSA, aka Cameron McDonald, that they had a need for a solution like this, and he was told to reach out to Butler. So either Firth is lying or Cameron's lying. All right, and then that's when you then went back to McDonald. Well, that was when I was working with, with Butler to put to go together a proposal and at that point submitted it to the CBSA as a point of reference. But you didn't receive a contract? No, I did not. Nor did Butler? No. And, it was, a, and it was a pilot, uh, but it wasn't, there was no completion. From, is that correct? Yeah, it, what, it, started, it, it was actually a feasibility study. It was just to see if this would even integrate into CBSA and whether it would be adopted. Um, my understanding was that the first two components were done, which was what they were paid on. It was the, sec the second and third part was never asked for. And so who who paid them, though? You didn't pay I, them. I paid them. Who paid so you? Karadix and Dalian paid me. So, so they I was, I, Yes, so they got the margin. I, I had zero margin on this. I made zero dollars off Butler for two years. Don't buy it. And... That so Dalian got a contract with the government relative to the work being done by Butler on this feasibility study. Correct. And um, I'm not. I think my my internet's unstable. I apologize. G G I'm glad it's him because I thought it was us. <laughs> yeah, I thought our stream was going to go down again. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, some person says undo the top of your button. Yeah, I think he's going to pop. Uh, like look, look. He is looks like red. He's gonna explode. Um, like he's as red as our logo. <laughs> so I want to understand. Sorry, Mr. Sousa, so we're out of time. Can you just uh, finish up with a question for Mr. Firth? How did Dalian get the contract? They were advised by the CDSA that there would be a task authorization authored to do the bottler work from CDSA. They were an existing. They had an existing contract in place, and asked if Butler would work with them for that. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Mrs. Vignola, please, for two and a half. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Mr. Firth, is GC Strategies the only company that you own currently? Sir, GC Strategies is the, the only company that services the federal government, correct? That wasn't the question. Okay, donc d'autres compagnies, mais qui ne. So you own other companies, but not companies that deal with the federal government. Now, the amounts received, we read in the newspapers, 
that there was a company that uh, used tax havens. Is that a part of your personal values to rely on tax havens? I'm sorry, I don't rely on tax havens. I, the company, the other company that I own that's in there, I think, is was something in 2004, which is a venture that started about doing car detailing. It wasn't a offshore account or tax haven. Um, in 2018, GC Strategies released a memo stating that it was associated with a gentleman who was currently a senator at the time, Senator White. In what context did you have dealings with Mr White, the senator, and not Mr White, uh, your partner? We, uh, we were introduced to uh, Conservative Senator Vern White uh, at a social event. And at that point, he was uh, in the Senate. He was a retired uh, chief of police from the city of Ottawa and I think deputy commissioner of RCMP. We were looking at um, doing some work in the municipalities for uh, Durham and a, and a few others. And he was interested in helping us get some contacts in there. He was never on retainer. He was never paid. We never actually got a contract through Mr. White. He was just more of a, a strategic advisor when it came to policing and public safety. I'd like to come back to what you said earlier regarding Kerala Systems Consulting. Now, when one looks at the public records, there are three partners, three shareholders, you, Mr. Anthony, and Mr. Caleb White, not to conflate him with Senator White, of course, and that that particular company, in fact, uh, existed in 2015, Corridor. Now, you said prior to 2015, you had no involvement, you were not a partner, you just bought it in April 2015, and any data prior to 2015, well, you don't have access to that. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around how things work here. So it's, it was just a simple acquisition where for a short moment in time from um, when we bought the company to when our name changed, we were owners of Cordial because we, we purchased it, that company for two to three months and then the name changed and that moved over GC Strategies. It was just an acquisition at that time. Is that, that is, uh, Pastor Tyne. Mr. Backrack, please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'd like to ask some questions about uh, why the government needs companies like yours in order to achieve their outcomes. And I'll, I'll go back to some testimony, Mr. Firth, from a previous meeting where you said, if they want to eliminate the middleman, then they should have the ability to invoice or go directly to some of these people who have the software and have the product. Unfortunately, at this point, that doesn't exist. Why, why isn't the government able to go directly to vendors uh, and invoice them directly for their services? Which they are, by the way. So my understanding is you have to become a qualified vendor with, 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 uh, with PSPC. And I think my understanding is it's, it's, it's a pretty arduous task to try and do that. And a lot of people don't want to do it. Like, whether you're an independent or whether you're a firm, a lot of people are okay with having a middleman to navigate those potential hurdles for them. So typically by choice, uh, the, well, and the ones that do want to, do become a qualified vendor and have the opportunity to go direct to the government. So this is interesting. Um, so it sounds like the reason that they purchased Cordell Systems was because they were already a qualified vendor with the government. And they didn't want to go through that whole competitive process to actually do that because, because we've actually heard in previous committee meetings that um, one of the prerequisites is that you actually have to have previous relationships or previous projects with the government. So it was easier for them just to buy a company that already fit the bill than that, that to already start had that history. Themselves. So they so and that's why he's saying you know it uh, from my understanding it's a it's a because he's never had to go through it and they never had to go through it because they bought the company 
in order to actually gain those contracts in the first place. So that's fascinating. And the problem with what he's saying is like, so it, it, it all depends, right? Because you can, you can hire on contractors, no problem. You just can't hire on somebody as their own individual company without them going through this, this process. But even that, you kind of can. It depends on the value of the contract. But there's nothing that's stopping any government agency at all from saying, you know what, we need we need two app developers, we need two database guys, we need three web developers, like whatever they need. And then go out and hire these people on contracts. They can do that directly. They don't need a staffing agency. How do I know that? Because you can just look on, on LinkedIn. You can look on the government website. You can do what first did, go on LinkedIn. Right. right? And, and you can see all of the openings. So... They don't have to go through staffing agencies. Staffing agencies actually hate it when, when people go to the open market because then they don't get the opportunity to actually get the 30% just for calling up LinkedIn people and spending less than an hour on this. So just saying. He, 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 he's talking out of his ass. He has no idea what he's talking about here despite the fact that he's allegedly been working with the government for almost 10 years. He knows nothing about it. So I, I guess I'm a little bit unclear here. So the government has these criteria in place and these processes to ensure that vendors are qualified. And the way that vendors can get around that is by instead of working directly for the government, they could work for another vendor that is a qualified vendor. Is that correct? That's correct. So, so what I'm saying is that every person that right now currently can't go direct, any firm that currently can't go direct to the federal government has the opportunity to. There's a, there's a process they can follow to become a qualified vendor. Some people, the people who typically go through uh, firms like myself are either the ones that uh, don't already immediately have the qualifications to do so or are just choosing not to. And then the other ones are independents that would not need to. In your view, is the government's internal IT capacity a constraint on directly procuring IT services? Absolutely. I think it's In a combination of things. Yeah. In 2013, the federal government um, reduced the IT capacity significantly through cuts to internal IT departments. Uh, do you see that as contributing to the situation that you've described? Don't make a political. I, I can't. Sorry, I can't comment on that. But uh, I mean, well, you've been you've been working in this line of work for the government since 2007. Uh, yeah. When when those cuts happened in 2013. Um, did that contribute to the situation that we see now where uh, there's a reliance on these IT recruitment agencies to compile the vendors that are required to complete projects? I can't, sorry, I, I can't speculate on the whole industry. Apologies for that. Thanks, Mr. Backrock. We'll go to Mr. Genoas, please, for five, and then uh, Ms. Atwin. <sighs> um. Love it how they always have to bring it back to it was Harper's fault. Um, or it was the pandemic, it was unprecedented times. Yes, yes <laughs> that's the other one. <laughs> uh, the Arctic Gamer 59 with a two dollar super chat. Oh, damn, Walter White is involved in this. Yeah, yeah, something's gonna happen. Stuff's going down, and he's gonna cook up something in his trailer. But, um, I, that was actually a softball question for him. But I think he was afraid of the conservatives, which is why he actually didn't answer that. So that's that's very interesting. Uh, Mr. Firth, I want to circle back on some numbers that we discussed in my last round. You told this committee uh, that you and your partner put in about 30 to 40 hours per month over two years uh, and that your take home at the end of, of the whole arrive can process uh, was $2.5 million. Uh, now, um, uh, I, I think your figures understate the reality of how much you made. Your invoices don't line up with your own figures, and your figures don't match the Auditor General's. Um, so I, I think the realities are, are understated by your numbers. But even if we take at face value your numbers, so doing that math, say 40 hours 
uh, over two per month over two years, leading to 2.5 million take home. Uh, that would measure out that you earned about $2,600 per hour. Uh, so, sir, how do you justify to taxpayers that you as a recruiter were effectively billing them at over $2,500 per hour for your involvement in the Arrive Can app? You have to look more about the fact that this, that this is not an hourly hourly job. I mean, it says 30 to 40. I can be working in the evenings. I can be working in the daytimes. I can be working on the so? weekends. Like, you must appreciate like, there's a lot more that goes into just getting a set. This is not an hourly job, first of all. And but, of course, sir, but I, I, I asked you the numbers, right? I, I just asked you to tell us how many hours. Uh, and I did a simple calculation based on your estimates. Uh, so, okay, maybe maybe you, you work on weekends, so you think your weekend rate is $5,000 an hour and your weekly week time rate is only $1,000 an hour. The point is, I just did the math based on your, I think respectfully, lowball numbers, uh, and they come out to $2,600 per hour. Uh, do you think for Canadians that are struggling uh, under the, the burden of, of taxation and, and other challenges that they face in terms of uh, affordability and cost of living, uh, do you think you can really justify to them uh, that you, uh, who was recruiting other people to do IT work, uh, were billing at $2,600 an hour? For the record, this is an impossible trap question. Just saying, um, there's there's no good answer that he can come come to here. the The best thing that he should be um, uh, saying here is is I I can't quantify what the Canadian taxpayer feels is value for money. That's basically what he should say. It's a crap answer, but it's the only answer in my opinion that he should be giving. Now, this isn't a legal question, so the, the lawyer actually isn't going to be probably jumping in here. This is just a reputation perception question. So. First of all, I don't, I don't make this decision. The government obviously is value in what myself and my firms and firms like us do. So I can't comment on what my hourly wages. I can just comment on the fact that we've had 55 contracts prior to these ones at CBSA where the government seen value in everything we do. So right, sir. I, 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 I actually think you make a fair, fair point there. This this is a question that I should be asking to the government. Uh, if if uh, if they're paying you at this rate, uh, wh why are they doing it? And and these are questions that I think we we need answers to. Mm -hmm. uh, sir, I want to ask you about Dalian's role in this deal. We found out some very striking things about about Dalian uh, recently. Um, what, as far as you were able to see, what did they do? for the $7.9 million that they purportedly got uh, for their involvement in ArriveCan? I don't know. I'm sorry, I had no interactions with during yeah, ArriveCan. They had their own contract and I had my own. I didn't have any interactions. Did with you them. have any discussions with them before or after the bid? No, not at all. They were not part of my, the, they were not part of any of the three. You're, you're, you're telling us you never discussed or the ArriveCan work with Dalian. Um, oh, no. Oh, you did discuss sorry, it. Sorry, go ahead. Did you or didn't you? Oh, well, there was. We've spoken about mobile application where we've never spoken about contracts, never spoken about ArriveCan specific. It may have been mobile work, did, sir, mobile applications. Did, did you or did you not have discussions with Dalian about the ArriveCan project, the contracts, the work that was done, anything to do with ArriveCan? We'd have had conversations, but way after the contracts were awarded. This was nothing to do with back and forth before any contract. Okay, so do you, do, you know what, do you know what they actually did? I, I, I was not part of their contract. I was not, I was not working with them. Like they were completely siloed doing their work and I was siloed doing my work. They were oh my God. Dude. The glasses are off, you, but they're not being thrown. You were asked. <laughs> what did they do? I don't know. So you never discussed Arrive Can with them? Oh, well, I did. Okay, so then, then the problem is, is Firth is trying to guess where Genesis is going. And... First thinks that Genesis is trying to trap him in a monetary dollar contract question, which that's not what Genesis is, is actually trying to do. What Genesis is trying to get first to say is what did Dalian do for the money that they were given? And the answer is Dalian didn't do anything. They didn't do crap. 
Now, the problem is, is first says, oh, yeah, we did, we did, we did discuss it, but, you know, much, much later. And, and Genesis is like, fine. So you discussed it. What did they do? Well, I was involved in their contract. Like, you want to, like, reach through the screen and strangle this guy. But, 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 you, had, you, you, had, but you had conversations with them, maybe, maybe not, but after the fact. We, we never had conversations prior to a right hand contract awards. We, okay. we speak. Sir, the, the, I have one more question. This is respectfully getting nowhere. Um, my, my, my colleague asked you uh, that the Auditor General found that GC Strategies were involved in the development of a contract from the Government of Canada valued at $2.5 million for your firm received in May 2022, that you were involved in the development of that contract. Could you please tell us, sir, who did you communicate with the Government of Canada uh, in, uh, in, for the contract received in May 2022. Uh, we want the names, and I would ask you to answer that question. I would ask the chair uh, to put that question to you on behalf of the committee and insist on an answer. Well, now that he knows how to answer, he's going to answer it the proper way because Kelly actually gave him a note on that one. Thank you to Jarja with the $2 super chat. It says backtrack, backrack. That <laughs> is a tongue twister. <laughs> there you go. And we have Spawny420 with a $4.20 super chat. It says, I'm not nearly high enough for this puff, puff, pass. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. And an answer right now. Are you clear on the question, Mr. Firth? No, I am. And again, I'm standing strong with what I've said before. This is being pushed by the committee to put all these allegations up against me and my firm to the RCMP. And at this point, if there's an ongoing investigation, I'm not prepared to comment on it right yeah, now. Just, just, just on a point of order, what, what you think my motivations are for asking the question uh, are, is not at all germane. I'd like, I'd like the chair to put the question to you, and you have an obligation uh, to answer it, whether you want to or not, because of the rules uh, that, that apply uh, to Parliament, to its committees, and to witnesses who come before it. So, Mr. Chair, could you yeah. put that question? Mr. And Mr. On the Firth, we would appreciate an answer, and the fact that you've stated yourself you have not been or GC or your partner have not been contacted by the RCMP, leads me to believe perhaps they're not going down that path with you. So I think the committee and taxpayers would appreciate a, uh, a response to uh, Mr. Genuas. Yeah, so this is where first in a pickle. So if he's legit trying to say that the RCMP has not contacted me about this, Let's let's say he's let's say he's he's telling the truth. Um, he th there is no argument. Yeah, how can he say, "Oh, I'm worried about uh, jeopardizing"? Yeah, jeopardizing this investigation. But you don't you don't know what has been provided to the RCMP. You can't know what's been provided to the RCMP, and you're not part of the RCMP investigation as of right now. So you can't be interfering in that. And you don't even, you don't know what the RCMP is. Now, it's different. If the RCMP had contacted him, he could be refusing to answer all these questions and he would be legally justified to do that. But, sorry, you can't just assume that this is going to be interfering with an RCMP investigation and then refuse to answer. So, that's going to be a problem. Appreciate the, the question there, Chair, but the, the truth is, I mean... What's being reported on Twitter, and as a result of some things that are said here in this committee, and the fact that they was pushed by every, well, most of the committee members, but with everybody that's coming forth of this, to push all information to the RCMP, I have to assume that that actually is happening. And even PSPC and the Auditor General have said they've moved their information over there. Right, but uh, and again, and, and I'm sorry to interfere, Mr. Genwes, or intervene, but you've stated yourself they haven't started anything with GC. I'd hate to ask for not be able to get to any responses based on a supposition that they may one day. I think it's a fair question. Would you please provide an answer? Mm. Chair has directed the witness to answer. Good. If he refuses to answer, he's in contempt, he's in of, contempt parliament. of parliament. Would you mind if I just take two seconds of my lawyer, please? Of course. Uh, just turn off your mic, please. Uh, colleagues, uh, we were... Sorry, Mr. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Firth. Sorry, thank you. Uh, again, I really appreciate the opportunity, Chair, that you've laid it out clearly, but at this point, we're still remaining up with our stance of there possibly being a pending RCMP investigation. 
I will. Um, I will advise you, as I'm sure you're aware, you do have parliamentary privilege, which would uh, allow you the right to speak. But I understand. Um, I'll let the, my colleagues who brought up the question pursue it a different way. Uh, we have uh, Miss Atwin for five, and then we will sus we will take our second suspension. Go ahead, Miss or Miss Atwin, please. So if you didn't hear, Jen just said this is contempt. Yeah. He's right. And he's absolutely right. It is contempt to refuse to answer a question. And uh, I'm assuming his lawyer has made a calculation that, um, and he's probably told him, well, contempt isn't going to do much for you. Like, it's not going to do anything to you. Well, it's not a criminal charge. Right. So take the contempt of parliament and stand firm on that. And no doubt... <laughs> the discussion with the lawyer he just he just shook his head so uh nick with a 2799 super chat i'm an hour behind congrats on your call out i'm shaking my head at this man's nonsense well uh, i know i know you probably can't hear me yet because <laughs> yeah, i'm an hour ahead of you but just wait <laughs> <laughs> and now i will say i hope your head is not going to fall off your head now that you've caught up to what i've said thank you mr chair um, Mr. Firth, in my previous questions, I, I, I asked about um, the government tracking your performance, and you mentioned <clears throat> that there were quarterly reports. Um, have you previously been asked to present these to committee? No, I have not. Could you please do so? I'd, I'd be interested in yep. seeing those. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> also, you mentioned um, not being fully aware of what the allegations um, of Bottler AI um, against you. Um, and just from what we've had from their testimony, if they're alleging issues around invoicing, delays in payments, deliverables of the project not reflecting the actual work they did, um, the inflated uh, work experience on the CB, which they assert are all against basic procurement rules. Um, I know you don't want to speak specifically to those allegations because there's potentially the, <clears throat> the pending investigation, but have you ever... Yeah, we're going to skip this. And I'm just reading here on the rcommons.ca website um, what a contempt of parliament means. Like, what's the punishment? And it just kind of says, like, the finding of contempt is in and of itself a very serious sanction. It doesn't seem like they actually follow through with anything beyond that, um, at least not in parliament's history from what I can see. Well, one thing it could do, it, it could disqualify him from future contracts. Yeah, that's a possibility. So uh, he may, you know, I have a feeling that uh, he's never going to get a government contract ever again, um, no matter what organization he works with. It does say, however, that the power of the house to imprison remains. Um, it is difficult to foresee circumstances arising that would oblige the house to invoke it. Well, maybe there's a case here. We'll there you see. go. Dans quel secteur? In what particular sector or sectors? Sorry, apologies, I missed the last one. Okay, well, what kind of activities are they involved in? Oh, criminal IT, oh, the private companies. Mm -hmm. There are IT software firms. They are um, system integrators. Parlons maintenant de la qualité de votre... Let's now talk about the quality of your work with uh, Arrive Can. What are your thoughts about the final product with all the ups and downs, the vicissitudes uh, that uh, Canadians had to come to grips with uh, throughout this application and its process? I think understanding the, the circumstances where the whole of Canada and the whole of the world was in um, and the fact that this went through 170 renditions and they were delivered always on time, I think our work was... Was, was was very was, was done very well I, I feel like the application was a success um, I believe okay. it was 260 I believe the application was a success we had 200 I think 260 million times the success. App was open I, a success you're, you're you're saying that your application was a success you're serious now right <laughs> <laughs> I like this guy <laughs> Uh, shots fired by Deltel. Oh, beautiful. Wee. Well, yeah, because you. This is a sixty million dollar app 
costing to the taxpayers and in, in falsely imprisoned 10,000 Canadians. Success. Wow. Wow, folks. So clearly, you know, I think our definition is different than his definition from success. Sounds like it. Nilik with a two large super chat. His lawyer has probably gone from panic to packing up. Can you imagine? <laughs> you just see like some guy crossing in front of the camera. All right, like, I'm out. I'm out of yep. here. <laughs> I think I think it did exactly what it was supposed to. It was to oh, help I... open the borders. It was helped to streamline the process. It was to be a low touch um, application. I think if we look at those, you know, it was always there was a moving target. There was P P hack was sending out new policies every month Hello. or so. Okay, Mr. Firth, qu'est-ce que vous avez à dire? Oui? Mr. Firth, what do you have to say to the over 10,000 people who have joined a class action lawsuit because your app led them to have be subjected to a quarantine that they weren't supposed to be subjected to? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's very unfortunate for those 10,000 people, but I cannot comment on things that happen within the application. Pardon? I provide the resource in the... What? What? Wait a minute. No. What? No, you, you don't get to say that. Well, because he was the one contracted for it. it it's under his accountability, correct? Well... Oh, they changed their website. Oh, did uh, they take it off? They were still boasting about ArriveCan until very recently oh, wait on minute, their here website. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, are here. they still boasting about ArriveCan on their oh, website? Oh yeah, during the COVID pandemic. Here we go, folks. Here, let, let's let me toss just, this on the screen. Let's just you know show you this. Here we go. During the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic, we were asked to partner with Canada Border Services Agency, Health Canada, and Public Health Agency of Canada to work together on this interdepartmental initiative to build a tool which will allow for contact tracing, the tracking and monitoring of individuals crossing the border into Canada, and also allow Canadians to submit required declarations digitally to reduce human contact. So, um, there's oh, <laughs> no more video for the Arrive Can app, but you know they're saying this is ours. Look this at what ours. we made. We're so proud of it. But now you're saying, oh, well, you know, it's 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 not our app. You know, we may have made it, but, you know, <laughs> it's not our responsibility that, that our app, you know, was a piece of garbage. The Excalibur 45 with the 279 Super Chat, it says it was a success to his wallet. Yeah, yeah it his, was. His and and it was to the it. detriment of Canadian taxpayers. But that was that's a terrible answer. Was it? Hold on a sec. Hold, hold on a sec. <laughs> you said that it was a success. And yet, thousands of Canadians were affected in this way. Over 10,000 Canadians have filed a class action against your app because your app led to a quarantine that they should never have been subjected to. So why are you washing your hands of this and passing the buck? Ooh. I'm sorry, I really have no comment on this. That's not my line of expertise. What? Also, now he's not an IT expert. What? Wow. This guy's unbelievable. Wait a minute. So he's an, he's an expert enough to say, this is how much it should have cost. But now that you know he's being cornered and your app was a piece of garbage and there's... Like, it put all of these people into quarantine when they shouldn't have been there. Now it's, oh, well, that's not my expertise. How convenient. And you wonder why you're getting hate mail from people. Thank you. Yeah. Incredible. Un unbelievable. If it's not your bailiwick or expertise, whose is it? If it's not yours. We were not involved in the architecture. You understand this, this project was, was derived and, and project managed by the CBSA. My God. <laughs> How are you going to tell these over 10,000 people that you raked in profits of millions of dollars with this application? Is it really worth $2.5 million in uh, windfalls? We're talking about 10,000 people who were quarantined that never should have been because of your app. Right? And this is the problem. This is the issue that he's in. He's just like, 
well, well, you know, I didn't do any of that work. Like, it's nothing to do with me. Then why were you paid? Well, that's it. Again, wants all the dollars, but none of the accountability. Yeah, none of the responsibility whatsoever. Are we sure that Christian Firth isn't part of the Liberal Party? Right. Maybe he's running for a candidate. Uh, Daniel, two seven, uh, with the 279 Super Chat, if that was a success, imagine a failure. Yikes. Right. I like Del Tell, man. He asks good questions. That's, sorry, can you repeat? My headphones just broke. Oh, yeah. Vous avez affirmé tantôt. Listen, you asserted earlier that you made a profit of $2.5 million. That's, uh, those are your figures. We know that the AG doesn't think uh, so. Well, but we'll take what you said at face value. That's $2.5 million for 40 hours per month. You've made a profit of $2.5 million for this app. And yet I'm telling you that there are 10,200 Canadians that were subject to quarantine when they shouldn't have been because of your app, because that is what has occurred, and you're saying that it was a success. Was it really worth $2.5 million profit, to that kind of success story? Uh, like I said previously, I, I don't make that decision. The government obviously sees value in what we do. That's why we were working there for three years. Alors, c'est qui le respond? So, where does the buck stop if it doesn't stop with you? Again, uh, I did not make the decision. The government sees value in what we do. We were not part of architecting this application. Thank you very much, uh, sir. Over to you, uh, Mr. Jawari, please, for five. Holy moly. Yeah, you want people to feel pity for you. Like, oh, you know, I, 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 I walk around thinking like I'm, you know, the cat's ass with my millions of dollars of Canadians' money. But, um, hey, <laughs> it's not our fault we did a crappy job. It's the government's. They, always, they obviously like us. So, you know, nothing to do with me. This is insane. I think Diane Sylvain says it right. Deltel is the francophone Brock. Yes. Yeah. The Franken Brock. <laughs> uh, uh, Reapy Cheap with a $10 super chat. I say house arrest with Bernardo at JT's cottage for this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I hope that isn't too offside. No, I think that's pretty good. Um, Peter G with a $5 super chat. I would love to see what Deltel Brock and uh, the, I don't remember the other P, uh, MP would. Uh, would be liking in committee together. Oh, probably oh, Cooper. Cooper. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting to see. That would be awesome. I'd pay to see that. In the meantime, I'm going to skip Jawari. Stand by. Ones which are open for competitive processes about 15 15 percent 15 okay thank um, you i'm sure sorry, that's how much time. okay yeah <laughs> a couple of seconds pass thanks uh mrs vignola for two and a half please uh merci beaucoup. thank you very much mr firth i had a question earlier about the daily and invoices and you confirmed the name of the individual Mr. Ms. Husbith, CBSA. Now, should it be my understanding that that individual was working for you as a subcontractor and at the same time was wearing another hat working for CBSA during the same period? I think he was working for me as a subcontractor to CBSA. It's the same thing. Okay, donc il travaillait comme sous-contractant. So he was a subcontractor for CBSA as the same time as being a subcontractor for you in relation to matters concerning CBSA? Is that correct? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the question. Okay. Donc, je vais essayer... I'll try and sum up what I was trying to say. The invoice that we saw was Dalian. Well, not an invoice per se, but a bank transfer 
there's a bank transfer to you for Hoodsmith CBSA. So Dalian had received a contract from CBSA and the payment, uh, referring to Butler AI, of course, but the payment for Mr Hoodsmith went th th through you. But at the same time, Mr Hoodsmith was a C subcontractor for CBSA. So do you understand the line in the sand that I'm trying to make? Because he was wearing two hats. He was a subcontractor in two places and yet for the same department at the same time. Yeah, sorry, without having that information in front of me, it doesn't seem possible because CBSA has a rule where you can only be on one task or authorization. That's, so that's how to, to eliminate that from happening, that you can only be on one task authorization at the same time. Um, the only thing I could think of that could have happened was maybe there's a delay in billing, but again, and CBSA are pretty good. They, they make sure that there's only ever one person, their names on one task authorization. No. Yeah, well, <laughs> here's the thing. They probably had Dalian on on the task authorization, and then they subcontracted to whoever they like, which was GC Strategies, and then to this person. And then this person had their own task authorization in which they were named. That's what Vignoli is saying. You dork. <laughs> so, um, I just, uh, Fox and I were taking a look at uh, some of the chat. Um, do we need to go back to Juari? Because I, I saw that uh, there was some concern over, over skipping. So I think uh, Rebecca had brought that up. If, uh, if, if we need to go back to Juari, I'm happy to go back to Juari if there's some good content there that we... Uh, that we need to talk about. Um, in the meantime, I'll read this super chat from Daniel. It says, uh, I'm not responsible, but thank you for the money. Yeah, pretty much. So, one more thing to check. That individual was thereafter transferred to the Public Health Agency of Canada. <laughs> so there was a transfer that occurred. But and who who was working for public health at that time, everybody? Cameron McDonald. That was only uh, by way of chance. Correct, please, for two and a half, sir. There we go. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Firth, I'd like to go back to this issue of security clearances and the Office of the Ombud found that GC Strategies did not meet the document safeguarding capability at the time it was awarded the $13.9 million non-competitive uh, contract for professional services with CBSA. When did you find out that you did not meet the security clearance for that contract? Uh, we were told, uh, I think it was from the the amendment was made at the contract 13 months after it was awarded. So 13 months into the contract, you were notified that you did not meet the security clearance? We were notified that they were removing that prerequisite because it wasn't necessary. And how, who notified you of that? I'll, I'll have to speak to my business partner. He gets all of the security information. And did you uh, communicate to them about the security clearance prior to that? Uh, no, nope, this is just, it was a, there was a component within the RFP that was not directed towards the vendor. It was, it was just something, and it was an amendment that was removed after the fact. It, it just seems that like going back to your previous point or your previous testimony about why the government would rely on your company. Uh, one of the reasons is because other companies don't uh, necessarily meet the pre-qualifications to engage in these government contracts. And yet here's a case where your company didn't meet the qualifications for this con for this contract and the way that the government found a way around it was simply by removing that requirement. Um, did they sorry, express, my, yeah, did sorry, they express my understanding why is, they removed the, the requirement? No, so sorry, my, my understanding is that at the point of contract award, uh, it isn't determined whether or not the con they have to have this certain document safeguarding. It's only after the fact, once their the project has got going, they decide to, to remove it or not. We're, we're dealing with invoices. We're not dealing with protected information. That was the, the determination after the fact was we were not required to have that. No, 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 no. You know, you don't get to explain this one, Abe, for, for Firthy Boy. Part of the contract was that you needed to have this security requirement. It doesn't matter if 13 months later it was decided that you actually didn't. 
The point is, is that you were given a contract with a security clearance requirement and you didn't have it. That's the point. It doesn't matter if someone made a decision later that actually, you know what, that's not a requirement. It doesn't matter. You should never have been awarded the contract in the first place. That's the point. And you can, you can try and skirt around this all you want. But, you know, you saying, well, you know, we were just dealing with... It doesn't matter. Like, you could have been dealing with, you know, crayon drawings. If somebody put the put the, that as a requirement on the contract, doesn't matter if, if it was relevant or not, the requirement's there. So you can't just say, oh, well, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a real requirement. You don't get to make that determination. Diane Savane with the $20 Super Chat. So we have learned a lot about First Character, and just like being in the Mafia, he would do anything for money. He has no conscience. The RCMP need to get a wiretap warrant for Firth and hear Firth in his chalet, or his cottage, or his cabin, or whatever residence, like in his latrine for all I care. <laughs> but uh, I, I agree, Diane. Like we have learned so much here, and he cries victim whenever he can. But then he sits there and he starts smirking about the fact that there's ten thousand two hundred Canadians that are in a class action lawsuit because the app that he was central in putting together via his quote unquote skilled labor at at finding resources to actually build this thing, it didn't work. But you know, he doesn't strike me as like the evil criminal genius type. He he strikes me as like the bottom rung bumbling buffoon type yeah who, th who who thinks he's smarter than he actually is at all but at the time you signed the contract you were required to have it is that correct that's right that's the rfp says that's what the rfp says and yet uh cbsa did not flag that requirement with you when they signed the contract but again this is, if i would just if you would let me quote just what the psbc was a much more experienced than this than i am they said, PSBC clarified that a distinction needed to be made between a security clearance of an organization or a staff member and the capacity requested by an organization. It is not necessary for an organization to have the capacity at the time of contract award. It is normal that a contract be awarded without the capacity, which is us, being pre-verified by contract security. Otherwise, there has to be an amendment to withdraw that requirement as it was not necessary, which is what happened for this contract. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Barrett, please, for five. Is a significant part... Sorry, what he's trying to say in that language that he's relying on from PSPC is that he's trying to say that it's not necessary that the, the, the company actually have a security clearance at the time they're awarded the contract, and it can be removed if it's not necessary via an amendment. And he's saying, which is what happened 13 months later. That, that doesn't make any sense. If it was in the RFP, then you're supposed to have the clearance. Like, sorry. Either, either it's a crappy government process or somebody at CBSA didn't care. And I'm going to go with both. Part of your job uh, contacting and communicating with government, uh, their departments, agencies, or crown corporations? Yes, yes, it is. And how many hours per month would you say that uh, you spend on that? Um, it, it's hard to quantify that because if we're busy with existing contracts, then there's contract management and other components versus new business development interactions and identifying new opportunities let's look for a number you, you can use you and your partner combined mr anthony how many how many hours per month i i sorry i can answer that honestly accurately sir is it uh more than 80. yes per month for sure more than 80 per month okay is, is it more than 100. I, I, I can't quantify. I'm just giving you an answer of 80. More than 80. So uh, do you also proactive, that includes proactively making the government aware of the services uh, that you offer? Again, sorry, it depends. It depends on whether or not we are. With the Rive Cam, there was not 80 hours of meeting and proposing and getting new business because we were managing 100 resources at that time. Are you registered? So it varies. Are you registered to lobby? 
No, I'm not because we do not charge a fee. As an owner of a GC Strategies, you obviously have control over your company's website. Um, you were here 16 months ago as part of the Arrive scam inquiry, and I asked you in October 2022 to provide names of senior government officials that offer glowing endorsements for you on your website. I want to read some of those uh, because um, uh, you haven't had a chance over the last 16 months, I guess, to furnish us with that information. Um, here's one for you. I think they are first and foremost are a taxpayer. Um, they, GC Strategy, see the bigger picture and do not chase the quick sale. I think they are first and foremost are a taxpayer and see efficiency and getting the best value for government. That's the chief data officer of the public sector. Who, who was that? What's their name? So first of all, apologies for not getting that information to you. I, I thought I had. I mean, I sent hundreds of pages at that day, and I'm more than happy to give you that information in writing. <laughs> okay, like, <laughs> let's be serious, sir. Uh, you've had 16 months, and so you believe you, you want us to believe that you're going to provide us with that information now that you've been asked again. Um, wow. I, I wasn't looking up at your screen, and... I legit thought that was you laughing. I didn't realize it was nope, Barrett. That was Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was an uncontrollable. Yeah. Well, you know, again, these guys have sat in committee for hours upon hours upon hours interviewing all these witnesses. Like the BS that they have seen. Like, I really do feel bad for these MPs. Like, the conservatives must be feeling this right now. Uh, what the hell is going on? Like, <laughs> like it's just it must be so frustrating <laughs> this this is this is this is crazy this is just crazy uh George for the five dollar super chat how does this guy go from a failed car detailing salesman in 2004 to making twenty six hundred dollars an hour to do nothing what i wouldn't give for that career mobility well, have you I, tried crime have you tried fraud <laughs> yeah yeah um and k bradley mason uh mason with a two dollar super chat uh latrine wiretap is gonna be sloppy for days oh Gross, dude. <laughs> man i wonder um, i wonder who you must piss off to actually do latrine wiretrap duty i really wonder or piss on and uh and then who has to listen to that let's yeah. not go there Glenn Stewart with a two dollar super chat. In my opinion, he is a snake and and uh, jailed. Yeah, well, he's he's going to be. Government of Canada senior executive said, "Quote: GC Strategies, listen and try to find solutions to my problem versus selling me a solution to a problem I've never had." Who was that person? So I'm sorry. You can ask me the three or four that are on there, and my answer is going to be the same. I will get you that information. I promise you that. I I thought I'd sent it over sixteen months let, ago. Let me be very clear that in the Arrive scam, there are all kinds of players who play all kinds of different roles, and you've demonstrated yourself to be a liar. You've lied before a parliamentary committee on multiple occasions. You even undertook to provide to me the, this information 16 months ago. You and I had this exchange, and now you're here, and the only reason you came was because you were threatened to be arrested, and you've, you've come uh, uh, virtually, and uh, and now your undertaking is to provide the information you promise cross your heart that you're going to do it this time, but you couldn't do it before. Uh, it's, it, it strains reason and certainly demonstrates that um, you, know, you don't have any credibility when it comes to the questions that we ask, and w which leaves me to wonder what I should even bother asking you because I can't believe anything that you're going to say. Like... This is crazy that Barrett is just like throwing this at him. I've never, ever seen this before. Ever. And we've seen, listen, we've seen Justin Trudeau's brother in committee. Yeah, that was painful. He's such a bad liar. And the only, and, and, and we've also seen, oh, what's his face? Um... Darn it! I'm forgetting his name. Um, What's he do? He was the guy that the, that did the election report. Um, Hello? No. no. Oh shoot! Oh, there goes my memory. It was last year that we did this. He had a beard, and, and and it was the guy that Brock went after, and he said, "Canadians don't believe you, sir." 
Oh, I know what he looks something like Berg, in my head. Something Berg. Anyway, whatever. Rosenberg? Rosenberg. I think that's his name. Uh, Morris Rosenberg. That's, that's exactly it. That's um, it. Anyway, so, like, I, uh, but that was it. Brock, Brock said, nobody believes you. Canadians don't believe you, sir. And then, you know, people were getting up in arms about that. Notice the liberals are being dead quiet. Yeah, I think they want to try to um, avoid calling attention, any more attention to their protests. Oh, yeah. When it comes to Arrive Can, they are, they are just, they are being dead quiet. I think they know this is going to be the one that takes them down. Yeah, and I think they're just w- hoping that this goes as long as possible. So, but I've never, I've never seen the credibility of a witness be be talked about openly and so brazenly before. This is insane. Will you provide us with those names right now? You obviously know, you obviously know who the VP of a major crown corporation was who appears on your website. The chief information officer for the government of Canada. What was the name? That would be Mark Brilliard, everybody. You know. You know. I said previously, I will, I will give you, you these information. No, sir. No, sir. I do not accept that. Per, you will provide this committee with a name. You told us 16 months. You've had, I, you've I had 16 months. You've had 16 months to do it. And this is your opportunity now to demonstrate that you are true to your word. So are you, are you going to make that demonstration or are you going to prove uh, what we know to be true? And that's that you're not honest. Like I said, I appreciate the question. I will give you the answers. Yeah, your appreciation for the question isn't the reason that I asked it. I'm looking for. <laughs> Again, I'm looking. I'm, the lo- I'm looking for the information. I said I would give you the information. Yeah, you also said that 16 months ago, sir. It is uh, not just contempt of of Parliament, but it's contemptuous to Canadians. They are lined up at food banks in record numbers, and you are raking in millions of dollars off the backs of. Canadians, and then when you're called to provide even just the smallest bit of accountability, you you laugh in Canadians' face, and it's um, it's it's disgusting to be clear. And um, and well, we'll see if you do in fact provide those names finally this time. But after 16 months, um, I certainly don't believe you, and neither can Canadians. Thanks. That is our time. Mr. Uh, Berth, you're welcome to offer a quick response. Otherwise, we'll go to Mr. Kismuchuk. Mr. Berth, did you want to respond to that? Okay. Mr. Uh, Kismuchuk, please. The floor is yours for five minutes, sir. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if he could hear me, I would be standing up and giving Mr. Barrett a standing ovation. Um, Yeah, that was that was a great line of questioning. I mean, he just he didn't stop. Well, because honestly, he's saying what everybody is screaming at the screen at home. Right? Everyone is just utterly disgusted with this human being. I feel bad for his family. I don't feel bad for him. Nobody feels bad for Firth. Oh, well, you know, I've gotten hate mail. Suck it up, buttercup. I guess you shouldn't rip off millions of Canadians. Yeah, and then you laugh when you're being asked to provide this stuff. Like, you want to do work for the government? Guess what? You have to be accountable. And that's it. And the fact that you're just saying, oh, you know, I'm I'm just the guy who got paid. I don't have any skin in this game. Then why did you get paid? Oh, well, you know, the, the government obviously, you know, thinks they, we have value. Otherwise, they wouldn't keep coming back to us. Uh-huh. I still maintain that, that McDonald was getting kickbacks from this. Because, again, the question was asked, what was in this for McDonald? Oh, nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. <laughs> Give me a break. Hunter with a $10 super chat. This guy won't get another job anywhere in Canada after this malarkey. He is clearly lying about 90% of the things he's saying. His career has made a short drop and a sudden stop. There you go. Uh, Daniel with a 279 super chat. Is first related to Forrest Gump? Forrest Gump was at least honest. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not insult Mr. Gump. There you go. <laughs> oh, okay, Chris Mirchuk. Here we go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I will have a motion uh, before the um, that I'd like to put forward as well before my time expires, Mr. Chair, so if you can what? give me a heads up so that I can put a motion forward. Um, 
the, I'm trapped. I'm uh, sorry. Are you are you intending just to read it into the record, or are you uh, putting it as a matter of hand motion? Matter of hand. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Uh, so, um, the Auditor General. I mean, so GC Strategies is is essentially a staffing uh, IT agency, and and uh, the Auditor General noted uh, the differences between the the per diem costs of a. Uh, of a staff of a private staffing agency versus a, a public uh, someone that works in the public service in the IT sector, and, and so the per diem cost uh, that the AG uh, noted was about a thousand ninety dollars for a staffing agency uh, versus the per diem cost for a public sector IT professional, which is about six hundred and seventy five uh, dollars. It's almost double. It. It, um, it's reflective as well of what we're seeing, for example, we hear a lot in the news these days about private nursing staffing agencies. And so, for example, a regular uh, RN, a uh, registered nurse working for a public hospital, for example, will make about $40 an hour, uh, whereas a private staffing agency, a private staffing nurse uh, will typically typically make about 90 to $100 per hour, and in some instances, $160 per hour. So what we're seeing in, in the IT sector is, is also what we're seeing in, in the, uh, in, you know, when it comes to nursing and healthcare and other sectors as well too. Can you tell us why is there such an increase uh, in, uh, in the cost of contracts for uh, private sector staffing agencies like, like GC Strategies or nurses in the case of nursing. If you can sort of highlight or, or uh, enlighten us, why such an increase? Um, well, the one that comes to mind is, is just the type of work these, these resources will be doing. Um, you know, when the private sector, whether it's Shopify or whatever, it, it's more innovative technology and more innovative solutions. And whereas in the public sector, you're, you're dealing with more of a mainframe system or more older backend systems. Uh, um, and sometimes outdated technology as well. So I think just the the private sector can charge more. I think because they're going back to 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 companies which are either paying more because they just know that they're trying to get a specific skill set with because the, they're always advancing technology. And there's probably only 20, 30 people or 50 people can do that versus 70 or 80 or 100 or 300 people who can do Java or .NET or more of an established technology. And, and Mr. Firth, where where is the top talent migrating to? The public sector or the private sector when it comes to IT? Private. Private sector. Uh, is it is it even close? No, it's not close. Can you talk to us a little bit about that for those? Well, hello. How many private sector companies are there? Lots. How many governments are there? Not many. One. <sighs> Too many. <laughs> what a stupid question. Like, sure, you have, like, cities, and you have, like, <laughs> yeah, but uh, like the, the town of Lindsay, Ontario, they're not going to have IT professionals. No, but look what just happened tr in Toronto with their, their systems. Their public library got shut down recently with a ransomware uh, attack. Yeah. You know, like, so there's people working there, but again, as they said in the video, it's it's working old systems and, and probably people that have been there forever and aren't doing continuing education to keep up on the latest technology. Right, because they don't need to. Because because their jobs are secure. Yeah, Like exactly. the city's not gonna fire them. I mean, after that ransomware attack, they probably got fired. Exactly. But Here's the other question. What's the big, biggest difference between public and private? Unions. There's hardly any, any unionized employees in in like private uh private organizations especially when it comes to it most of them are non-unionized every every public sector workforce is unionized craig robertson with a two dollar super chat is he afraid to say the names in public threats yeah i think a he's afraid to say the names in public for fear of retribution and, and people throwing dirt and uh, and two um, I think he's afraid to say the name of the public so that everybody will know who gave the name if he gives it behind the scenes you can say well that, that may have been Christian Mac or, or Cameron McDonald right so 
anyway. That aren't initiate, initiated in the IT world. Yeah, I mean, for example, we, we can have a, if you were to do side-by-side -side comparisons of uh, the same requirement with the same experience, um, people are going to want to work for, it sounds kind of like, they want to work for a private sector firm that has beanbags, that has all of these um, other perks that come working at a just job where I, I feel like there's, um, it's a harder sell to try to get somebody to come and work for a public sector. Public Salaries sector. are bigger in the private sector or the public sector? In the private. I mean, there used to be a desire to come and work for the government. You'd have your pension and so forth, whereas the problem is now the, the delta between the two are so that you can work in the private sector, save your money, and if you'd be in a better environment, and you'd also have just as much as if you had a pension. And, and you mentioned Veritech. You worked for Veritech, which is a company that was operating uh, long before 2015. Uh, I'm looking at they've received hundreds of millions of dollars yeah, in contracts from the Mr. previous Mr. Chair. Chair. We have about 45 seconds left, sir. Oh, okay, I will move to my motion then, uh, Mr. Thank Chair. You. I appreciate the uh, the heads up. Uh, so, you know, we heard a lot uh, of a, a discussion uh, today uh, about um, about vendors uh, or, uh, and suppliers coming together to design uh, the mandatory criteria. Um, and, and the concerns that were outlined by the Auditor General and, and by the um, Ombudsman that this might actually artificially reduce competition. I think competition here is something serious that we, uh, that we raised a number of times, uh, even today around this, around, this, uh, around this table. And so I think we do have a, a competition bureau commissioner uh, here, in, uh, uh, here in Canada. I'd, I'd like to hear from, uh, from Mr. Boswell, who's the Competition Bureau Commissioner. And the reason I say that is because it's the role of the Competition Bureau Commissioner uh, to, to ensure fair competition, to enforce uh, fair competition, but also the, the, the Competition Bureau Commissioner provides advice uh, to tendering agencies on how to protect uh, the process. How to... Are you serious? This is what you're going to do. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen, based on what Kazmierczyk has said so far, it sounds like they want to try to pivot this into a recent you know, to a recent piece of legislation that they put in for the freaking grocery stores. What? Bill C-56, granting greater powers to the Competition Bureau. So it sounds like what they're going to try and do is call the Competition Bureau in here and say, look, we're fixing it. And the only way we were able to fix uh, our RiveCan is with our legislation, Bill C-56. That's the most ridiculous thing I think I've ever heard. And, and that's saying a lot coming from this government. I see, I, like, that just, this is just what immediately comes to mind. And, and, and this seems like the way they're, the liberals are going to try and salvage to get out of the Arrive Can scandal. And I don't think it's going to work. But this, and maybe not, but th like, this is what comes to mind. protect the competitive process um, and as well I would add that that the Competition Bureau Commissioner also recently um, introduced or released what's called the collusion risk assessment tool so I think I think uh, the the Competition Bureau Commissioner uh, would provide some incredible light and information uh, on, on on securing and protecting competition in the procurement process and so my motion is that I would ask that the committee invite uh, the Competition Bureau Commissioner to appear for two hours on government procurement processes and address issues of competition, uh, fair bidding, uh, bid rigging, uh, and how uh, tendering authorities can protect the bid process, the competitive bid process itself. I think we would, I think we would uh, absolutely benefit from uh, speaking with the Competition Bureau Commissioner. Here's an idea. How about you don't have contractors creating their own contracts? Well, and here's the other thing. This isn't the time to bring this person in. Even if I agree that, that it's a good idea for them to come in, it's not the time for them to come in. 
Why? Because they're still trying to figure out what the hell went on, right? What the hell is going on? We don't have the answer to that question yet. So, th this guy to come in and, and look at government procurement processes? Well, this should be, th that should happen after, after you know what the hell is going on. Because then you have all the information and then you can say, okay, based on everything that we've seen, this is what we recommend. And why is the competition bureau guy, like, why was he not involved in the ombuds report? Because that's the procurement ombudsman. That's kind of what his job is, is to make sure procurement is, is running properly. So this is just, it's very bizarre. And whenever a liberal introduces a motion, it's very, very sketchy. Because you're like, what are you trying to do? Uh, thank you to Daniel with a 279 super chat. It says, my apologies to Forrest. I used <laughs> to feel sorry for the family. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Peter G with a $10 super chat. It says, I know for a fact that the public sector that I'm in, we just got a raise to be equal to the private sector for the same job. Until now, people were turned down the IT job. Thank you to Hunsford with a $10 super chat. It says he must be part of Trudeau's Reich since nothing is his responsibility outside of lining his pockets with our money. If this was any of us doing anything shady like this, we would already be locked up. Unfortunately true. And Ethereal Fox Productions with a six ninety nine dollars super chat. It says what's sickening about Firth is he hides behind his family in a feigned attempt to garner sympathy, a true craven indeed. Yeah, and again, we do feel sorry if his, his wife or his children are, are receiving unwanted attention or threats or anything like that. Um, but the way he is hiding behind them or using them as a shield is disgraceful. Uh, and thank you to Richard Hefner with a $5 super chat. It says, no responsibility since 2015. What changed in 2015? Hmm, I'm not sure. Why don't you guys tell us what changed in I 2015? Don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You know what happened in 2015? Emotional damage! That's what happened in 2015. Thanks. We'll start a speaking order, Mr. Genoas. Sure, I think there's unanimous support for this motion, and I don't want to take time away from our limited time for witness. So I think if you put the question now, you'll find there's unanimous support for this, and we can just move on. I think we were at that point before your intervention. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Colleagues, are we comfortable with that? Yes. We could actually maybe even uh, do it parallel to the red tape reduction or as part of the red tape reduction. But, uh, we seem to have uh, unanimous consent, so so adopted. Thank you, Mr. Kismirchak. I appreciate that. We're now going to uh, Mr. Baird, I believe, or Mr. Genuas. Mr. Genuas, please go ahead, sir. So based on that, and based on Mr. Genuas's reaction to that, I'm wondering if the the Conservatives and the NDP and the Bloc thought this was an attempt by the uh, the Liberals to create a filibuster. Yeah. That's a good point, because if there was disagreement, there would be debate. But if they're just like, yeah, let's do it, whatever, then then uh, the interview continues. And when you're debating a motion, you can talk for as long as you want. Yeah, and you can literally run out the clock until the chair says, okay, we don't have su staff support anymore. We're done. So see you later, everybody. Yeah, so they could have been like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. No problem. Let's go. <laughs> and again, this is a very safe motion to uh to adopt because they didn't say when right they didn't say when so they can adopt this motion and say sure let's bring him in and it's up to the chair when to invite him so good play good play by the conservatives just to get uh, uh get firth back into the crosshairs uh thank you uh mr firth how many current contracts do you have with the government of canada <laughs> zero we have zero contracts right now uh, okay, is is it not the case that you have one outstanding that ends at the end of March? No, nope. that was they, that was cancelled. The resources were pulled off the uh, pulled off the project. Okay, um, you and this is because you've been suspended from getting certain kinds of contracts with the government, correct? Suspended but not outright banned. Is that is that accurate? I'm correct with being suspended, but 
Okay. We've lost our security clearance. We've lost our security clearances as well, so we cannot actually build on that work. Okay. Well, uh, how, how are you? Project. How are you informed about this change to your uh, procurement status? Well, first we found out in the House of Commons when the minister declared it that we weren't aware of it, and then secondly, we were let know by PSPC. Okay, so the minister said it before, before the contracts had actually been cancelled. Yeah, and also before our security had been cancelled. Okay, so what was the lag time between the minister saying it had happened and when it actually happened? Three hours. Yeah. Okay, so it happened the same day. Uh, who from PSPC contacted you? Can I get that to you? I don't have it in front of me right now. Uh, can you get it to us within by five o'clock? I think it was on, yeah, give me two, yeah by five o'clock, yes. Okay, were you contacted by any other departments? Only those people who had uh, resources remaining in there who actually removed the resources from the from their project. Okay, on what dates were you contacted by other departments? Um, again, can I kindly ask that I get that to you? By five, please. Um, in the lead up to these changes, were you in discussions with government officials? Did you have any conversations about uh, uh, the possible suspension? I was in yeah, I had a conversation with a, with a gentleman from PSPC where I indicated that I actually was going to terminate my security before it was suspended because when you have no government contracts, it's kind of hard to get. Who, who, who are you in touch with at PSPC? What's the gentleman's name? I think, I think his name is Nolan. No, Nolan was his first name. I'm, I can't remember his last name. Sorry. Belleville. Okay. I think it's, Nolan was his first name. Okay. Uh, and could you give us dates for those discussions? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, what does the GC and GC strategy stand for? Sorry? What does the GC? Go just Government of Canada. Just Government of Canada. Okay. Government of Canada Strategies is the full name. Uh, did you discuss your testimony today with anybody from the government? Why would you have a private company named Government Canada Strategies? Because you only intend to work with the government. So, okay, we've made jokes about that GC standing for Government of Canada or Government Corruption um, on the stream, in the videos, but, like, we just got confirmation that Government Canada is the proper name. That's what GC stands for. Yeah, so the question is, is why, why would you limit yourself? Like, that's a very poor business model. Like, one of the things that you want to do when you're setting up a business is have a relatively diverse revenue stream and that reduces the risk of your business. Now, one of the risks to your business if you're contracting with the government is what happens if you have your, your government contract suspended or your security clearance yeah. revoked? And we see what happens. You have no revenue. Now, two guys, what's their risk? They have nobody to pay. They have no office. They have no expenses. They don't need to fly anywhere. They they literally need to walk down the street. So what uh, like what risk do they have? But you know, you got to wonder. So staffing firms, they work with thousands of companies around the country. These guys have chosen to work with one. The federal government of Canada. And again, you got you got to follow this along. Christian Firth joined Veritac in, I think, 2007. He worked there for two years. Then he met Colin Wood. And he met Darren Anthony. And he met Caleb White. And Veritac, who do they do business a lot with? Government of Canada. Hundreds of millions of dollars. I think uh, in our collaboration with Vesper, it ended up something like 700 or 800 million dollars over the lifetime of Veritex since 2004. So, these guys all working together, going for beers together, saying, you know what? Veritex makes a lot of money off the government. We only see, we only see a salary from it. What if we had our own company? So then Caleb White, Darren Anthony and uh, and Christian Firth decide we're going to buy this company who already has government clearance, and then we get all of the uh, the revenue. 
So they go and buy this company called Corridor Systems. Rename it to Government of Canada Strategies. And they have their inside boy, Cameron McDonald. Now the rest is history. Wow. Richard Hepner with a $2 super chat. Remember, we survived Trudeau number one. And we will survive Trudeau number two. And we'll do it together. No, I did not. Okay. Um, uh, you, you, are, are you, you're, you'll confirm that and, and we'll be able, that'll, that you didn't just have any discussions with anyone? I can confirm anyone. that. I can confirm that. Okay. Uh, sir, I want to give you, uh, one more chance to answer the question that I asked previously. Uh, I think you should understand and appreciate, uh, the powers that parliament has, uh, and the critical role that parliament has in getting information from Canadians. Uh, and, and you may not like the criticism that, that entails, that, that, that sometimes flows from it, uh, but we have a responsibility to stand up for taxpayers, and that includes being able to fulfill our functions as, as parliamentarians. Um, so can you provide the names of the officials who you met with uh, that I had previously requested uh, for, the, uh, for the contract uh, where you sat down with government officials and, and worked out the terms of that contract. Can you provide the names of who you met with? I you know, appreciate the question, but unfortunately, again, I'm still taking the same stance that I was brought in here before the investigation was completed. And if all assumptions is the RCMP has every allegation that's surrounding this. So at that point, I cannot interject. Sir, have you been briefed by your lawyer on the constitutional principle of the supremacy of parliament, the, uh, the rights that parliamentary committees have when it comes to requesting information, uh, the, 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 the fundamental powers that in a democracy uh, the legislature has to have. Have you, have you been briefed on these issues? And, uh, and, and if you have, then why do you persist in, um, in just disregarding those, um, those requirements? I appreciate the question. So unfortunately, I can't comment on that, but the conversations between myself and my, my lawyer are privileged. You're privileged, all right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I privileged. Think, all right. I, I think there's there. a, quite an assertion of privilege from you that ignores the laughing. the rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. of democratically elected uh, legislative uh, bodies. So okay. that is um, our time, <clears throat> Mr. Janos. Um, we'll go on to Mr. Sousa. <clears throat> Sorry, Chair. we'll go to Mr. Sousa, please. Okay. For five. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so. Um, we may not like it, but any conversations between an attorney and their client are bound by attorney-client privilege. They do not have to disclose that. But this question, it wasn't, he, he does. It wasn't really a question, though. It was more of a veiled threat. It was like, well, has your lawyer told you about what happens no, if you don't answer no, questions? No, I mean before that. I mean before that. <laughs> I mean like the actual names. Like He has to provide those. And... Again, the lawyer is going to argue. Well, he provided them in writing. Well, that's the thing. You don't, you don't, you don't get to choose the medium and the time that you provide these questions. So this is very balls. Now, the only reason, only reason, is because he knows that those people have committed some criminal activity, and. Him providing that information publicly would then cause him and his co uh, company to immediately become directly involved in that RCMP investigation. And that's no doubt what the lawyer told him. So there's, there's some crap that's gone on with, the gov with, with officials. Whether they are cabinet or not, there are senior people within the public service. They may not be elected officials, but in the public service, that there's some crazy stuff going on. That's why he doesn't want to publicly say it, because that's that's immediate evidence for the RCMP to review. So that's what I think. Um, I think we're wrapping up soon. I just wanted to address... Um some of the issues in respect to the use of ArriveCan. 
Um, and I know, Mr. Firth, this is not necessarily under your responsibility, and you made, that, you made that clear in terms of the actual engagement or the final use of the product, but how many Canadians use the application that you were involved with? Do you have a sense? That's numbers where the actual application itself was opened 260 million times, and it's being used by around 40 million people. And there were some that were detained inappropriately, I understand. I was one of them, in fact. And I, I, But that number is, I think someone quoted 10,000. Is that right? That's my belief, yeah. <clears throat> but it's been applied, it's been used, and quite extensively, uh, as you uh, just so noted. And in the development of this product, it seems to be assumed that you're the sole provider. But can you advise the public that's watching how many contractors were actually part of the development of the Arrive Can application? I think the, the, the number the AG threw out was around 19 different other firms, different vendors. And then the other issue is the expertise and the skill set within the civil service to provide this application. And, and I, I want to try to equate this as though we we have a lot of real estate, a lot of assets, a lot of engagement, and this um, this application is also has intellectual property. There's an asset value to this application. Is that correct? Yeah, this is not throwaway code. The government of Canada owns all the IP, which I'm assuming is a platform for building other applications off of it. So when the government engages the construction of a building, uh, do they do it themselves or do they contract out? They contract that out. And uh, we would involve a contractor, and that contractor then uses subcontractors to provide uh, the construction of that asset. Correct. We act as a general contractor. And um, the general contractor in the construction of a, of a building will take a percentage of the overall cost of that contract? Is that how it works? That's correct. And some of those buildings uh, could be a $100 million construction of a 350 unit building. Let's assume it's $100 million. They take what kind of percentage that general contractor? Do you have a sense? Do you have a no? No, I'm sorry, I don't. I'm guessing it's over 20%. Um, and there's an evaluation, mind you, when they do a contract. There's a sense of what that value should be and then it's audited and, and monitored to ensure that there's no overruns. And is, does that happen in this case when you're, when yep. you're involved? Yeah, there'll, there'll always be back and forth with the financial groups and the procurement and the contracting areas to make sure that, uh, again, there's significant run rate left on the task authorization. There's enough uh, money left on a contract. Uh, you, know, you can't go over. So they're, they're always timing their deliverables with financial lines in place to make sure that there's always the funds in place to finish a part of the work. Um, do you have a sense of how many contracts the government of Canada does annually? And also, not just IT, in a whole suite of activities. I have no idea. So I love the false equivalency that Suze is trying to use in terms of construction. Um, the government of Canada does not have thousands of people sitting around waiting for construction tasks to do. Why? Because they're incidental. They do have thousands of IT people sitting around doing work every day. This is different. So he's using a complete false equivalency as it relates to, uh, to what's going on here. And uh, it's, it's to be expected because this is the way Sousa went. You know, he's, he's like, oh, this is normal. This is normal that, you know, stuff costs 10 times as much, 750 times as much as it originally was estimated. But, you know, it's fine. It's the grocery store's fault somehow. Yeah, exactly. Get the, get the competition bureau <laughs> in here. Daniel with a 279 Super Chat renamed to Gone and Cancelled Strategies. It might as well because they're done. Uh, Craig Robertson with a $2 Super Chat. The news he's hiding. He met with JT to the top. Diane Sylvain with a $5 Super Chat. Are these names provided to committee confidential? Why should they be? And nobody spoke of these names being confidential. Well, and that's it, right? Are they though, or are they going to be put into the public record? Like, are we going to be able to look at this later? Um, that I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure they're going to be public record. I don't Yeah, because if it's written. Well, and it, but here's the thing. Like, it is, 
it is public record because some of these names are on the GC Strategies freaking website. It's literally public record. Like, I can tell you who the CIO he was talking about at the time. That's Mark Brouillard. That's who it was. Well, I guess we'll have to check back in a little bit and see uh, see what information is there. So, um, Sean N with a $7 super chat. Thank you for your countless hours breaking down these committees. You are very, very welcome. And thank you all for your countless hours of sticking with us through yeah, these committees. <laughs> the, the, the like 1,700 people that have, uh, are still with us. Um, it's, uh, it is almost over, I can tell you that. Um, I'm guessing. And, um, and and then the outcome and the value for money, which is, is is the crux of this thing, right? We're all trying to assess who's getting paid. Is somebody taking privilege in these contracts? Is somebody uh, milking the system? Is, 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 is either general has cited that there could be better value for money in this instance that didn't occur. But do you, what's your perception of the value for money in this situation, given the pandemic and what took place? Uh, obviously, I only spoke of the component that I was working with, yes. uh, and I can speak very highly of the, the team of 30 or 40 people that were working 12, 14 hour days, seven days a week, hitting 170. I mean, I challenge anybody to, to put that much effort in. The prices were substantiated by the rate, so uh, by the crown summary. And I mean, I think the team that was put forward did a great job. And during that process, you had interaction, presumably with the employer, the buyer to verify we, the consequence of what you were doing, correct? Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, we, we, we submit monthly invoices. We don't get, get a check up front. And any time those invoices can be rejected or timesheets can be rejected, but the fact that they were approved every single month for 27 to 36 months told us we were doing a good job. They wouldn't, you guys would not have paid otherwise. And you were a verified uh, contractor long before ArriveCan and long before the Liberal government was in power. Is that correct? Yeah, just no. Out of no. As an PSBC, yeah, PSBC identified us before the first COVID contract as a, a vendor of good record. Right. Thanks. No, Sousa. Long before the Liberal government? No. Incorrect. It was three months after the Liberal government, yes. wasn't it? They bought they bought GC, the, the Cordex, uh, the Cordell systems in late 2015. And then GC Strategies first started doing business with the Liberal government three months later. So, no, Sousa, no. Mr. Sousa, uh, Mrs. Vignola for two and a half, please. Make sure we're not missing anything. Uh, I think we are. Uh, Huntsford with a uh, $10 super chat. It's, if he gives names after this, can they be shared publicly afterward? And can who shared them uh, be shared forward? To hell with protecting uh, these tards posterior lock them up and toss with the keys yeah it all depends um sometimes that this information is provided uh within the minutes on on, the, on committee i think it would be an evidence if i'm not mistaken yeah so we will we will be checking don't worry um and and to see if this is uh brought forward but typically that type of information is not kept private you know contracts and stuff like that yeah that's that's you know they'll have redactions and stuff like that but like this type of information, it, it, it isn't typically done. Um, Nilik with a $5 super chat. IT is not the same as construction at all. Second, Sousa is uh, losing his seat. Why is he playing defense so bad? Is he getting something or was he involved? It's his, it's his job. He's being told what to do. Um, and the Excalibur 45 with a 279 super chat. Canadian versions of war dogs. Here you go. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Monsieur, monsieur. Mr. Firth, we find ourselves in a situation here where we need IT technologists and specialists, and increasingly so, and AI isn't the silver bullet. So about 10, 12 or so years ago, the Harper government made cutbacks to IT specialists and their ranks by saying, well, since there aren't any projects, why pay them? So you're a consultant, and I imagine you can respond to this issue, is whether it be a government or a company, uh, to have specialised IT experts under their employee. In 2024, would they be paid to do nothing? Is that even remotely possible in 2024? 
I think it would be hard for the government to uh, to sustain a bench of resources with very specific skill sets. I think it would be uh, an undertaking that would be a hard to find the people, b make them want to stay in one position. People like being consultants because they can they can bump around. And I think it's the I think the model is something between what we have now and what's currently in place is where you know you get your hired guns, you bring them in for a project that's and then let them go. I mean that's otherwise you have unions involved and you have benches of resources sat doing nothing. So I think there is a place for contractors to continue doing okay, on, fait on, il serait impossible. So it would be impossible that one would have uh, IT resources who would work full time. That doesn't exist anywhere, anywhere in the world, eh? I see. Well, 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 well. Now, that said... <laughs> that was Vignola being very facetious there. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. You know, it's not like we're going to have people working full time in IT. <laughs> uh, and Fox, is your kitten okay? I can hear her calling you. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's a... He's not a kitten kitten anymore. He's kind of like a teenager, and um, he's like one of those teenagers that has a bottomless pit for a stomach. So uh, he just wants food, even though I fed him less than two hours ago. <laughs> yeah. It. The only way that I see this playing out is to have departments that are au fait with the procurement process and know how to manage it properly. Now, if you take a step back from this current situation, as difficult as that might be, do the departments currently, are they able to supervise and monitor projects of substantive size currently, properly. I'm sorry, just a brief answer if you can, Mr. Firth. You can. You said you can't. Well, yes, I believe you can. I think we have you frozen, Mr. Firth. Give us a couple seconds, please. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure if my internet is unstable right now, but I missed uh, your last prompt there. Were you no, I think indicating it's... it was my turn? No, no, sorry. I think uh, we have Mr. Firth is uh, frozen I'm not getting from any, looking at his... any audio. You're on mute, Mr. Chair. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think it's bad. I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me? Yeah. I can okay. hear you, but I don't I think can you can hear I can hear you, Taylor. Mr. Backrack, I can hear you well, and now Mr. Firth is back on. I should subcontract GC Strategies to go and get a... Uh, uh, IT contractor come and show them how to work their video conference equipment, I guess. On, can you hear us okay? I can now, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Firth, can you, uh, are you okay just answering the question from Mrs. Vignola? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I lost your, your internet clip. Kind of okay. Can you end. repeat the question, please? Imagine. Now, imagine you take, took a step back from the situation and you had observed what has gone on and that the record management and the management of procurement, it's, uh, of course, the bailiwick of the department. Do you believe that that management, that oversight, that monitoring of procurement files and contracts is sound? Or is there room for improvement to avoid the kinds of situations that we're coming to grips with today? Obviously, I can't speak for every department, but these last 18 months have said that I think CBSA needs some work. Thank you very much. Mr. Backrack, now it is your time. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to use my time, Mr. Chair, to uh, move a motion arising from this study on ArriveCan. Uh, so I will move that. In light of the recent finding that Dalian Enterprises received $7.9 million in funding for its work on ArriveCan while CEO David Yeo, or Yao was an employee of the Department of National Defense, the committee call on Mr. Yao as well as the following senior officials from the Department of National Defense, Minister of National Defense Bill Blair, Deputy Minister of National Defense Bill Matthews, Associate Deputy Minister uh, Material Troy Crosby, and Assistant Deputy Minister Human Resources Isabel 
uh, De Martes to appear before committee no later than April 1st, 2024 for no less than two hours of testimony. And I believe my, my staff can make that available in writing to uh, the committee. Uh, thanks, Mr. Backrack. So this is uh, different than the February 29th when you had on notice. I thought that's what was getting. Yeah, I, uh, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm just, uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just making sure if that's correct. Are you just putting this on notice right now, or are you putting it? Are no, you I'd, taking like, to, it as I'd like to move it and, and okay. hopefully get to a vote in the minutes that are remaining of our meeting. Thank Thanks. You. I was just clarifying, sir. Thanks. Well, this is entirely not surprising. So they want to bring in David Yao, who's the CEO of Dalian, who is also a employee for Department of National Defense, and whose company, Dalian. Enterprises was receiving government contracts in the millions of dollars. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. And David Yao has tried to say, well, he followed all disclosure. Uh huh. Really? So, why is the government paying you a contractor fee when they're already paying you a, a salary? salary? Ridiculous. So, either he followed disclosure and people above him are in a lot of trouble. Or he didn't follow disclosure, and everybody's in trouble. Mr. Speaker, yeah, Would you Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair. No, um, sorry, Mr. Firth. Sorry, we're uh, tending something else, but we'll get to you three, shortly. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's been three hours right now, and this is kind of where I think I can be. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I have to ask. Is, I have I, to ask you to stay, Mr. Firth, and we may be able to get. Uh, to our last uh, couple of questioning <laughs> rounds, but I just have to uh, ask you to stand by for a bit here. But <laughs> oh, the look on Mr. First's face was like, what? I can't leave? No. No, you cannot. So, <laughs> as Clint, Clint Eastwood would say, hold your ass right there. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Sousa, your uh, hand is up, but I will get back to yes, you certainly, Mr. Firth. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. This is the revised version that's been submitted, correct? I think we've, um, we were in agreement with what has been put forward. Perfect. So we're we all in agreement then, colleagues? Wonderful. So adopted. Mr. Firth, we just have uh, two more last interventions, Mrs. Block and then Mr. Uh, Baines, but we'll have you out here shortly. Mrs. Block, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Really quickly, Mr. Firth, do you have any contracts with provincial governments or any municipal governments at this time? No, I do not. Okay, thank you. The Auditor General noted that CBSA identified a resource um, that was added to one of your task authorizations as a subcontractor. And this resource was KPMG. And she noted that that was unusual. This is a one of the four largest multinational firms uh, uh, worldwide. And yet they were, they were placed on a tax authorization form as a subcontractor to your company. Do you know who approached KPMG to be put in place as a subcontractor to GC Strategies? Uh, no, I, I know who approached me from KPMG, but I don't know. I don't know, in front of me right now, I can't comment on that, sorry. Who was your contact at KPMG? Again, I'm, with all due respect, I'd like to give you that before five o'clock since I'm trying to get out of here okay. uh, in writing. Okay, um, uh, at the same time, could you provide us with how much of a commission you would have earned as a result? of that resource being placed on a tax authorization form? Absolutely. Okay, what are they talking about? Why are they talking about it? So it seems that whenever they want somebody to work for the government when it comes to the CBSA, they a lot of times they throw them under GC Strategies, which means GC Strategies automatically gets a commission on it. Now, the point is, is KPMG is a resource firm among other things. But one of the things that they do is they provide resources, IT ones, to work on projects within companies and they provide professional services. Deloitte does the same thing. KPMG is huge, big firm. 
more than two people. Lots and lots and lots of people. Thousands of people work for KPMG. The question from Ms. Block is, why would KPMG be a subcontractor to GC Strategies? KPMG has a, con like, they have a relationship with the federal government. Why would GC Strategies need to subcontract to them? And the answer is they shouldn't. So who the heck orchestrated this type of relationship? It doesn't make sense. Um, in response to some of the questions or comments that my colleague, Mr. Sousa, made in his previous intervention, the Auditor General, the Procurement Ombuds, the Comptroller General have all indicated that they are deeply concerned with what has been uncovered during this study. They believe that uh, you know, this could be an issue across other departments. In fact, the Auditor General noted two other departments. There are 10 investigations ongoing um, in regards to the irregularities, the mismanagement, and I think what could come down to criminality. And so my question for you actually is, are you aware of something called the Charbonneau Loop, a term uh, used in um, procurement and bidding? No, sorry, I'm not. Okay, Charbonneau loops ultimately happen when the pool of companies receiving public, public sector contracts for a given type of work is small enough that the same companies are sometimes overseeing and sometimes overseen by their peers in that same pool. Have you had any conversations with any of the other companies or firms that were bidding on the same contracts as you? No, I did not. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I guess, uh, Chair, in, in follow-up to my questions around KPMG, I am wondering if uh, we, you can confirm that we have actually invited KPMG to appear before our committee and if they have responded. Uh, KPMG and all of the uh, subcontractors have been invited and we're working on dates. Okay, thank you very much. Do I have any? Okay. Okay, so I just want to confirm then, uh, you said you did private, you have done some work in the private sector, and I'm not sure if I heard, did you provide us with a percentage of the work that you do um, between government and what percentage is from the private sector? I'll provide it. Government, 100%. Private, 0%. Currently, government, 0%. Private, 0%. <laughs> Man. Um, I can speculate to give you an answer, but it would not be 100% accurate. So would you like me to sketch the exit? I don't have the exact number in front of me, and I don't want to do approximations. I'm just wondering, would you like me to get you the, right, the exact number or an approximation right now? Sorry, um, I thought you had cut out. Yes, if you could just provide us with the percentage of work that you've done uh, for the public sector, and I'm thinking specifically the federal government, the government of Canada, because it appears you haven't done any work with other levels of government. If you could give, or th give us the percentage that you have done with the federal government versus the percentage for the private sector, that would be appreciated. Okay, I will provide that for you. Thank you. Thanks, and uh, we'll finish up with you, Mr. Baines, sir. Mr. Baines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Firth, you said you, GC strategy stands for government of, Can uh, government of Canada strategies. Don't you think that's misleading? <laughs> not, re not, not really. We, we didn't think so in 2015. But you, you said you've worked here for 2007. Since 2007, you're not an employee of the government. Like, does that not give the sense that that you solely do work for government Canada? You talked about doing private work as well. Yeah, not not really. I mean, if we use the acronym GC, we didn't spell out Government of Canada strategies. It could be open for interpretation. I mean... I, I, what? Are you serious? 
Okay, I see why people like want us to watch this, but are you like, come on? What is wrong with this guy? Wow. Wow. This is another chalet moment, people. I don't think so. To me, it's misleading. I think that it, my, my issue here is that I think since you've been working here with government offices and, and public officials uh, in the different departments since 2007, and it appears they've got comfortable with you doing the work and, and you're, you claim that you've done great work um, and and that's why you're you're um, getting through these navigating the processes um, don't you think that's an unfair advantage uh, to those who have long-standing experience with government contracts by continuing to maybe like uh, the member before called the loop of, of, of attaining these contracts over and over and and others are at a disadvantage just because um, you know you may be more familiar more comfortable with these officials who've also been working there for decades um, uh, w what do you have to say about that I'm sorry I, I don't understand the question I just don't like the I fact mean, that, but they, that, they, that I mean, that again, we have I don't people... make the decision, right? I don't make the no, decision. No, no, I understand that, see, but I just don't like the fact that, that uh, I don't like the fact that that people are getting comfortable in receiving these contracts. Then we have, may have officials who are comfortable with people who have they have may have possibly built relationships with, and continue to keep getting these contracts. Do you believe that that's something that's happening here? This is an interesting line of questioning from Baines. It's not towing the, the liberal line, which is interesting. And I wonder if the reason that he's doing that is, uh, is because he's checked the polls in his writing. Because uh, this is what the polls in his writing looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I checked yeah. this as, as he was answering this. Well, okay, here's a question. We've got still, and it's really late over here. It's 10 after 2. Uh, we've got over 1,500 people watching this, most of whom I'm going to assume are going to be voting conservative. How many liberals do you think are watching this kind of stuff? You know what I mean? And you don't know. And that's the thing. Right? I, don't, I don't think it's 1,500. But liberal voters are seeing this now pop up in mainstream media. So, um, But yeah, it, it and, and maybe to Fox's point is that there's there's a lot of irritated conservative people that are paying more and more and more and more attention to this which means they're going to be voting conservative and yeah. some of them will be in this writing but you know as 5w says with his two dollar super chat uh, problem question just plead the first there you go <laughs> well played oh, i i think that uh and this is since 2007 so we're talking 2007 to now it's 2024 you're still yeah. around well, I, I think yeah not anymore. Um, I kind of think that's that the uh, yeah. Um, so, so no, I, I think there's a there's you, again the decisions are made by the government. They obviously see value in what I do. I've had 65 contracts since 2015. So I don't, I believe that you do a good job. Then that becomes recognized. That can become a referral. It can, can be it can be something you put a feather in your cap. So when you go to propose a solution the next time. These are jobs well done. And I think it's just sales. I want to go back to earlier. You said something about the vendors aren't screened. Or, or is this so? You, you said you had thirty-five people that you subcontract out to, but they're not required to be screened. Is that accurate? No, no. I said they actually for arrive can specific. They actually had two lines of security. There was PSBC security and then CBSA specific security. But they can't speak directly to them? Is that what it is? No, they can speak directly to them. They, they cannot uh, give a contract directly to them. They're not okay. a qualified vendor. Okay, so um, if you look at um, uh, we, uh, earlier questions to, uh, regarding uh, the... If, if Christian Firth is Forrest Gump, Harm Baines is Baba. <laughs> just saying 
pay being determined. I just wanted to sort of get some clarity on that as well. So, so these these thirty five subcontractees, they can't say um, uh, this is my price. They have to fall within a certain. Um, uh, they can they can one hundred percent as long as so you have the price of the crown, and whatever the price they they actually ask for is typically what we give them. So they can be anything from zero to the, the ceiling price. That's where the negotiations happen, which is how margin is determined. There's no cutoff saying you must get paid this. It's they're, 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 they get what they ask for. They, if they want 1,000, if they want 1,100, if they want 1,200, and the Blu-ray is full, this is why there's a difference between um, industry standards of 15% to 30%. Okay, Mr. Chair, that's all the questions I have, but I do want to say that I'm looking forward to, you know, reviewing these processes, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the Commissioner of the Competition Bureau coming uh, before us and, uh, to see where where we need to do things better, um, uh, considering this has been going on since 2007. That's all I have for today. Thank you, Mr. Baines. I thank everyone for sticking with us a, a bit past time. Yes, uh, I'll get you, Mr. Genuis. Um, Mr. Firth, thanks as well. Just quickly before you leave, Mr. Firth, uh, Mr. Genuis, sir. Thank, thank you, Chair. And I, I think you can uh, dismiss the witness, but I, uh, having heard the totality of his testimony, uh, I think it's important to raise a question of privilege okay, let me regarding just interrupt his non very Thank you, Mr. Firth. Um, we're going to dismiss you right now. Thank you for your time. I appreciate. Uh, Thank you, Jack. Can I just? Today. Can you also ask the the clerk, the clerk to summarize for me what it, what I'm sending you back in, please? And I also ask that I would even be home by five o'clock. So could that be later on in the evening, please? Yes, uh, I think we'll say eight p.m. tonight, sir. Tomorrow morning. Oh, <laughs> sure. Hey, I'll try. Is eight p.m. is I'd, I'd rather, if it's at all possible, to get it to you tomorrow morning. That's all possible. Uh, 9 a.m. tomorrow morning? Perfect. Okay. We'll do it for 9, and the, the clerk will send you an email with uh, outlining what uh, we're looking for. Uh, before Thank I get you. to you, Mr. Back, thanks, Mr. Firth. We'll, uh, we'll dismiss you. Um, I see Mr. Backrek, but Mr. Genuis has a uh, point of privilege. I think he's bringing up uh, tonight, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, simply this, that Mr. Firth has refused to answer direct questions that have put, been put to him uh, by the Chair on behalf of this committee. Uh, this witness has shown complete disregard for the prerogatives and responsibilities of parliamentary committees uh, when it comes to getting answers uh, for Canadians. Uh, Chair, I, I believe that this uh, is a violation of the privileges of this committee uh, and that this needs to be attended to to ensure that all parliamentary committees uh, can insist upon responses to direct questions that are asked. Uh, Chair, if you agree that this is an issue of uh, privilege, then I will be uh, prepared to move the appropriate motion. Um, I've looked and I've chatted with the analysts and I believe it is, sir. Okay, so just a reminder when they're talking about parliamentary privilege privilege is not the uh they're not talking about as in you know you have an ability or a you're lucky enough to do something that's not what they're talking about by privilege what they're they're talking about is that parliamentary privilege is the ability for a member of parliament to carry out their job so when they're bringing up an issue of privilege what is going on is there's something that they are raising that is impeding their ability to do their job as a member of parliament. So if somebody is being untruthful in committee or if somebody is refusing to answer questions, um, they're impeding the MP's ability to do their work for Canadians. So that is a question of privilege. Um, if you recall, Michael Chong raised a question of privilege as it related to the foreign interference by the Chinese government on his family as a result of him voting a certain way on a motion. So that was a question of privilege. Aaron O'Toole raised the same thing. Uh, Jenny Kwan raised the same thing. Uh, and so this comes up sometimes when when people feel that something happened that in is, is impeding my or a group of colleagues, their ability to actually do their job as a member of parliament. Okay, thank you, Chair. Then my motion is that the committee instruct the clerk and analysts to prepare a report to the House, which the Chair shall table forthwith, outlining the potential breach of privilege concerning Christian Firth's refusal to answer those questions which the committee agreed to put to him and his prevarication in answering others. 
Thank you. Uh, the clerk is just sending it out to everyone's P9 right now. I'm happy to suspend for about a minute till it gets out to everyone. The Are P9 we, is I don't a see private anyone's hands email. up. Are we in agreement? Yeah, P9 is the MP's private emails. It's, um, it's their personal email yeah, it, that their staff don't have access yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. With us then, colleagues? Besides Mr. Backrock, we'll get you. Agreed? Wonderful. So passed. Uh, Mr. Backrock, uh, you have your hand up, sir, before we adjourn. Wow, even the Liberals actually agreed to that. Wow. Interesting. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and just recognizing that we're right at the end of the meeting, I wonder if you could provide the committee on an update on your efforts to have the Canada Post CEO come before committee as part of our study on rural postal service. Okay. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, Mr. Backrack. Uh, I'll be honest, we have reached out repeatedly uh, to Canada Post and we are not seeing a lot of cooperation on having them uh, attend. We wrote to them, I think it was yesterday, Pretty sure this is the end, because I don't see a lot left. Okay. Wow, folks. Um, Record length for live stream, for sure. <laughs> yeah, that was five hours, folks. Yeah, we're not going to keep you too much longer, because we're going to do it all again tomorrow, and we yeah. want everybody to get some rest. Yeah, we want to get some rest, too, because uh, we're going through this with Darren Anthony tomorrow, and it's another three-hour engagement. But um, this is important, folks, and I commend all of you that actually have, uh, have soldiered through the entire thing. This is very, very important that we watch this stuff. Um, it really, really demonstrates the work of the OGO committee. Um, uh, I applaud Mr. Backrack for most of his questions in the NDP. They did well. Um, Ms. Vignola for, for the block, very sharp MP, very, very happy with that. And, uh, you know, this is why they call it the Mighty Ogo, I think, because there's some, like, stellar MPs on this like, on this committee. And they get some, some, like, really significant work done. Yeah, 100%. Um, and uh, and they're going to do it tomorrow. I remember, this constituency week, right? So they're, tech, they're, they're supposed to be back at home um, attending uh, events in their writings, you know, actually meeting with their constituents, listening to the issues, and, uh, and, and you know, it, it enables them to do their job better at Parliament. So, um, so there we are. So tomorrow, I guess today, later today. <laughs> yeah, tonight at 9 p.m. Yeah, is, is Darren Anthony. Um, and it's the first time we hear from him. We have no idea what to expect. But if he's worked with Firth all this time, I don't have a high opinion of him. But I'm going to try and reserve judgment. So thank you, everybody, for sticking with us the whole time. And we'll see you, I guess, tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern. Take care, everybody. Good night. Have a good night.